Hey, it's me, MLV. Here is part two of the completed book of Pull. Poor Yaoyorozu struggled to get free of, but Yurarika held her fast, climbing over the table so that she could pull Yaoyorozu off her chair and walk away with her. Miss L, Mina addressed you. Do you like Aizawa? Please be honest with us. I've been living on crumbs and I need more. Your face flushed and you nervously took another bite of your bun to stall for time before replying. He... <clears throat> Is a very nice person under it all, but I don't know if he would be someone I would consider dating. You lied professionally. I am committed to my job and having a relationship with my boss would jeopardize that. Mina eyed you. She knew you were lying, but she couldn't force it out of you. Mm-hmm, she hummed. I might be speaking out of place here, but I think you'd make a dope couple, Juro stated, still toying with her ear jack. Right, Mina replied her friend. Looking at her, then back to you. Mizelle, if Aizawa did like you like that and he asked you out, would you give him one little itty bitty chance? Ah, oh, damn, what do I say? You screamed internally. I doubt that would happen, you said with a soft chuckle, trying to dismiss it. She didn't say no, Jiro commented with a shrug to Mina. Yup, Mina replied. What are you scheming? Yaoyorozu suddenly asked after breaking free of Yurarika and rejoining the conversation. Let's get Aizawa to notice Miss L, Mina replied. Girls, I, I really don't think he's in... Your objection was interrupted. Shh, Mina hushed you, jumping up and reaching across the table to press her finger to your mouth to silence you. If I may put my own personal opinion in, Yaoyorozu said, touching her ch chest with her fingertips. I do think... That as a confident and well-rounded teacher, you would be the best match for Aizawa. I think your strong feminine charm would bring him out of his shell. Well, thank you, Yao Yurozu. You're very kind, he replied graciously. But please don't make a scene. Wait, so you're letting us match you up? Mina screeched excitedly. Uh, no, um, uh... He won't know what we're doing, Mina promised. And we'll be real subtle. We'll make sure that there are plenty of opportunities for you two to be together. Oh, I, I don't know if... It'll be fine, she cajoled. Come on, please let us live out our dreams. You sighed and relinquished your hold. I highly doubt that he would fall for such a scheme, but it can't hurt, he said. No one else, apart from the girls in the class, are to know about this though, and I didn't orchestrate it. Cross my heart, Mina squealed excitedly, exaggerating her ex as she crossed her whole body. Yes, yeah, same, Jiro added. Crossing her fingers on one hand. I'm in! Eurica screeched excitedly, bouncing up and down. I will make it make sure that it doesn't go too far, Yayurozu added, playing the mother role. You chuckled and shook your head. <laughs> I know that school life is lacking when you start to pair teachers up. Well, we tried pairing classmates, but someone won't participate, Mina teased Jiro, jabbing her in the side with her elbow. I don't like them like that. Poor Jiro mumbled shyly, grabbing her ear jacks and tapping them together. She looked down, her fringe covering her eyes. Just then the bell rang and you stood up. I'm sorry, girls. Thank you for having me join you for lunch, but I need to get ready for the next class in case Aizawa calls on me to take the lesson, he said hurriedly as you took off at a speed walk to the door and off down the hall. She totally likes him, and she thinks that we don't know about them sleeping in the same bed, Mina scoffed. They're probably already dating, but I want to see something between them, even if it's just catching them staring deeply into each other's eyes. Can you imagine Aizawa staring deeply into someone's eyes? Jiro sneered. Only if he's using his quirk, Yurarika added with a chuckle, imitating his look and using her hands to imitate his hair standing on end. Mina cackled loudly. Yeah, I can see it. Activating his quirk as he tells Yin he loves her. Yin. She said, opening her eyes wide and staring across the table at Eureka. I love you. She put her hands on her head with fingers pointing up like Aizawa's hair would do when Quirk was activated. Jiro and Eureka spluttered with laughter, and Yaoyorozu cracked a smile, but then cleared her throat and tried to act serious. Okay, come on, we need to get to class or else we'll be on the receiving end of Aizawa's wrath. And with that, the girls left the table and ran for their lockers to get ready for next class. Yin. Aizawa greeted you as he entered the staff room. We have the mid-year festival to start planning. So I'll have the students choose what they want to do as a class. Mid-year? That's another four months away, you said with surprise. I'm aware of that, 
he deadpanned. But a lot of planning goes into it, so we need to start now. Oh, okay, that makes sense, he replied with a nod. What do you need me to do? Write the suggestions on the board, he directed. So, what, you can't do that yourself? He thought as he gave him a look. I'll see you in there, he stated, ignoring your look and walking past you out into the hall. Things have regressed right back to before the weekend. He hasn't even so much as touched me today. You thought sadly as you picked up a few things for class. Okay, so he touched my arm this morning, but it didn't feel like a particularly special touch. Items gathered, you headed off to the classroom and sat at the back to await Aizawa's call for you to come forward. We have to start planning for the middle of the year festival, Aizawa stated once everyone was sat and listening. What, festival? As in the normal festivals that schools have? Kaminari asked. Aizawa nodded. Oh my god, something normal? He whooped with excitement, causing Aizawa to get riled and glare at him till he sat back down again. You'll need to come to a conclusion regarding what you want to do, Aizawa said. I've asked Miss Lim to take the suggestions and write them on the board. Aizawa gestured for you to come forwards and you got up and walked to the front, picking up a piece of chalk, then poising it at the blackboard before turning your head over your shoulder and asking for suggestions. Bikini mud wrestling! Minota screamed loudly his enthusiastic yell being followed by the sound of a smack as Ciro reached over and smacked him off his chair. Get down, you perv, he said in a calm voice, his actions not matching his serenity. Yagirozu raised her hand quickly and you pointed to her with the chalk. Fashion show, she called out. You nodded and turned back to the board to write it up there. With Miss Lin and Mr. Aizawa joining us, Mina added, your adrenaline spiked and your hand slipped making the chalk scratch funny on the board, with a small grating squeak making some of the class members grimace and shudder at the intrusive sound. Joining, you asked, turning your head back to look over your shoulder at the two girls. Momo was looking at Mina as well. Yeah, Hagakure piped up. Miss Lin would be an amazing addition to the fashion show. Your eyes sprung open and you looked back at the board, hovering the chalk over it. I'm not in opposition, Aizawa said from his seat and your head whipped towards him, staring at him in disbelief. His heavy-lidded eyes settled on you. It would be good to show the connection between teacher and students if we all got involved. Is this guy serious? He accepts it! Mina squealed with excitement. I don't want to be at a stupid fashion show, Bakugo grunted with annoyance. Bakugo, we need someone to do fireworks and other stage extras, Yagirozu replied calmly. Not an extra ponytail don't call me it she meant stage extras bro kirishima cut in then looked at yagirozu sorry momo you know how he is i'm all for the fashion show that would be super manly Oi! ayama added staring up at the ceiling i will be the highlight of the show we need you as the disco ball mina said to him making him flick his hand to his forehead dramatically feigning utter disappointment but I must show my cape to the world. You cannot stop my twinkling. Exactly, Mina said again. That's why we need you as the ball. She has a point, Ayama, Yayorozu commented. I will have you in the highest fashion for your disco debut. I promise, everyone in the room will be able to see you. Merci, Ayama sang flamboyantly. Is it a unanimous vote? You asked from the front of the classroom. All in favour, raise your hand. All of the girls' hands shot up, along with four of the boys. Okay, you muttered, counting the hands. And those who are indifferent? Pretty much the rest of the hands were raised. Anyone strongly opposed? You then asked. No hands were raised, so you shrugged and looked across at Aizawa. I think we have our decision, he said proudly, placing the chalk down and dusting your hands against each other. He gave you a solitary nod. I'll go to the school student council. Let them know of our decision, he said as he stood up to leave. Miss Lin, would you take the students out to the training area, have them run laps? They need to increase their stamina. You nodded and turned back to the class, clapping your hands to get their attention. Okay class, please change into your PE uniforms and meet me at ground beta in 15 minutes. The class collectively mumbled things and got up out of their seats and headed out of the classroom door. Miss Lin, Yayorozu gushed as she came to the front of the classroom. May I commend you on being able to get the class to come to a collective decision in such a short space of time? That is truly remarkable. Oh, you replied with a dismissive hand wave and chuckle. 
It was the class that came to that decision. I just wrote it down on the board. I'm excited for the fashion show, but also a little nervous, you admitted. Uh, don't even sweat it, Mizelle. We got you covered, Mina leered as she bounced up beside Yao Yurozu. Yeah, I'm thinking a fitter dress with a lace-up back, Hagakure said as she flitted over to join the conversation. Sick, Jiro added. That'll be sure to catch Aizawa's eye. Aizawa, he gasped. You're not doing this to get his attention, are you? Mizlin? Ribbon? I fear you have fallen into their trap, Sue said with her tongue out a little as her head tilted cutely to the side. You looked at Yagirozu with horror. No, 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 that was not my intention, the class rep said quickly. But I do have some ideas that will make you look stunning. You already have a beautiful figure, so I want to compliment what you already have. And Aiza was going to love it, Mina leered. Miss Lin, Yuraka gasped, suddenly realising something. If you can stretch your body, does that mean you can inflate certain parts of your body? You knew exactly what she was meaning, but played dumb instead. Inflate? You asked innocently. Yeah, like... Mina grabbed under her breasts and jiggled them. Make them grow, like, really big. You should totally do it for the fashion show. Mina! Jiro gasped, face flushing with embarrassment as she tried not to stare at her friend jiggling her assets right before her. Uh, you replied evasively. Um, I think it's possible to inflate parts, as you say, but I've never tried, you added, lying through your teeth. You've never tried to plump your boobs or ass up, or make your waist smaller? Mina asked, definitely not believing you. Literally, that would be the first thing that I would do if I had your quirk. I'd give myself an H cup. Duro hung her head and looked away, feeling very self-conscious about her flat chest. Girls, you need to go and get changed, you said hurriedly with a chuckle. We can discuss this later. Training! Eureka gasped again, grabbing for Sui's hand and tugging on it. We need to go! See you soon, Miss Lin! As Eureka left hurriedly, pulling Sui along with her, the other girls followed suit, each saying goodbye to you before running from the room to get changed. Oh, what a morning, you thought as you left the room yourself and went to the staff room briefly before heading out to the training field. As you walked into the staff room, you crossed paths with Aizawa. I'm surprised you said yes to the fashion show, you remarked to him. Why? Well, I didn't think that it would be something you would be interested in participating in, you mused. So I don't fit the box you put me in, he said back in a deadpan voice. Maybe you should expect the unexpected. And with that, he passed you and left, leaving you very confused. What the heck was that? What kind of a riddle was that? You stood there for a second, staring at his back as he left, before shrugging and walking to your desk to get your whistle. As you reached into the drawer, you saw a note on top of the desk, half hidden under some things. Meet me in the classroom after school, the note read. Who wrote this, Aizawa? Am I in trouble? You sighed and grabbed your whistle, then took the note and put it in your pocket. Mm, no point worrying about it. Best I do my job and then deal with him later. You turned and walked out, heading down to the training field. Although you told yourself that you wouldn't think about Aizawa and his note, you found your mind constantly walking to the door that you had put that thought in and poking its head through occasionally, just to make sure the worry was still there. Ah, oh, damn it, focus, Yin! You growled internally to yourself, your brows furrowing with annoyance. Am I not doing it right? Kemnari asked in a meek voice from where he was sitting near your feet. You pulled your attention to him and then quickly let your face relax not realising that you had been frowning at him for the last ten minutes. You're fine, he said hurriedly. Sorry, I was just thinking about something else. Your form is good. Keep going. You now had the students doing sit-ups between laps, and they were all holding up quite well. How much longer do we have to do this? He wheezed. I'm about to die. Stop being so dramatic. That's Ayama's job, Jiro panted from beside him. Whee! Ayama wheezed from the back. You glanced at your watch and saw that it was close enough time to the end of class for them to stop. Okay, done, you said. Get up and walk the last lap to cool down, then go and change. Well done today. You gave them a small clap and they got up and dragged themselves the last lap around. Ugh, not long now before the big talk with Aizawa. Your face fell. As the students returned to you, you sent them off to go and get changed and then went back to the staff room to put your whistle away. Did you get my note? Aizawa asked in a low tone as he approached your desk. Am I in trouble? You asked, 
looking at the desk and not at him. Far from it, he replied bluntly before walking off. A relieved smile spread across your face and you relaxed, then picked up your books and followed shortly after him to the classroom for the final two classes. You must have watched the clock the whole lesson because you don't even remember seeing anything else and finally the bell rang, ending the class for that day. Dismissed, Aizawa stated bluntly to his students, crossing his arms across his chest as they got up and left. You waited till they had all gone and then walked to the front of the room. You wanted to see me? You asked. His bloodshot eyes calmly traced your face, lingering on your lips before coming back up to your eyes and self-consciously you bit your bottom lip and sucked on it coyly. Come closer. He beckoned in his bland casualness. You glanced around and then stepped closer and he uncrossed his arms. If I didn't fear getting caught, I'd have you bent over the desk right now. He stated, his voice so low and raspy it made your breath hitch in your throat. T tension uh, is running high, you mused with a coy eyebrow quirk. I, I thought you had discarded me. Don't take my lack of vocal affirmation as a sign of disinterest, he stated. I'm at work. I need to maintain my professionalism. Understood, he replied. So why have you asked me to stay back then if you're not going to act on your desires? Who says I'm not going to act on them? He asked as he reached out and took your hand in his, then pulled your body against his, walking backwards until he was up against the wall, in a spot where people wouldn't immediately see if they walked past the room. He looked up into his eyes, reaching your hand to his chin and jaw, then letting your fingertips slide along the spare stubble that was there. As you touched him, you heard him inhale sharply through his nose, nostrils flaring as he continued to look down at your face. Be careful how you touch me, he said lowly. I only have so much self-control. You ignored his warning and lifted yourself up on tippy toes, your lips parting as they neared his, pausing as you just held off from his mouth and closed your eyes. In an instant his lips were on yours and your positions had switched, your back being pressed heavily into the wall behind you as he pinned you there with one of his legs between yours. You felt his scarf levitate a little, then it snaked down and around your wrists and bound them together quickly. What I want to do to you right now is definitely not for young audiences. I wouldn't want anyone walking in on us, he uttered, running his lips down your jawline to your neck, then pulling back and removing his scarf bind from your wrist then turning and walking off with his hands in his pockets. You stood there breathlessly watching him go. That's it, you groaned internally. He's so mean. I wanted so much more of that. After taking your time to collect yourself, you pushed off the wall and walked to the door, leaving for the day. Once back at home, Granny popped into your mind and you rang her and popped the phone on the kitchen backboard and put her on loudspeaker as you made a cup of tea. Hello, honey, I thought you'd forgotten my number, she teased. I haven't heard from you since your affair with the boss. Affair, uh, uh, affair with my boss, you spluttered. I, no, um, it, well, it's not an affair. Well, I, well, he's not married, so. Oh, sorry, that was my friend Lola, she cackled. Oh, I'm sorry, dear, wrong person. Oh, no, no, it's, it's okay. But I do need to talk to someone about my boss I seem to be in a little bit of a mess oh honey come and tell Grams all about it she said in her most homely grandma voice what mess are you in you sighed and hung your head pressing your hands onto the bench top as you waited for the water to boil for your cup of tea uh, where do I start you mumbled okay well my boss who is unmarried has indicated that he's interested in me and I very much like him as well but there are times where he just flat out ignores me and it hurts. Ah, oh, these men! Granny tisked. When will they ever learn? What do you mean, Grams? He asked as he reached across and picked up the hot water jug that had now clicked off and poured the hot water over the tea bag in your cup. That's been like this from the beginning of time, she said with a little chuckle. But that doesn't mean you have to put up with it. If he can't get his ducks in a row, then you just gotta move along, honey. You're worth so much more than feeling like a pretty plaything on a shelf that gets put, pulled down every now and again and put back when he feels like it. Yes, you said emphatically, dunking your tea bag a few times. That's exactly what it feels like. I feel like he only gives me attention when he feels like it. He's so hot and cold. 
You don't need to put up with that, she said knowingly. If you're not happy there, then you just go elsewhere, sweet pea. You are such an amazing teacher. Schools will be lining up to take you. Thanks, Grams, he said with a soft smile as you put the tea bag in the bin and picked your phone up and cup to go and sit on the lounge. So, how's knitting club going? You asked her, changing the subject so that it wasn't all about you. She started chatting about the gossip in the club and you sat back, enjoying the drama being about someone else for a change. After chatting for a half an hour, you decided to make yourself some dinner, so excused yourself from the call. Grams, I gotta go make dinner, then do some lesson plans for tomorrow, he said as you finished the last of your tea. Oh, you're so hardworking, honey. You go and do all you need to do, she said in her pleasant old lady voice. Thanks, Grams. Give Henry a kiss for me, he said. Wait! Hold on a minute, he's here, she said, a little scuffling following her announcement. Say hi to Yin, Henry, Granny said. A little meow asked in question. Oh, hi, baby, you cooed. Are you being good for your mama? Meow. The reply came. Okay, good to hear, Henry. I'll come and visit very soon. In school break, okay? He replied his meow. He and I will be very happy to see you again, Granny piped up. I miss you guys, he said sadly. I'll be over to visit in a few weeks. Okay, honey, I'll let you go. Now you be good and remember what I said about men, she said in a loving, strict voice. I will, Grams, he replied. Love you. Love you more, she said before blowing kisses and hanging up. You smiled to yourself and sat back, thinking over everything she had said. Yeah, if he's not going to man up and take this seriously, then I'm going to have to pull the pin on it. I don't like feeling like a yo-yo. The next morning, Aizawa met you in the staff room and handed you a sheet of paper. What's this? You asked as he took it from his hand. Our approval for the mid-year festival. They said we can do a fashion show, so you just need to talk to Yayurazu and get her to apply for an exemption if she's going to make the clothes with her quirk. Whoa, that was fast. I didn't think they would approve it that quick, you said, taking the paper from his hand. You looked it over, then nodded. I'll talk to Yayurazu the minute she gets in this morning. He nodded, and you walked past him and out of the staff room, unaware that he was checking you out as you left. She always looks so good, he thought as he turned and walked over to his desk to get a few things before class. As soon as Yayurazu entered the class that morning, you smiled and waved her over. Good news, he said. We've been approved as a class to do the fashion show for the festival. You just need to apply for an exemption if you want to make the clothes from your quirk. Oh, how wonderful, she said excitedly, bouncing and clapping her hands together. I'll apply online at lunchtime today. Good, he said with a smile. You kept chatting about the things that she had in mind for the fashion show, and slowly more students entered the room and walked over, adding in their thoughts to the conversation until everyone was involved. You were so busy talking to them all that you didn't see Aizawa enter and walk over to his desk. Silently he watched you talking to everyone, your smile making his heart warm every time he saw it, and his expression softened the longer he looked at you. She is beautiful, inside and out. Feeling someone's eyes on you, you looked up and your gaze met his. Unfazed, he just kept looking at you, but you couldn't handle it and looked away, addressing your students to cover your flusteredness. Um, Mr. Aizawa is here now, please take your seats. The students looked up and saw him, then quickly scrambled to sit down before he blew his top. Silence fell, and everyone waited expectantly for him to speak, but he just stood silently and walked to the board, writing something up there to start that morning's lesson. Is he mad at me? You wondered, taking his silence as displeasure. I can't even tell. I don't, didn't know he'd come in. If I had, I would have directed the students to sit down sooner. After class, you went back to the staff room to apologise to Aizawa. Hey, he says as you approached his desk. I'm sorry about this morning. I didn't know you had arrived. I didn't even hear you enter the classroom. If I had, I would have had the stu... I don't know why you feel the need to apologise. I'm not angered, he said in his bored tone. I was admiring you. Your heart skipped a beat and fell on its face. Why does he do this to me? Your inner voice screamed, the turmoil in your heart making you turn around and head for the door before you could say anything stupid in reply. Suddenly a binding cloth snagged your wrist and yanked you backwards, making you stumble back and spin to try and catch yourself from falling, but thankfully Aizawa was right there to break your fall. As you fell against his chest, he put an arm around you to steady you 
and you looked up into his face. Are you not going to reply my comment? He asked in a very matter-of-fact voice. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to say anything that would get me in trouble, he replied. How so? You're so hot and cold, Aizawa. Why, why do I feel like everything is still on your terms? I don't want to get hurt, he said softly. Before Aizawa could reply, he heard footsteps approaching the staff room and so let your wrist go with his cloth and stepped back, giving you a longing look before turning away. Uh, you're okay to take the track class this afternoon? He asked while looking away, changing subjects so that it wouldn't look awkward when the next person entered the room. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine, he replied, noticing what he had done just as midnight, another teacher in the school walked in. Good. He headed for the door, not even acknowledging Midnight as she sauntered past and gave him a smiling greeting. You watched him go and said a polite hello to Midnight before walking to your desk and sitting down to collect yourself for a few seconds. Ah, oh, confusing, aren't they? Midnight said candidly as she pulled her drawer open and grabbed her makeup bag out. I'm sorry? You asked, looking up at her. Oh, men. So hot and cold, Aizawa is no exception. Did she hear our conversation? He thought as he looked at her and tried to keep a blank face. But, she sighed, he does have his reasons for being the way he is. He's had a bit of a tough time. Your interest peaked and you shifted your body in the chair towards her a little, showing your interest. I want to ask what she's talking about, but I don't want to seem too nosy or overtly interested, he thought, sucking your cheek in between your teeth and biting down on it. Midnight could feel your eagerness and smirked as she put her makeup brush down and then walked over to your desk and leaned down on it, ready to divulge some juicy gossip. You leaned in a little, more than eager to hear what she had to say. I know this first hint, Midnight stated. This happened during high school, but the after effects seem to have haunted Shoto ever since. Your eyes widened when you heard how potentially serious this little piece of information could be and waited for her to continue. Back in high school, she regaled, Shotoa, Hazashi and Oboro were classmates and friends. I too was in the same class as they and can vouch for Oboro. He was kind of cute. She stared off for a second or two with a soft look in her eye before continuing. Oboro and Hazashi were the loud ones who adopted Aizawa, let's be honest here. You cracked a smile and nodded. Yeah, that makes sense. There was an incident during hero work studies where Oboro lost his life when a building collapsed on him. Shotoa was affected the most, she said, the sorrow on her face showing clearly. Oh, I'm so sorry, he said sadly. That makes sense now. Mm, that's not all of it, she added. Since then, Shotoa has found out that his friend's body was stolen by a particularly strong villain group and turned into a Nomu. Oh my god, you gasped, covering your face with your hands. I've heard of Nomus from the news, but I've never seen any in real life. It kills him inside that he can't save his friend, she said softly, continuing on like she hadn't heard you. He looks morose, but deep down he really cares a lot, and I think that's why he's too afraid to let anyone in again, in case he loses them. Your eyes welled with tears, and you looked away to compose yourself. I didn't tell you any of this though, okay? She said as she straightened and walked back to her desk, picking up her makeup brush again. But just keep it in mind. Thank you for telling me, he said to her. That explains a lot. I'll make sure not to say anything that could trigger him. Anyone who manages to get him to open up again is gonna be on a pedestal, Midnight commented as she bent down to the mirror to apply her makeup. He's been particularly closed off to relationships for, for years. You nodded and stood up. Well, I don't know about relationships, but I'll do my best not to upset him, you said, trying not to step into the trap that she was setting for you. She nodded and watched you leave. Ah, good luck, Yin. I don't know if anyone can get him to open it up again, it's you. I'm just giving you the background that you need to be able to work your magic. Things seemed to be a little awkward between you and Aizawa in class, for different reasons. Aizawa just wanted to touch you, hold you, and try to make things better, considering what you had said to him earlier. And you just wanted to hold him and tell him he didn't need to rush anything, now that you knew a little bit more about his background. I'll attend your track lesson. Aizawa said to you before you left the classroom a little earlier than the outdoor lesson had been planned for. I need to write a few reports on your teaching style and hand them to Nezu. Oh, fun. You deadpanned internally. Uh, okay, that's fine. You replied with a forced smile. 
walking away and out the door so that you could get set up for the track class while the students changed. As I watched you leave, should I have invited her to dinner? He wondered. I'd like to get to know her a little more. Okay, line up, you called to the students once everyone was out on the track. Today we'll be doing sprint training for endurance. I've set up markers along the track so that you know where to jog and where to sprint. Sprint at the blue markers and then slow to a jog at the red markers. Any questions? No miss, the class chorus together. Okay, all set, you called, waiting for the students to get themselves in a start position. Go! Bakugo was first off the line as usual and you chuckled to yourself as you watched him fly ahead while screaming, Die! He's always at 3000% isn't he? You thought, keeping an eye on the others as they took the jogging section at a more leisurely pace. You need to work on those who are not giving their all. Azawa's voice said in your ear, his face so close to yours that you could feel his breath on the back of your neck and you broke out in goosebumps. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, you replied, turning your head slightly to look back at him. But seeing him so close only made your brain short circuit, so you turned to look straight ahead again to keep you cool. He's standing so close. Why is he so close? I can't deal with this. You tried to focus on the students and watch what they were doing, but every fibre of your being was pulling your attention to the dishevelled man behind you. Do you have plans after school? He asked in a low voice, making you stiffen with anticipation. No, you said in an inquiring tone, as if, as if to ask why he was asking. You'll be hungry. Join me for dinner. Okay, you replied, trying not to sound too eager or excited. Calm down, Yin. It's just dinner, not a marriage proposal. He nodded and stepped back, grinning to himself at his triumph. I'll show her that I can be a more attentive person to her emotional needs, he thought with determination. You found it very hard to focus for the rest of the day, constantly remembering that you and Aizawa would be going out for dinner that evening. Am I dressed all right? You thought, looking down at your outfit during the next class. Maybe I should puff my boobs up a little bit like what Mina was talking about before. Yin! You immediately mentally slapped yourself. You're supposed to be playing it cool. Don't do anything to try and make yourself more appealing to him. We don't want to let him get us falling head over heels again now, do we? You settled back down in your chair and tried to listen to what Isaiah was talking about at the front of the room. But his monotone voice was becoming the soundtrack to your daydreams rather than anything else. Finally class ended and you got up and went to the staff room. Miss Lynn? Yagyorozu called as you turned for the door. Yes? You asked as you looked back at her. I have applied for exemption and it's now pending, she said with a bright smile. I should hear from them in another day or two. Oh that's wonderful Yagyorozu. Let me know when you get the approval, you said turning to the door once again. Uh, Miss Lynn, she called again. Our class is having a get-together on the weekend at my house. She dropped her head and fiddled with her uniform as a soft blush dusted her cheeks. Would you consider attending? Oh, that's very kind of you, you replied politely. I'm not sure if, as a teacher, I'm allowed to attend a student. I, I have yet to invite Mr. Aizawa, she cut in. Please do excuse my rudeness in interrupting you, but I would so love for you both to be there. Uh, I, um, please think about it, she asked with begging in her eyes. Uh, I, okay, I, I will, you promised. She smiled happily and bowed politely. Thank you, Miss Lynn. It's no problem, you replied with a polite smile. I do have to go now, but I will talk with you tomorrow, you added professionally. She smiled again and you left to put your things away before evening and heading out for dinner with Ozawa. Did she say yes? Mina asked with hushed excitement as she snuck up behind Yagyorozu. She said she would think about it, but I really do hope she comes, Yagyorozu said. And Aizawa is going to come too, right? Mina pressed, a mischievous look in her eye. I am yet to ask him, but I do hope so, Yagyorozu said. Okay, good, Mina said then looked over her shoulder to where Yuraraka and Hagakure were standing near their desks, with Yuraraka sporting a cheeky grin on her face. Let's put our plan into action. Plus Ultra! Yuraraka replied enthusiastically, raising her fist in the air while Hagakure jumped up and down squealing. In all honesty, I just wanted Miss Lin there. I'm only inviting Mr. Aizawa so that she will say yes because everyone has been invited. No, this is perfect because... Well, then we can get Aizawa to show his protective side when your personal chef starts to get friendly 
with Miss L, Mina said with a sly grin. Yagi Rozu sighed. Mina, I really don't want anything dramatic to happen. It'll be fine, trust me. That's the point, I don't trust you. But you will! See, this is going to strengthen their bond. You'll see, Mina sung, doing a little jig of happiness. Yuraraka and Hagakure were hyping Mina up from the background and Yagirozu shook her head. Oh, I just guess I'll see what happens, Yagirozu sighed. As he entered the staff room, Aizawa looked up from his desk and his bloodshot eyes stared you down. Uh, um, you hesitated, glancing around to make sure everyone had gone before asking your question. Should we leave the school grounds separately, then meet after? That would be best, Aizawa replied bluntly. Okay, uh, I'll leave and I'll meet you on the corner then, you said, walking to your desk to get your bag. Aizawa nodded and you left, quickly walking down the stairs and out of the building so that you could get to the corner as quickly as possible. What are we even going to talk about? Should I see if he'd tell me something about his past? Maybe I'll just ask a few questions to give him an opening and see if he trusts me enough to let me in? You thought as you speed walked down the sidewalk. Getting to the corner, you stopped and looked around. Suddenly, Aizawa was beside you and you almost screamed as he dropped down from the wall of UA and stood up. Why? You wheezed. Why did you come from the wall? I was expecting you to walk out the gates like a normal person. I'm not about to let you leave the school grounds on your own in the dark. I trailed you from the wall, he replied nonchalantly. Well, I appreciate it, but you still scared the crap out of me, you said, looking around again to see if anyone else had seen Aizawa's fantastic dismount from the UA wall. No one's around. I've already checked. He added when he saw you glancing around. <laughs> Not much gets by you, you mused, giving him a half smile. Mm. He hummed bluntly as he started walking, making you catch up beside him. So, he said, trying to liven the conversation up a little bit. Are we going to your usual dinner place? Aizawa thought for a second then replied. No, he stated. You choose. Me? Did I not say it clear enough? No, you did, but why me choose all of a sudden? You mentioned that you felt like everything was on my terms. I'm giving you the option of choosing where we eat so you no longer have an argument base. He stated bluntly. Okay, that would have been a really sweet gesture had you not worded it like that and said it in that tone, you thought, with a sweat drop look on your face. I really don't know of many places around here, but I'll pick something... If you'd prefer I did, you said out loud. Yes, he stated. You looked straight ahead again at a few small restaurants and then quickly glossed over the names above the doors. Uh, let's see that, that one, you said, pointing to one on the left. It sounds quaint. Aizawa didn't say anything, but just followed your lead and you happily strode out, excited to be trying a new place with him. As you reached the doors, a bubbly female with bright orange bandana on her head popped out and stopped right in your path. Oh, she gasped happily. Eraser, my husband! Your what? You asked with surprise, looking over your shoulder to Aizawa, who was a step behind you. I am not a husband, he stated bluntly. Oh, that's right. We're getting married this weekend, remember? This new woman teased. What's going on here? You asked, looking back and forth between the two. <gasps> Are you cheating on me? She suddenly gasped, finally acknowledging your existence. This is Miss Joke, Aizawa said to you, ignoring the lady's theatrics as he explained who she was. She is supposedly a hero and she thinks that she is funny, but as you can clearly see, she is not. You wound me, husband! Miss Joke teased with a giant grin on her face, clutching her chest to act like she had been shot. I'm not your husband. Date me then? I refuse. Uh, it, well, it was nice to meet you, you cut in, getting a little tired of Miss Joke's teasing of Aizawa, who was clearly not having any of it. But we are both hungry and would like to go inside to eat. Oh, you're not going to invite me as well? Miss Joke asked with a playful smile. No, Aizawa said sternly, she is not. Oh, well, have fun eating with your mistress, Miss Joke said with a chuckle as she skipped off leaving you and Aizawa standing there a little awkwardly. My apologies, Aizawa said in a dead tone. She is not affiliated with me. You made that very clear, but it appears that she has feelings for you, you mused. She's merely teasing me to try and get me to laugh. 
but I do not find her humour amusing. He stated as he stepped up to the door and pulled it open to let you in first. Clearly, you mumbled under your breath, stepping into the small restaurant and looking around. A waiter walked over and bowed politely to you and Aizawa, before ushering you both to a nearby table to have a seat. Do you have many people that you associate with outside of school? You asked him as you looked over the menu. No. Why doesn't that surprise me? You thought as you flipped the page open and read the dishes on the back. What about yourself? He then asked. Me? Your head shot up with surprise. Is he asking about me? Is this a two-sided conversation? I don't think he's ever asked about my personal life before. Oh, excuse me. You don't need to answer that question. I'm sorry for probing into your private life. He suddenly said. I... No, no, it's, it's fine. I, I'm just surprised because... Uh, never mind. Um, uh, no, I don't actually have anyone that I associate with outside of school. I mean, I have friends, but they're all busy these days, so um, I just go home. I live on my own, but Granny lives kind of close. She's my only surviving relative. You were spilling information as quickly as possible, but the way Aizawa had gone back to looking at his menu made you feel like you'd spoken for too long. <sighs> just shut up, Yin. You've bored him. You thought as you clamped your, your mouth shut and dropped your head down again. There was silence and your shoulders slumped a little. I guess I blew my one shot at having a two-way conversation. Spoke a little too much. When was the last time you saw your grandma? Aizawa asked. You looked up at him and brightened a little. Uh, a while. Um, before I left for the teachers conference where you and I met, he said. I've been intending to go and visit her since getting back. Aizawa nodded. I regret not seeing my grandparents more when they were here. <gasps> oh my god, we're having a conversation. Call the newspapers. This is amazing. Your brain screamed and you had to focus so as not to let your exuberance show on your face. Have you decided what you want to eat? He asked. Oh, you look back down and glossed over the last page. Uh, I think I think I'll try their specials dish. He nodded and held a hand up to get the attention of the waiter who was watching from a distance. Yes, sir? The waiter asked as he approached the table. Are you ready to order? Yes. Lady would like your specials dish, Aizawa said, ordering for you. And I'll have your salmon. The waiter nodded and wrote the orders down before asking if you wanted any drinks. You both ordered a drink each and then you were left to talk on your own again. Uh, did you also attend UA High School? You asked Aizawa as you sat back in your chair. Yes, he said, crossing his arms across his chest. Oh, that's a defensive stance, Aizawa, you thought, wondering if you should push your luck by asking any more questions. There was a moment of stiff silence and you copied Aizawa's position, crossing your own arms across your chest and waiting for him to say something. I would ask about your schooling, but I already know about it, Aizawa commented, letting his arms go a little. Your heart jumped and you quickly uncrossed your arms and scratched your nose to hide your sudden flusteredness. Oh, I, uh, was that on my application and resume? You commented to him. Correct. But I also did my own research. He added unashamedly, his unwavering gaze making your whole body act up. I saw her. My heart is hurting right now. There's too much adrenaline in my system. Please stop making me feel this way. You screamed internally. Oh, I see. Uh... Yes, well, I also looked you up as well, you admitted, grateful that the waiter had returned with drinks at that point. And what did you find about me? He asked with bland curiosity. Uh, not much. You keep a low profile, he replied honestly. Good. Why is it good? Is that because you're trying to hide something? You leaned forward and took a sip of your drink and then sat back. So, you were researching me. As I commented, his bloodshot eyes looking onto yours as he pulled his sleeve up and grabbed the hair tie. Ah, uh, well, yeah, you mumbled, keeping your eyes averted. Why? Ah, uh, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't looking for anything in particular. I just... Why? Does it matter? You asked, feeling put on the spot. No need to get defensive. This isn't an interrogation. He said as he pulled his hair up and on into a bun. I'm merely asking a question. I do like that you are interested. You relaxed, but your heart rate was going double time now. Well, same, you said to him. He nodded. 
The waiter walked over with your meals and then placed them down on the table in front of you both and you adjusted your seat so that you could get to your bowl better. As you slid the chair forward on the floor, your foot came in contact with Aizawa's leg under the table and you apologised quickly. I don't mind, he replied in a deadpan voice, digging into his meal. Oh, he replied, allowing your foot to remain touching him. You started eating as well and noticed that he had shifted his leg out a little bit so there was a definite contact between your body parts. I'm not opposed to this contact, you thought as you shifted your foot up and down his leg, rubbing it a little. Ozawa didn't react outwardly, but you could tell that he had felt your subtle nudge. Good food, you commented after swallowing a mouthful. And company, he stated. Your heart glitched and your lip twitched. Is he flirting? You rubbed his leg again with your foot and chuckled a little. Yeah, I agree, company's good. You smiled across at him watching his sharp jaw clench as he chewed. More small talk continued between mouthfuls, and although it wasn't a full-on conversation, you felt relaxed enough, but Aizawa still hadn't allowed you to dig too deep into his life, only keeping information very superficial. After finishing dinner, Aizawa offered to walk you home. You know, you don't need to overextend yourself like this. I can get home just fine by myself, you said to him as he walked beside you. I told you before. I need to be assured of your safety, he replied. You talk like you've had a bad experience in the past, you remarked, seeing if he would open up a little then. I'm a hero. I've had a lot of bad experiences and seen a lot of people get hurt, he replied. Mm, still not going to open up, huh? You thought. As you approached your front gate, you paused. Um, if you're not needing to run off for hero duty, you're welcome to come up for a hot drink, you offered expecting that he would say no if it's not encroaching on your time he replied leaving his reply open-ended oh he's actually going to come up N no it's no trouble at all he said quickly opening the gate and leading the way up to the front door of the building complex you open the door and let him up to your apartment do you mind if i take my jacket off he asked as you open the door to your apartment no not at all you shook your head make yourself at home while Aizawa took his jacket off and draped it over the lounge chair, you went to the kitchen and flicked the hot water jug on. Do you mind if I take my heels and stockings off? It's warm in here. You asked from where you were getting the things in the cupboard. Make yourself at home. It's your place. He replied as he sat down on the lounge and rested his head back against the headrest. You nodded and quickly left the kitchen and headed to your room to take your stockings and heels off, emerging in just your teacher's skirt and shirt. Getting back to the kitchen, you quickly made two coffees and carried them over to Aizawa, who was still resting on the lounge. Thank you, he said in his deep voice, his eyes still shut as you put the cups down on the coffee table. Don't feel obliged to stay if you're tired, he said gently. I know you love your sleep. When I'm enjoying the company that I'm with, I'll give up sleep, he said as he opened his eyes and looked at you. You tried to suppress your happiness from his comment, but failed and he smirked. I'm glad I'm saying the right things to make you happy. He leaned forward and picked up his cup. Oh, you have, you said, picking up your coffee and taking a sip. There was silence for a second, as you both enjoyed the taste, and then you rested back against the lounge and twisted your body, then pulled your legs up and tucked them under you to face him, cupping the coffee mug in your hands. Thank you for coming up, you said softly. I feel safe and comfortable with you. Likewise, he replied as he put his coffee cup back on the table then turned to you. Before you could register what it was happening, your lips were pressed to his and his hand was cupping your jaw and ear. Immediately he deepened the kiss and your tongues touched and rolled together. Reaching out with your right hand, you put your coffee cup down on the table and let Aizawa lie you back, his body between your legs, pushing a skirt all the way up. As I stated at the end of chapter 52, we are picking up this chapter after they are clothed and in their right mind from the romp on the lounge. So this is their conversation after they've been intimate on the lounge. I won't lie, I've been on my mind since the bathhouse weekend. Ozawa said casually as he walked back over and sat down next to you to finish his coffee. Well, same, but like I said before, I don't want to pursue anything if you're going to be all hot and cold on me, he said. You say this. Just after we've been intimate on the couch. He deadpanned, glancing at you from the corner of his eye. Man, I know, okay? What am I supposed to do when you're so hot? You reached for your cup and took a sip. 
Okay, well, I'm going to ask you straight. What do you propose we do? Aizawa was silent for a second, not looking at you. What would you be comfortable with? He asked in a very matter-of-fact but dead tone. Man, don't smack the ball back into my court. I don't want to have to lead this thing, you wailed internally, looking back down to your cup of coffee in your hand and swishing the contents around a bit. Would you be happy with a casual relationship? Aizawa asked. Are you meaning hookups? You asked, looking at him. Not exactly, he replied, taking a sip of coffee. You waited for him to continue. Seeing as we're both teachers at the same school, our professional life comes first, he said. You nodded, not necessarily agreeing with his statement, but just letting him know that you'd heard him. Um, where I'm at right now also plays a part in my wanting to maintain a degree of distance. It sounds like you just want hookups, you stated. Please don't misunderstand. I care about you very much, Yin. I would like for us to continue to see each other, but I can't put a name to this relationship, he said, averting his bloodshot eyes from yours. And why won't you just tell me what's going on? Maybe if you let me in, I'd be able to understand what's going on and help in some way, he thought, looking at his face. Go on, Yin. Say it. Just say it like that. Aizawa, your voice trailed off. He looked at you, waiting for you to say more, but you hesitated, chewing the inside of your cheek before saying the rest. Was there something that happened that makes you not want to get close with anyone again? You asked. I'd rather not discuss it, he said plainly. Your heart sank. You were really hoping that this would be the time that he opened up to you, talking everything out in the comfort of your living room, but that fantasy wasn't going to happen tonight. In response to his reply, you nodded glumly and took a sip of coffee, but then held it in your mouth for a bit because you'd lost your appetite, to be honest, when he had turned down the opportunity to talk. Apologies, Yin. I didn't mean for tonight to end this way, he said, standing up from the lounge and walking over to his jacket. You just nodded again, afraid to speak because you could already feel the tears starting to well in your eyes. He took his jacket from the chair and slung it over his arm and then nodded at you. Thank you for the coffee. He said politely, then headed for the front door. Frozen in place, you didn't even get a chance to say goodbye before he left, and the minute the door clicked closed, your bottom lip quivered and a tear slid down your cheek. Mm, this sucks, you thought, looking down at your coffee, then placing it back on the coffee table again. Feeling overwhelmed with negative emotions, you just lay down and curled up on the lounge, crying for a while about what to do about Aizawa. Aizawa left with a heavy heart, berating himself for how he had conducted himself that night. I really do want to make you happy. I wanted to show her that I could be emotionally available, but my past is just holding me back far more than I expected. He walked out of the building and off down the street. But also, I don't like the idea of a casual relationship, but what other option do I have? His shoulders slumped and he hung his head a little more. Maybe it would be best to just back off and go strictly to professional relationship, he thought, his brain bringing up the memory of his fingers dragging down your thighs as you moaned his name and he shook his head dully. I can't give her up. I really do like her a lot. After spending a little time having a pity party for yourself, you got up, picked up the coffee mugs and carried them to the sink, then dumped the contents down the drain. I guess I should go to bed anyway and get ready for another cringe day at work with Aizawa, you grimaced internally walking back to the lounge room to check that nothing else needed fixing before turning in for the night. As you looked down at the floor, you saw something black sticking out from under the edge of the lounge. Cocking your head to the side curiously, you bent down to pick it up to see what it was. A hair tie? Is this Aizawa's hair tie? You flipped it over a few times before slipping it on your wrist. Mm, guess I'll give it to him tomorrow, you thought as you turned and headed for your bedroom. The next day, you walked confidently into the school grounds and walked up to the staff room. Good morning, Hazashi, you greeted the loud teacher. Hey, Yin, he hollered loudly when he saw you. Good morning and welcome to another day in sunny UA. Hazashi, we're not on air, you chuckled. This isn't the radio station. It's still a beautiful day nonetheless. Is that show to us hair tie? He suddenly asked when he spotted it around your wrist. It, it's a black hair tie. It, it could be mine for all you know. Why would you immediately think it's his? Because it is mine, Aizawa said blandly from behind you. You quickly spun around and faced him. 
I dropped it coming in this morning. He lied. Thank you for picking it up. Oh, uh, uh you're welcome, you mumbled, slipping it off and handing it to him. Yeah, best we don't say that it fell off at my house while we were um, being intimate on the lounge, he thought with an internal smirk. We have another ethics class today. As I was said to you, would you like to take it so I can continue my report to Nezu on your teaching style? Oh yeah, that's fine, he replied in a very matter-of-fact tone. I'll go and get set up in the classroom then. And with that, you left. Once you were out of the staff room, Hazashi sidled up beside Aizawa and slung his arm across the morose teacher's shoulders. You came in later than Yin, the loud teacher smirked smugly. How could you have dropped your hair tie and she picked it up if she was in front of you and entered this staff room before you? Ask no questions, get told no lies. Aizawa stated before shrugging his ashy's arm off and walking out of the staff room, intending to follow you down to the classroom so he could talk to you. I'll get you and Yin together someday, his Ashi called out after Aizawa had left. You were quietly proud of how you had conducted yourself in the staff room just then. You hadn't shown even a skerrick of pain that you'd felt when Aizawa treated you so casually. I'm just going to tell him to dial it right back to being professional. I can't handle this constant state of are we work colleagues or part-time lovers. Setting your jaw, you walked into the classroom and over to the blackboard, picking up a piece of chalk so that you could write your name and the topic that you would be discussing with the class. No sooner had you started to write your name, Aizawa's bind had caught your wrist. You looked over at him and grabbed for the bind to pull it off, but the way he looked at you made you stop. Yin, Aizawa said in his mellow, bland voice. No, Aizawa, you stated. I don't like feeling like this. I'm just a toy on a shelf for you. I'm truly sorry, he said in monotone grief. Please, let's talk tonight after class. You sighed, your head and your heart at war with each other. Give him a chance. Give the goddamn jawline a chance, your heart screamed. He wants to do the right thing. You have plenty of room to give him some time to come around. No, your brain screamed back. You are better than this. All he's going to do is make you feel wanted and loved for 0.03 seconds and then screw you and then withdraw again. Don't be stupid. It's always like this. But maybe this time will be different, your heart cried back. This is the third time that you've confronted like this. Third time's always a charmer. You sighed again, allowing your heart to open your mouth for the reply. Okay, we can talk, you said, not completely happy with your decision to let him try again, but also not wanting to lose an opportunity with him. He nodded, his facial expressions showing that he was at least slightly relieved that you had agreed to talk with him. His bind slipped off your wrist and you went back to writing, trying not to be fazed by the fact that he was still standing there looking at you. Just then the bell rang and students started to file in, your girl squad coming to the front to talk to you excitedly before finding their seats. As they departed from you, Yagirozu walked over to Aizawa. Mr. Aizawa, sir? Yagirozu addressed Aizawa as he sat down at his desk. This weekend, our class is having a get-together at my residence and I would love for you and Miss Lin to be in attendance as well. She has already responded with her interest, she added quickly. I'll discuss it with Miss Lin, Aizawa stated, his eyes falling on your side and back as you kept writing and ignoring their conversation. Yayorozu nodded and bowed before heading to her seat, but not before replying with an outstretched hand to Mina's sneaky high five. Good morning, class, you greeted them brightly once you had finished writing on the board. Good morning, Miss Lin, they chorused. I have this morning's lesson. He said with a smile as you pointed to the title written on the board behind you. Let's begin. The class went very smoothly and the girls especially were very attentive and had a lot of good replies and questions. You were a little surprised at how involved they all were. That was until you saw Shoji had floated an eye up to see what Aizawa was writing, then realised that you were being critiqued on your teaching style and alerted the class so that they all got more involved to make you look even better. Has Aizawa noticed? You wondered glancing at him as he wrote something else down on the paper in front of him. The class concluded well, and the bell rang right as you were wrapping up. Miss Lin, Yayorozu said in her bright voice as she approached, approached you at the front. The point you made about moral dilemmas and villain tendencies was intriguing. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, you're welcome, he said with a smile. I do so enjoy your teaching style, Yayorozu added, her gaze flicking to Aizawa, then back to you. You have a very clear speech and direction when you're taking a class. 
Oh, thank you, Yagirozu, he said with a shy smile. Is she doing this so that Aizawa hears? She nodded and glanced at Aizawa one more time before leaving for the next class and you hesitated a look at him. We're all on your side, he commented as he stood up, still looking down at his desk. I'm sorry, I didn't tell them to do any of that. They did that on their own, he said apologetically. I was hoping you didn't notice. Told you, nothing much gets by me. Evidently, he mused. Um, anyway, I heard you mention to Yagirozu about the weekend. I would like to be in attendance, but I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to make you feel uncomfortable. He stated, why would I feel uncomfortable? You asked, I'm happy for you to be there. He nodded and walked past you to the door. Let's meet in the staff room after class finishes. If no one else is there, then we can discuss us. But if my loudmouthed friend is there and Miss Gossip is there, then we should find somewhere else to talk. You cracked a smile. Sure, that sounds fine by me. It was now later in the staff room and everyone else had left for the day. Is it safe to talk now? You asked Aizawa from your desk as you finished up a few things. I think so, he replied getting up and walking over to your desk to rest his backside on the corner as he looked down at you. Well, you talk first. I want to hear from your end what's going on. What did you want to discuss? You asked, sitting back in your chair and crossing your arms across your chest as you looked up at him. First, I want to apologise for the way I left your place last night. As you've probably picked up, I'm a bit of an introvert. I like to keep to myself. Introvert is an understatement. Is there a word that's more strong than introvert to describe someone's extreme pleasure of being by themselves? But there's no excuse for being cut off like I was. I went in with the intention to show you that I could be emotionally available, but then when it came to proving it, I shut down. Well, first of all, thank you, you replied him. I appreciate that you've taken the time to acknowledge how I would be feeling, so I'm going to be as straight up as possible. You took a deep breath in. I can't do relationships in a half-hearted manner. I'm either all in and invested or I'm not. Aizawa nodded and waited for you to continue. This whole seeing each other but respecting emotional and professional boundaries is tiring and I don't like it, you admitted. I'm not saying that I want to be making out in the middle of class. I'm just saying I want to feel like we're on the same level and both putting in as much effort as the other. You pause there, giving Aizawa room to say his piece. I'll be straightforward and honest with you then. Aizawa replied, his bloodshot eyes peeking out from behind his heavy fringe. I've not had a serious relationship with anyone, and due to an incident that happened in high school, I don't know if I'll ever truly be able to open up again. Oh, there's the hint, you thought with hope. He's at least mentioned it, so I might be able to ask questions about it. What happened in high school? You asked curiously. Aizawa's lip twitched, and he looked away from you, his whole body stiffening. Now's not the time to talk about it, but I will tell you at some point. He turned his body away from you and hung his head, his side profile making him look super hot. Well, I really would like to get to know you on a deeper level, he said softly, standing up and moving around to his side. You weren't sure if you should try and hug him, so you just left yourself open and stood there waiting to see what he would do. Azawa looked at you, pushing off from the desk and moving closer to you. Would it be appropriate to kiss you? In, he asked. I don't want you to feel like this relationship is only physical. A kiss is fine, he said with a soft smile. He closed the gap and bent his head down, kissing you tenderly and with such care that your whole body melted into his and you completely forgot why you two had been fighting in the first place. I'll accompany you to Yaoyorozu's house on the weekend and then afterwards we can spend some time together, he said after he had pulled back from the kiss. That sounds nice, he said with a warm smile. I don't want you to feel pressured into any of this though. I'm not being pressured. I told you before, I've developed feelings for you. It's just a matter of finding a common ground for the two of us to stand on, he said bluntly. You nodded bashfully and then stepped back from him. Well, I don't want to keep you, so I'll leave it at that, he said, backing to the door. I'll see you tomorrow. Ozawa nodded and watched you leave before walking back to his desk. Now I just need to open up. It's not really my cup of tea, though. A heavy, unhappy look covered his face and he looked down at his desk. But I really want to make things work with Yin. And so far it's me being emotionally closed off that's holding everything back. 
He picked up a few things off the desk and then turned to the door. I can do this. The girls of 1A chatted excitedly about the upcoming class weekend and plans were made for the evening. Oh, Miss Lynn! Yayirozu called as he walked past them at break time. Yes? You asked, pausing in the hallway to speak with her. For the get-together at my residence on the weekend, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind wearing something I made. Something you made? You asked with surprise. Yes, I designed a dress that I was hoping to use for the upcoming festival, but I want to see if there's anything that needs fixing before the big reveal day. Would you mind wearing it for the night, just so you can give me some feedback on it? Um, that's fine by me, but I'm just ho hoping it's not too overdressed. Oh, you won't be, you'll be fine, Yagirozu promised. Fast forward to the night of the get-together. Miss Lin, you look stunning! Yagirozu gasped as he stepped out of the change room in her very spacious bedroom. Yagirozu, there are sparkly sequins all down the front of this dress, he deadpanned. It really brings out your shape, she gushed. I look like I'm on the Paris runway, he deadpanned again. Exactly, she squealed with excitement, clapping her hands together and bouncing up and down. I do remember saying that I hoped it wasn't going to be over the top, he said, trying to point out that this was definitely over the top. Imagine when, uh, uh, um, I, I mean, is this to do with you girls trying to get Aizawa to notice me? You asked suspiciously when you caught her verbal fumble. She closed her mouth and tried to give you an innocent look, but you read right through it. Yayirozu, I'm going to be the only person dressed up and everyone else is going to be in casual clothes. He said with a bit of a begging in your voice, like, please let me take this off. Please leave it on, Miss Lynn, please, she begged. You stared her down for a few seconds, then conceded. Okay, but I'm going to be telling everyone that it's because you asked me to wear it. I don't want to seem like I'm being extra, you said, shimmying your hips a little and making the diamonds along the seam sparkle. That's completely fine, she replied. Everyone's going to think you look amazing anyway. You sighed to yourself then followed her out of the room and down to the large hall where everyone would be meeting when they got there. This is going to be very awkward. First of all, I'm here before everyone else and now I have to make polite chat until Aizawa gets here, but then I can't be too friendly with him because the girls will be watching and oh, I just want to go home. Can I offer you a drink? Yayorozu asked you politely as you both walked into the hall. Oh, yes please, you said giving her a polite smile. At least I can hold on to something so I won't look as nervous. You waited for Yagirozu to call over one of the wait staff that was holding onto a tray of drinks and delicately plucked one off. Taking a small sip, you gave Yagirozu a closed lip smile as you looked around the hall, which was empty apart from the tables of food and drink, wait staff, and you and Yagirozu. So, what is tonight all about? You asked her, trying to make light conversation while you both waited for the other people to arrive. Oh, I just thought it would be a nice opportunity for everyone to... Miss Lynn, a male voice said from behind you, making you turn to see who it was. Oh, chef, you greeted, recognising the chef that you had met at Yagirozu's family bathhouse in the mountains. It's an absolute pleasure to see you again, he said, stepping forward and delicately taking your hand in his so that he could give it a kiss. You allowed it but felt a little uncomfortable at the same time. Unsure if this chef was still only doing this for Yagirozu's sake, or if he really did indeed find you attractive. This dress, he exclaimed, stepping back to take you all in. Oh, Yagirozu designed this from her quirk and insisted that I wear it this evening for the purpose of, it is most flattering on you, the chef said with an enamoured look in his eye. Miss Yagirozu has done a fine job, as expected. Hmm, compliments all round, he mused looking across at Yagirozu, who was blushing with pride. It's only natural that I ask Miss Lin to wear this dress, considering her shape is superb. Mm, I must agree, the chef said emphatically. Why do people talk as if I'm not in the room? You ask yourself. Uh, well, thank you, but it's much too showy for the current event, you said with a sweat-dropped look on your face. I feel very overdressed. You deserve to be the star at any function the chef stated, being such a lovely person and all. Please, someone take me out with a sniper rifle, I'm begging. The two continued to talk and compliment you, making you feel more and more awkward until finally the front gate bell chimed. 
Oh, I think more of our guests have arrived. Yayurozu gasped excitedly. Chef, would you mind taking Miss Lin for a walk in the garden and I'll greet the invitees? Oh, please don't leave me with him, you begged internally, throwing Yayurozu a look. But it was too late. She had already taken off to greet the classmates and you were now linking arms with the chef and being walked off into the picturesque garden outside. It's a nice night, you said, feeling very awkward. It's even more beautiful now that you're here, the chef added with a smile. Oh, chef, you really don't have to be giving me so many compliments, you said with a forced smile. I know you are most supportive of Via Yorosu's work, but she is no longer here, so you can keep the flattery to a minimum. Oh, but I find you quite delightful, Miss Yin. I would like to ask if there is a Mr. Lin on the scene, or if no Mr. Lin, a suitor perhaps? Miss Lin was focused on her work and her students. A strong, familiar, masculine voice cut in from behind you both. It would take a lot to catch the eye of such a woman. You let out a sigh of relief and looked back over your shoulder to see Aizawa in a black and white suit with his hair tied back. Ah, the hot homeless man has come to my rescue, you thought with delight, your relief clearly showing on your face and telling Aizawa all that he needed to know. Oh, I don't doubt that for a second, Chef replied to Aizawa as he turned his body a bit, and I doubt that such a woman would mix business with pleasure. He added with a snide undertone. The fact that you feel the need to make such a comment tells me that you already feel the pressure of my presence. Aizawa stated, his bloodshot eyes holding an unwavering gaze as he confidently stared the chef down. The chef clammed up immediately, not wanting to say anything else that could be used against him. Oh, uh, thank you for showing me the gardens, he said quickly to the chef, before unhooking your arm from his and stepping away. I'll go and attend the students who have just arrived. You stepped past Aizawa, and he bent his head to whisper something to you as you passed. Go. I'll keep the chef at bay. You nodded a little and walked away quickly, leaving the two men alone. Aizawa waited for you to leave completely before speaking, wanting his words to only be heard by the chef. I would appreciate if you kept your distance from my assistant, he stated in a cool, calm voice. Does my presence around her bother you? The chef replied smartly, crossing his arms across his chest defiantly. No, your presence around her bothers her, Aizawa retorted in his dead voice. You seem awfully confident of this, the chef remarked, trying to make it sound like he wasn't put off by Aizawa's comment. That's because I know her well. Or so you would like to think, the chef replied haughtingly. Miss Lin is free to talk to whoever she likes. So if she is uncomfortable, as you say, with my presence, then she can tell me herself. Suit yourself, but I'll not stand for harassment, Aizawa said as he turned and walked away. If you're harassing her, I will most definitely step in. <laughs> this deadbeat teacher thinks he's so good. I'll show him I'm far better suited to date Miss Lin than he, the chef thought, pursing his lips together defiantly. You had quickly made your way back to the hall to greet your students and had completely forgotten about the over-the-top dress that you were in as you stepped back into the hall. Oh, wow! Mina shouted when she saw you. You look amazing, Miss L. Where's Aizawa when you need him? He needs to see this. Mina, he said in a hushed tone, glancing around to make sure she hadn't caught anyone else's attention with her statement. Yeah, you're also made me wear this. I do not want to be in such an extravagant dress. She does look stunning, doesn't she? Yagirozu gushed as she walked over to enter the conversation. Oh, please, this whole night has started terribly. You cried internally as the girls gushed over your outfit. A waiter walked past with flutes of non-alcoholic drinks on a tray and you quickly took one as he passed, taking some awkward sips on it to keep your mouth full so you didn't have to engage in any conversation. Miss Lin, Azawa's voice said from behind you, and you turned around with mouth half full to face him. Mm? You hummed in question before trying to swallow the drink down. A word, if I may, he said in a low voice. Oh, now what's wrong? You thought as you handed the now empty flute to a different waiter, who just so happened to be walking by, and followed Aizawa out of the hall. He led you back outside, and you glanced around nervously to make sure that the chef wasn't still around. He left, Aizawa said over his shoulder without looking at you. Oh, you could see me looking for him, you commented. I felt your... Unease, he replied, 
and you smiled a little. It's a nice feeling to feel like someone is in tune with you. Silently, you followed him further into the garden, wondering where he was taking you, as it was a fair distance from the house now. Where are we going? You asked curiously. He didn't reply. Azala? He finally stopped and turned to face you, his bloodshot eyes stopping you in your tracks. I never got a chance to tell you that you look beautiful, he stated, his compliment sounding more like a fact than a compliment. His comment was flattering, maybe because it was coming from him and you enjoyed any comment from him, but to be quite frank, you were over all this unnecessary attention and you replied a little more despondently than he was expecting. I just want to get out of this dress, he said sadly. I've been here for about a half hour and I honestly just want to go. I must admit, I feel the same way. He agreed, stepping towards you. Can we leave though? That's going to look suspicious if we leave at the same time, you said, still crestfallen. He closed the gap between yourself and him and reached out for your hand, which you allowed to t him to take in his own. We do need to discuss things, he said, the light from the house in the distance catching his face in just the right light to highlight his features. Subconsciously, you bit into your bottom lip and glanced at his lips, then back up to his eyes, and he saw the way you looked at him and slowly leaned towards you, which you mirrored, and before you knew it, you were kissing. For a moment, nothing else mattered except for the two of you, his hands gently holding your hand, then slipping to your waist as your mouths moved together in unison. You go and get changed, Aizawa finally said as he pulled back from the kiss, and then leave. I'll leave shortly after. We can go back to my place and talk. You nodded, your core starting to ache at the prospect of being alone with Aizawa in his house. I won't be long, he replied, stepping away from his tender embrace and turning to go. You have to come up with an adequate excuse to leave. Walking a little faster now, you made a beeline for the hall. All the students had arrived by then and were having a wonderful time together, so it was now or never. This is perfect, actually. They're all preoccupied, so it will be easier for me to get away. Through the crowds, you spotted Yao Yorozu, so quickly approached her and touched her shoulder to get her attention. I'm so sorry, Yao Yorozu. Something has come up and I must leave, you said in the most apologetic voice you could muster. Oh, is everything okay, Miss Lin? She asked with genuine concern. Yes, it'll be fine, but I must go. I'll leave this dress in your room, okay? I'll come with you, she offered. N no, that's fine. You stay here. I'll be back in a minute you said, backing away. At that moment, a waiter called for everyone's attention and announced the arrival of food and the black-haired student's concentration left you for a second, giving you the opportunity to duck away before she had a chance to insist again. Speed walking to the door, you were out and into the hallway in a second and commenced your purposeful walk to her room. You hadn't gotten very far when the chef suddenly appeared before you. Miss Lin, he said, stepping right into your path. Oh, he said with surprise at seeing him magically materialise in front of you. Chef, well, what can I do for you? Please, consider going on a date with me, he said, bowing low in front of you. You were surprised by his sudden request, not knowing that he was starting to feel the pressure of Aizawa's masculinity, considering their talk a little earlier, and fearing that you would choose the messy-haired teacher over him. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I must decline, you said in a startled voice. Please, he begged, still bowed over. Just one date. Please allow me the honour. I'm sorry, he said again, feeling very put on the spot. But I must decline. Is there another that your heart belongs to? He asked sorrowfully, his amber eyes filling with gloom as he looked up into yours. Oh, I can't say that it belongs to Aizawa because we're not dating yet, and I don't want rumours to start about us, but I also don't want to say no, you thought, opening your mouth to reply him. Uh, well, I, I do have an interest in someone, so it would probably be best for us not to see each other, he replied diplomatically. Miss Lin, I have never met another as beautiful as you, the chef said, straightening and stepping towards you. Please, allow me one... That's enough. Suddenly a grey binding cloth appeared and wrapped around the shoulders, arms and face of the chef, covering his mouth to indicate that he was now done talking, whether he liked it or not. Oh, thank God he turned up at the right time. You sighed internally with relief, grateful that you didn't have to keep rejecting the chef. Continue on your way, Miss Lin, Aizawa said calmly, his arm muscles bulging a little in his white dress shirt as he held the chef in place. Thank you, 
he said, stepping around the still detained chef and picking the front of your dress up so you could make haste. I want to get out of here. I don't even want to know what's going to happen with the chef. Finally got to Yagyarozu's room and closed, then locked the door so you could change in peace and quiet. I told you I would step in. Aizawa said calmly to the wrapped up chef. What part of her decline did you not understand? Or are you completely deaf? He let the binds loose a little to allow the chef to speak, his dull gaze still holding a little annoyance as he awaited the pink-haired rival's reply. Why do you watch her so closely? The chef asked, half embarrassed that he had been caught in the middle of a confession that he was very obviously getting rejected on. She was my assistant. As I was stated, I have a duty of care to watch over her inside and outside of school hours. That sounds a little possessive, does it not? The chef replied with indignation. I wonder if Miss Lynn appreciates you watching her so close. She does, because it means that I'm right here to step in when someone with a disturbing aura harasses her. He replied with, with a calm conviction. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be going. And with that, he retracted his scarf and walked past the chef down the hall to post himself outside the room that you were changing in, should the chef decide to pester you again with his begging. Inside Yagyarozu's room, you changed quickly and hung her dress up on the hanger, then got back into your usual clothes. How am I going to get out of here without seeing that chef again? You wondered. I could use my quirk to escape the house, just slide out the window and stretch down the wall and away. You were seriously contemplating it when you heard Aizawa clear his throat outside the bedroom door and you ventured over to see what he was doing. Softly you opened the door and poked your head out. There was Aizawa, standing guard with his hair still in a bun and his arms crossed across his chest. I'm sorry, you said sheepishly. I'm causing a lot of trouble. It's not you who's causing the trouble. Don't blame yourself. You are the victim here, he replied, looking off down the hall. Yeah, but it's making you have to work overtime on my behalf. I am doing this of my own accord. You have not forced me to do anything, he replied calmly still looking away so that he missed your grateful smile. Well, thank you. I just want to get out of here now, he said. I'll escort you to the gates, he said, finally letting his serious gaze fall on you. This is now a matter of protection. The chef has twice been quite forward with his feelings towards you and twice you have wished to be away from him, so consider me a bodyguard of sorts. Well, thank you, bodyguard of sorts, he said with a cheeky smile. It's very much appreciated. He nodded, and you fell in step beside him, walking to the front of the house and then out to the gates. I'll leave soon, as I was said as he saw you off. Head down the road and I'll catch up. You nodded and walked off down the road, while Aizawa went back inside for a little bit to mix with the students before catching you up. Unbeknownst to you, Mina and Jiro were in the garden when you and Aizawa walked past to head to the front gate, and they ducked down and watched you walk together, hoping they would catch a kiss or something when it came time for Aizawa to say goodbye. Ah, damn it, they didn't kiss. Mina pouted when Aizawa just let you go, and you walked away without even so much as a glance backwards. I for sure thought they were going to kiss. Maybe Aizawa knew we were here, Jiro asked. He's got an eye for that kind of thing. They watched as he went back inside the house, and then followed a short way behind. He didn't stay for much longer, then excused himself to go home, and the two girls smirked at each other. I wonder if they're going on a date after this and he purposefully made it look like they left separately, Mina deducted. We'll just have to ask Miss Ella Monday, Jiro replied, twirling her ear jack around her finger. Azawa caught you up quickly as he walked along the quiet streets and took a good look around before taking you back to his place. Mina and Jiro saw us at the gates together, he commented, glancing over his shoulder as he walked side by side. I don't want to be tracked by them. Would they go that far as to follow us? You asked. I'm not sure, but I do get the feeling that they would very much like for us to become a couple, he commented, making your heart flutter in your chest. Mmm, you hummed, not wanting to confirm that you did indeed know that that's exactly what they wanted. Through streets and down back alleys you walked, until finally you came to his apartment block. Excuse the state of the place, he said in his usual bored tone as he placed the key into the lock and then pushed his apartment door open. His place wasn't that much bigger than yours, but there were a ton of mugs on the coffee table and lesson plans strewn across the lounge chairs and across the floor. 
<laughs> Teacher's life, you commented, looking around. Mm. He hummed. Can I get you a coffee? That would be nice, thank you. You walked over to the lounge and picked up some of the papers that were loosely placed out and put them together neatly, then lay them down on the corner of the coffee table and gently sat down. There weren't a lot of personal family stuff around the house, so you didn't get to have a sneaky peek of what his mother or father looked like, or if he had any siblings. Black coffee, Aizawa called to you. Oh, um, milk and sugar, please. Thank you, you called back, settling back on the lounge and looking up at the ceiling. In another moment, Aizawa appeared, still looking dashingly hot and tired, with two coffee mugs in his hands. Here, he said, passing one to you. Thank you, he replied, gratefully taking the mug in hand and inhaling the pungent aroma. Ozawa sat down next to you and placed his mug on the t coffee table, indicating that he would be the one doing the talking and thus didn't have time to be taking sips of coffee. Thank you again for saving me tonight, you started the conversation, giving him the opening to reply and continue it how he wished. There's no need for thanks. I did what I needed to do to be assured of your comfort, he stated. His dull gaze firmly fixed on you. Okay, you whispered, taking a sip of coffee to clear the awkwardness from your end. The room fell silent and you looked away and then looked back at him, waiting for him to say something else, but he just sat there watching you. Uh, so, um, about us? You asked hesitantly, before changing subjects and motioning to the coffee mug. This is good coffee. Thank you, he said shifting in his seat and gripping his hands together, replying to your coffee comment before continuing on. I feel like I need to tell you about my friend from high school. I know the basics, but please go on, you thought, staying quiet to let him continue. I've always been the quiet one of the group, he stated, as Ashi and Oboro were the loud ones. I'm assuming this story is about Oboro, you asked gently, seeing as I know Hazashi. He nodded and looked down at his hands. He and Hazashi were on the same level personality-wise, although Hazashi had a little bit more loud excitement than Oboro. But the one thing that stood out with this guy was his ability to see nothing else but those who needed help, and that's exactly what happened when he lost his life. A pain shot through your chest when you saw Aizawa's face contort slightly. He wasn't one to show his emotions often, so seeing him trying to hold back the pain like that was making you hurt immensely. You waited for him to continue, holding your mug close to you as you sat half-twisted on the couch facing him. I was there when it happened, Aizawa said in a strained voice. To be honest, I didn't think it was real. I heard him encouraging me while I was fighting. His voice cracked a little, and he cleared it immediately, looking away so you wouldn't see the tears in his eyes. You bit down on the inside of your cheek to stop the sympathetic tears from forming in the corners of your own eyes. All of this still felt really raw for him, despite it being when he was in high school. I was waiting for him. He couldn't die that easily. But then I saw the blood, and... You reached out a hand and placed it on his thigh, putting your coffee mug down on the table so that you could shift closer to him. He kept his face turned away from you so that you, he could compose himself before continuing, and you patiently waited. I saw the doctors take him away. Then later I found out that his body had been stolen. His voice sounded stronger, and he looked back towards you. I met him again, as a villain. The hair on the back of your neck stood on end, and you moved in even closer to him and wrapped your arms around him. He was still there, inside the villain. I managed to communicate with him, but it still haunts me that he's stuck as a Nomu, and there's nothing I can do about it. I understand now, you whispered, lifting your legs over his thigh as he unclasped his hands and wrapped one around your back to pull you in closer. I may not look it, but I do care deeply for those who I'm close to. I don't want to go through that again. He mumbled into your neck as he rested the side of his head on your shoulder. Understandable, you whispered, snuggling him in against you. You tilted your head down a little and pressed your lips to his shoulder and exposed neck, just something small to let him know that you were there and that you still loved him. He hugged you closer and reciprocated the kiss, planting his lips on your neck as well, and your eyes rolled with delight. Ah, I'm in his arms, and just being here and having a gentle kiss on the neck is amazing, he wailed happily. You remained like that for who knows how long, 
and then pulled back a little to talk more. I understand that you've lost someone close to you, but I can assure you that the only danger I get into is walking from the classroom to the staff toilets and back without Mineta or Kaminari trying to have a friendly conversation in the hallway. Aizawa let out a small huff of amusement and placed his hand on your thigh. I'll suspend them both, he commented, rubbing your thigh gently. You smirked and hesitated a look into his eyes. He held a strong eye contact with you, then slowly leaned in to kiss you, that soft stubble on his upper lip brushing across your soft skin before your mouths touched and tongues ventured and roamed. Aizawa, he said, pulling back to ask your question before things got too heated. Are we going to make a go of this as a proper relationship? Because I've already told you that I don't like feeling used. Let's try, he stated. I'd like to keep our relationship a secret for now though, at least until we're properly established, then we can announce it. Okay, fair enough. I'm not going to ask for public displays of affection at school anyway. We need to keep it professional there, but I just want us to feel like a couple whenever we're alone. He nodded. It has been a long time since I've opened myself to letting someone in, so forgive me in advance if I'm a little under par. That's fine, you said, laying your head against his chest. Thank you for opening up to me. It makes me feel special. Not not like special special, but just that, well, if you didn't care about me that much, you wouldn't have opened up such a heart-wrenching story to let me know where you were coming from. He nodded and bent his head to kiss the top of yours. I've already told you how I feel about you. His sincerity infected you, and your heart nearly exploded with love for him, and before you knew it, you were madly kissing again. You had sat up a little and manoeuvred yourself so that you were sitting in his lap facing him, and he had his hands on your hips, kissing you back just as fervently as you were kissing him. Why do we always end up like this? You asked playfully between kisses. Because whenever I'm around you, I can no longer think straight. My body takes over, he replied holding your body against his as he bent forward and stood up, holding under your ass as he walked off towards the bedroom. As I mentioned at the end of the previous chapter, we will skip the adult scene in bed and we pick up with them finishing up and snuggling. You've slept in my clothes before. Help yourself to anything in the drawers. He gestured towards the wardrobe and you looked in its direction. The drawers are in the wardrobe, he added, just to clarify why he had pointed you towards the wardrobe. Gingerly, you got up from the bed and wobbled towards the dressing doors, leaning far too much of your weight onto it as you pulled the doors open and looked inside for the clothes. What on earth is this? You reached out and felt the fabric of some item that was hung next to the drawer set. It feels like sleeping bag material. Suddenly, the bedroom lights were flicked on from behind you and you got a good look at the hung item. You were right. Sleeping bags. All hung up like they were a suit or a shirt. Sleeping bags? You said with surprise. Not meaning for it to sound so surprised, but it did. Yes. Azara walked over behind you and reached into the drawers to pull them open so you could see in and pull out a t-shirt of his to wear. Why do you have your sleeping bags hanging up like their clothes? You asked in an amused tone. Because they are. He replied nonchalantly, grabbing himself out a t-shirt and track pants and turning around to walk back to the bed. You thought about it for a second and then shrugged and reached into the drawer to get a shirt of your own out. I guess you're right. I've only ever seen you in a sleeping bag in a random place where you wouldn't be expecting for someone to be. You had pulled his t-shirt on and turned around to keep talking, but the way he was looking at you with his half-lidded eyes propped up on one elbow in bed made your heart jump into your throat and block your words. Come to bed, Yin. His deep voice drew you over, and before you knew it, you were snuggled into his side. Lights off, he called, and the room went dark again. That's handy, he said, closing your eyes and snuggling into him as you inhaled his scent. Once I'm in bed, I don't want to get out again, he replied, resting his head on the pillow and tucking his chin over the top of your head, making you feel very small. You smiled in the darkness and slowly drifted off to sleep. Thankfully, the next day was Sunday and you woke to the sun streaming through the blinds. Ozawa was still fast asleep beside you, so you softly slipped out of bed and pattered off to the bathroom then headed off down the hall to the kitchen to make a coffee for him and you, hoping he would wake when he smelled the coffee brewing. You found your phone in your bag that was still in the lounge room and checked the time, 12.30pm. Tucking the phone back in your bag, you walked back to the kitchen 
and started digging around in the cupboards and drawers to find what you needed for a coffee wake up. You had almost finished making the heavenly liquid when a pair of masculine arms engulfed you from behind and a messy shaggy head plopped down on your shoulder. Not surprisingly, you squealed with surprise, your quirk activating a little as you prepared to slap whatever it was that had grabbed you, but you quickly settled when you realised it was Aizawa. Apologies, he said in a raspy voice. I didn't mean to scare you. He let go of you and walked to the sink, grabbing himself a glass from the rack there and having a drink of water. I it's okay. Sorry I jumped. I, I was enjoying that hug, I promise. It just gave me a surprise, you replied realising that you had cut short a rarity, a hug from behind from Aizawa. Coffee, he said once he had swallowed the last of the water and put the glass on the sink. Oh, yep, here. Hope it's okay. You handed the mug to him and picked up your own, taking a sip at the same time that he did. Good, he said with a nod, walking past you to go to the lounge and you followed him as well. I don't like to talk work if I don't need to, he started putting his mug down on the coffee table and sitting down on the sofa and running his fingers through his shaggy hair. But since I have you here... Yeah, that's fine, he said, happily sitting down beside him and placing your mug down too, so that you two could have a chat. After the mid-year festival, we usually do a patrol day where we take the students out in their hero uniforms and they have a section of the city that they have to watch. It gives them an opportunity to interact with the public and get their good names out there. I like that. He replied, as Ashi will take a group, I will take a group, as well as ectoplasm and Ishiyama. I was hoping that you would be comfortable taking a group as well, in place of All Might. Yes, of course. Why wouldn't I feel comfortable? You asked. The practice patrols are usually overseen by pro heroes, just in case villains appear during that time. Oh, I see. Well, I'm not a qualified hero, but I could use my quirk well enough to hold them off until you or one of the other hero teachers came to the rescue, he replied. It would be me, Aizawa stated protectively. I'll give you an adjacent route to mine, so that if anything goes wrong I can be there quickly. You did your best to suppress your smile, but he saw and reached his hand out to cup your cheek and chin in his hand. I couldn't forgive myself if, if anything were to happen to you, Yin. You positively melted at his touch and nodded gently. May I request students that could get a message to you quickly should a villain arrive on scene? You asked, scooting closer when Aizawa let go of your cheek and placed his hand on your shoulder and pulled you towards him. Yes, of course, he said, snuggling your form into his body and resting his head heavily on yours. Who would you like to take? If I could have Bakugo, Shoji, Koda, Jiro and Yayorozu, that would be great. He said with a smile as he tilted your head up and kissed his sparsely stubbled chin. Good choices. If nothing else, I'll hear Bakugo when he takes the villain on by himself. Good point, you chuckled. I guess all I really need is Bakugo. In any case, the minute I hear an explosion from him, I'll be right over, he said. Most of the time we have walkie-talkies, so do not hesitate to call for me should the need arise. Do villains usually pop up when you're out patrolling with students? I thought the fact that a larger number of heroes out and about would deter them. No, unfortunately. Some villains like for more heroes and more hero students to be around so they can make a bigger scene and get more publicity. Mm, how annoying, you scowled, noticing Aizawa's hand had turned and was twisting up under the shirt that you were in. Mm. He hummed in agreement, his mind going elsewhere as his fingertips hit your soft side. I really enjoyed last night, you whispered gently changing the subject and allowing him to touch you more. As did I, he replied, turning his head to yours as you looked up at him and pressed your lips to his. The rest of the morning was spent in each other's arms, kissing and caressing, but not letting anything go too far. Much to your surprise, it was nice to just make out on the lounge and do a little light petting without going the whole way. And that night, you fell asleep with a soft smile on your face, replaying everything that had happened over the weekend. Well... That all went much better than expected. He actually opened up to me. I'm really glad we got to spend that time together, he thought as he drifted off to dreamland that night. You were up early the next morning, eager to see your secret boyfriend, and paid extra attention to how you looked so that you could be on point for him. Not that he cared much, he had seen you in far less and with less makeup on and hadn't said a thing. Good morning, Hazashi, you greeted your co-worker happily, walking into the staff room. Good morning! 
he greeted back loudly. The ray of sunshine has entered the building. Stop it. I'm more like a moldy ball of cheese with a torch behind it, but okay, he said with a chuckle. Well, he said in a gossipy voice as he slid up beside you and wiggled his eyebrows. I know, someone who has a thing for moldy cheese with a torch behind it. I'm not even going to ask because this is a trap and you just want to try and get something out of me, he replied smartly. Is there something to get out of you? He asked with a question, eyebrows wiggling their way up into his hairline. Nope, he replied confidently before walking to your desk and gathering a few items while packing others away. Oh, come now, you can tell Uncle Hizashi, the loud co-worker cajoled as he slid over to your desk and leaned suggestively down on it. Why do I have to constantly save you from creeps? Aizawa asked you in a dull tone as he entered the staff room and stared his friend down. I'm not creepy. Am I in? Well, you hummed indecisively. That's not very plus ultra. I'm here to make everyone feel welcome, he replied, straightening up and throwing his arms out wide. Then greet me in the same manner, Aizawa challenged in a dead voice. Hey, cutie! Hazashi said quickly, sidling over to Aizawa's side and throwing at him the double finger guns before slinging an arm around his shoulders. Come here often? I rest my case, Aizawa commented bluntly, remaining unenthused by his friend's very flirtatious greeting. You quickly covered your mouth to stop the giggle, but you made a small noise and Hazashi looked back at you. Oh, come on, such a harsh crowd this morning. Just then midnight entered and Hazashi grinned brightly at her. Good morning, hot stuff. Hi, Mike, how are you? She asked nonchalantly, swinging her hips hypnotically as she entered the room. See? He exclaimed, gesturing to her dramatically. She responds to my greeting just fine. Nimiri, am I creepy? Oh, 100%, honey. But if you get too much, then I can just rip my clothes off and it's all over for you. That reply curbed his enthusiasm and you again had to stifle a chuckle as his face fell. Okay, uh, I'll be going now, you said, still trying to suppress your laugh as you walked to the staff room door with Aizawa following behind. Marie, Aizawa called to her before he left the room. I give you full permission to knock him out when you quirk. Done, she leered with a smirk. Hey now, come on, we're all friends here, this is live, don't gang up on me like this, Hazashi called. Listen, Mike, if you're going to flirt with people, don't flirt with those who already have vested interests. Midnight chided, her words floating out the hall to your ears and you quickly glanced at Aizawa to see if he had heard as well. They don't know, it's speculation, he commented, looking straight ahead as you headed to the classroom. The day went well and you were happy and content with where you and Aizawa were at. A few times he caught you looking at him during class and returned your longing gaze with a small smirk and wink before looking back to whichever student was presenting at the front of the classroom. None of the girls saw the exchanges between you two. They were all still a little sad that you and he hadn't stayed longer at Yagyarozu's house on the weekend so that they could implement some romantic time alone for you two. Lunchtime came and you were again cordially invited to join them, which you agreed to. I am sorry that I didn't get to spend more time with you at the gathering on the weekend, Yagyarozu lamented to you as you sat side by side at the table. It's fine, you replied. You were the host, so you needed to be present for the rest of the students that were there. I know, but even Mr. Aizawa didn't stay long, she said. Yeah, Mina piped up. Jiro and I saw you two when he saw you off at the gates. Oh, yeah, he said sheepishly. I kind of needed an escort. Escort? Why? Mina asked with confusion. Uh, I was having a little trouble, you said diplomatically. How so? Yayorozu asked with concern. Um, I don't want to say anything that would get anybody in trouble, but I was um, pestered for a date by someone in particular, and although I had declined, they kept asking, to the point where Aizawa had to step in and protect me from them, you stated. Yayorozu gasped with horror and covered her lips delicately. One of my staff? She asked with mortification enveloping her entire being. Unfortunately, yes, but it's okay. There was no harm done. Ugh, looks like we got it wrong, Mina whispered to Jiro. He was just protecting her, Jiro replied softly. What if they still went on a date after? Mina asked, 
Her little conversation to Jiro going unnoticed in the background as Yayorozu apologised profusely to you. Miss Lin, I very humbly apologise for the actions of my staff member, whoever it may be. Please tell me who it was and I will see to it that they are very heavily reprimanded for their actions. No, please, it's fine, you said, holding your hands up to placate her. There's no need for any actions to take place, but if possible, I would like to avoid the person at all costs. Oh, that's completely understandable, Yagirozu said, still looking quite stricken that someone should have annoyed you this much with their personal desires. Did you go straight home after leaving? Mina suddenly cut in. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, of, of course I did, you stammered. Yes, I, I, I went home. The urgent matter you spoke of, was that to get away from my staff member? Yagirozu suddenly gasped. Oh, Miss Lin, I didn't even think that you were being made uncomfortable by someone. I am so sorry. Yagirozu, it's fine. Please calm down, you said with a sweat-dropped look on your face. She was making such a scene. Mina and Jiro both looked at each other with a knowing look. The way you had gotten a little flustered when Mina asked if you had gone straight home was enough to tell them that you weren't telling the truth. But they let it slide for now since Yagirozu was having conniptions over the fact that someone had wronged you. At the end of the week, Aizawa allowed a class for the students to continue with festival plans and you and he were pulled aside to try on different outfits. The girls and I, Yagirozu stated proudly, have been thinking about different styles to showcase for the fashion show and we thought of doing a hero fashion of the ages style show. Oh, that sounds interesting, you said encouragingly. What eras were you thinking? Hero costumes from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 10s and now, she said, showing the female costume progression and the male costume progression. Well, I think that would be good, you said again, looking at Aizawa who just nodded with his face half buried in his scarf, only his eyes showing from under his heavy messy fringe. So if I could show you some of the designs, Yayorosu asked you. Oh, and each costume will be revealed from underneath a different garment on top that will be pulled off, just for added dramatics. Okay, he said with a chuckle. I do like these ideas, they're quite innovative. Oh, why thank you, Miss Lin, Yagirozu replied with a giant grin on her face and a proud blush across her cheeks. Aizawa just stood silently and nodded again. Yagirozu took over and showed you the sketches of a few of the outfits that she and the girls had come up with, and you nodded your approval for each of them. It was clear that she had put a lot of time and effort into each of them, and you were starting to get excited about showing them off. Now for Mr. Aizawa. She reached back to her pile of sketches and grabbed out a male costume one, holding out the first one for Aizawa to see. Her first picture looked like a mix between Captain Levi Ackerman and Robin Hood, and your nose almost bled at the mere thought of him in such an outfit. This is the 60s look, she said proudly. Dashing, relatively tight wear, but with a strongly masculine look to it. Mm, you're damn right about that, Yagirozu. Can I see him in that outfit already? You thirsted internally. Will the other students be in similar wear? You asked, hoping that it wasn't just going to be you and Aizawa doing the fashion show solo. Oh yes, Yagirozu replied. Most of the students have exterior roles, but you and Mr. Aizawa won't be the only ones on stage. Okay, just checking, you chuckled. Another few weeks passed, and you and Aizawa seemed to be going well. You would talk on the phone after school some nights, the nights when he didn't have hero work, and would sometimes steal sneaky kisses at school. And although he acted aloof most of the time, he had a warm side that would occasionally come out, but it still felt a little cold at times. Aizawa was enjoying being close with you. He didn't want to admit it, but he was infatuated with you. It was hard for him to not constantly look at you in class, so he chose for you to do a lot of the teaching over the next few weeks so he could stare at you during your lectures and not be called out for watching you. There was, however, a war going on inside him. Truth be told, he was a little afraid of how much he was in love with you. You were on his mind constantly and he worried that something was going to happen to you, so at times he would unintentionally distance himself as a protective mechanism so that he could try and regain his mind again. But it was hard not to be around you, nor to be able to touch you or hold you. So no sooner had he pulled away, he was right back again, telling you he needed to speak with you in the staff room, then locking the door on the two of you so he could have a makeout session without being caught. So far, no one had suspected anything more than an unspoken about crush between you both. You and Aizawa had been very careful 
not to get caught doing anything and had settled into a good routine now. Weekends were spent in either his apartment or yours, between the sheets or on the lounge, whichever was the closest when passion took over, and weekdays were for chatting or meeting late for dinners together. The weeks rolled by and the fashion show drew closer. So far, you and Aizawa hadn't tried any of the outfits on, but Yaya Rozu had been doing a lot of measuring and the other students had been getting materials together for the big day. It was now the week before the festival and all normal classes had been suspended for the time being so that all the focus could be placed on preparing for the big day. Miss Lin, Yaya Rozu called out to you, her chest rising and falling as she walked over to you, looking a little sweaty and pale. Yaya Rozu, you said worriedly, grabbing her shoulders and holding her steady as you looked into her face. Are you okay? You don't look well. I have completed all the outfits for the fashion show, she puffed. Oh my goodness, all in one go? Please, sit down, you gasped. Krishma, please bring me a chair. No, she panted. I'm okay. Please, would you try one on? Only if you sit down, you reprimanded gently, waving Krishma over. Here's the chair, Miss Lynn, he said brightly, putting it down beside Yagyarozu. Thank you, he said gratefully to him, then sat Yagyarozu down in it. Where are the clothes? you asked her. Out the bag. She pointed out to the door, and you nodded. Stay here, I'll be back. Out you went to get into one of the outfits, and you found them all lined up on the hangers with 60s Miss Lynn written on the divider between the first one and the next one. Oh, she has it all organised already, you thought, taking the outfit off the hook and walking into the change room nearby to try it on. The 60s hero costume was very typical for the era, with bright colours that stood out, and you pulled the bright purple pants on and then the bright turquoise leotard that finished with golden sparkly gloves that pulled up to the elbows. Oh my god, well, this is very striking. I'll give her that, you mused, checking yourself out in the mirror. As you turned, you activated your quirk and pushed your ass out a little, filling the leotard a bit more, then pumping your breasts up as well. Mm, can't hurt to use my quirk a little during the fashion show, just to help Yagyarozu's work stand out. You stepped out of the change room and walked out to where Yagyarozu was waiting for you, and the whole room stopped almost instantly the second you appeared. Um, it's very bright, he said to Yagyarozu, glancing around at everyone who was staring at you. You look amazing, Yayurozu gushed, standing up to walk around you and check the measurements of things. This looks fantastic, Yurarika squealed as she bounced over to see you up close. Where's Aizawa? Hagakure asked as she bounced over as well. Shh, you hushed her. Please, I don't want him to see me like this. Just then Aizawa entered and his bloodshot eyes fell on you. What do you think, Aizawa? Mina called to him. He nodded. The girls taking his silence as his, him being unenthused when in actual fact he didn't know what to say. I might bend her over in that, he thought as he looked away to control his thoughts. Thank you so much for trying it on, Yagyarozu said happily, bouncing on her toes with bright starry eyes. I would so love for Mr. Aizawa to try on the costume for the heroes in the 60s as well, just to make sure everything is fitting well. Mr. Aizawa, you called in a professional voice. Your presence has been requested. He turned and walked over to you and Yagyarozu. Yes. Would you kindly try on your outfit for Yagyarozu? She wishes to make sure that everything fits well, you said politely, batting your eyelashes at him. Now. Yes, please, Yagyarozu said excitedly. I'll show you where it is, you said, turning away and leading him to the room out the back where the clothes were all lined up and ready. No sooner were you in there alone, his scarf had you bound with your hands behind your back and you were pushed face first up against the nearest wall. Mm, Mr. Aizawa, you cooed playfully, having known that he was going to detain you. You had felt the sexual tension radiating off him ever since he had walked over to you and Yagyarozu. Not in front of the students. His hand came down heavily on your ass and it jiggled in the turquoise leotard. It's a crime for you to be out in public in this, he said in a low voice. How am I supposed to keep my cool when you're walking around in this? He slipped his hand between your thighs and pressed his fingers against you, swiping back and forth a few times before removing his hand to smack your ass again, then removed his binds from your wrists so you could move freely. You can't start something like that and then just stop, 
you pouted, turning around to face him. Go and change. He jerked his head to the change room before I take you right here and now. Yes, Aizawa, you sung suggestively, striding past him, but not without dragging one golden gloved finger up his arm to his shoulder as you walked past him. His forced nasal exhale went unnoticed by you, too triumphant in your own mind to have heard any noise from him. You changed clothes quickly and stepped out of the change room, ready to tell Aizawa that it was his turn to change, not realising that he had already put his outfit on behind a screen in the room. His back was towards you as you walked out of the stall, and all you saw was his muscular back, as the thin, tight fabric of the shirt left nothing to the imagination. Oh, whoa, thank you, Yaoyurazu, for making such a tight outfit, you thought. At hearing a sound behind him, Aizawa turned, the green open front shirt allowing you to see the middle part and centre of his pec muscles and you sucked your bottom lip in between your teeth and gave him a heavy lidded look. I can't wear this, he said, looking down his front. Your eyes travelled down his front as well and stopped on his very pronounced dick print as his semi-hard member showed clearly down and into one of his pant legs. Oh, you gasped, covering your mouth with one hand. Yeah, that might be an issue. Using your quirk, you extended one hand and palmed him through his tight white pants and he jumped back and swiped your hand away. We need to stop that. Oh, you giggled cheekily. But you got to touch me. Yes, but you didn't have a part of your anatomy growing. He smacked your hand away again and you chuckled. In, he said in warning, fighting to stop you from exciting him anymore. Mr. Aizawa? Yeah, your Ozu's voice called out, halting you both in your tracks. Oh, she's coming, you hissed, quickly grabbing a garment from the rack and tying it around his hips. How is everything going in? Oh, Yayorozu asked, stopping when she saw Aizawa in the elegant white tutu. We made some last minute changes to my outfit, he stated. I, sorry, Yayorozu, he said to her, seeing her confusion. May I have a word with you? She nodded and looked at Aizawa again before allowing you to walk her out of the room so that he could change. The outfit looks wonderful, you said to her. There was just a small wardrobe malfunction that may not <clears throat> uh, present well on the day. She tilted her head at you, still not understanding. Please, please, please understand. Bless your innocent mind, but please get where I'm going with this. I don't want to have to spell it out for you, you wailed internally. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Was there a split in the seams? I can very easily fix that, she replied with a smile. Oh, n no, the, the seams were fine. The pants were just a little tight. I can have them loosened if they were uncomfortable for him. Yeah, Yorozu continued. N no, um, oh, how do I say this without scaring her? You screeched internally. It was a little revealing, but not skin revealing, more like outline revealing? Yao Yorozu blinked a few times, desperately trying to understand what you were talking about, but thankfully Mina had overheard the conversation and bounced over to lend a hand. Momo, she said, cupping her hands to Yao Yorozu's ear and whispering into the beautifully innocent classmate's ear. As Mina quietly explained the situation, Yao Yorozu's eyes increased in size until they were almost falling out of her head, and her face went from pink to dark red in a matter of seconds. Get it? Mina asked on the end as she stepped back. I, I am so sorry, Miss Lin. Yeah, Yorozu stammered with embarrassment. I, uh, I will make changes immediately. As she finished her sentence, Aizawa appeared in his usual black outfit, and Yao Yorozu hid her face from him as she ran to the room to change the outfit. That was an experience, Aizawa commented to you. I've never felt so exposed yet decently covered in all my life. You chuckled and looked away. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it, you mumbled in a quiet voice. I'm not finished with you yet, he said in his erotically deep voice. We have some business to attend to this evening. Oh, he leered, trying not to look too excited and unintentionally grabbing the attention of the busily bustling students around you. I look forward to it. The day of the festival arrived and the school grounds were a hive of activity. Yaoyorozu was buzzing around, happily directing students and making last minute adjustments to the outfits. The runway was set up and Midoriya was preparing to hoist Ayama up as a disco ball while the side dancers practiced their moves. Hagakure and Yuraraka were the other two female models, aside from yourself, 
and Kaminari and Todoroki were the male models alongside Aizawa. Is everyone ready? Yayorozu called out. We have five minutes till opening time. We're all set, Mina called back. Ready to go. From out the back of the stage, you could hear everyone getting into position and you checked your first outfit again. Okay, just got to walk out, take the black cape off, spin, then head back out here. Models ready? Yayorozu called through the curtains. Ready, he called back, glancing back to the others who were getting their outfits sorted. You were the show opener, so you were ready and waiting, holding steady until you heard the opening theme music. On top of all the chatter, you could hear someone counting down, and as soon as they got to one, the lights flicked off and Ayama, as the disco ball, lit up. There was a fleeting moment of gasps of delight from the audience before someone screamed, Die! What a is too good for you losers! And then two very loud explosions erupted at the end of the runway. Okay, that was Bakugo, you thought with a chuckle. The music started and you stepped forward, pushing the curtains open and strutting out onto the runway with a big smile on your face as a brilliant white spotlight focused on you and blinded you to everything else. You could hear clapping and cheering as you walked the catwalk, then as you got to the end, you pulled the black cape from your shoulders and threw it off, revealing the 60s hero costume underneath. There was a surge of excited calls from the onlookers, and you turned and walked back to the curtain, then disappeared, and Yurarika emerged, doing her walk before coming back and handing over to Hagakure. The girls did their walks, then Aizawa entered in his adjusted 60s costume, and the crowd went wild. He had kept the white tutu strapped around his waist as an accessory to the outfit, and he walked out like he owned the stage. Walking purposefully to the end of the runway, he stopped, did a curtsy, then turned and walked sullenly away, but the crowd loved it, screaming and laughing with delight. Todoroki was the next to do his walk, followed by Kaminari, and once the first round had been completed, Yayorozu took to the stage and addressed the crowd. Good afternoon and welcome to the 1A Fashion Show. Thank you for choosing to join us. The audience cheered in response, so she continued her talk. We are going to showcase to you the different designs of hero costumes from the 60s right through to the present and we ask kindly that you would vote for your favourite era and vote for your favourite model. She then did a grand sweeping gesture to indicate for you all to parade back out again so she could introduce you to the audience, and another round of heavy giggles and wolf whistles accompanied Aizawa as he strut out in his white tutu again. Yao Yorozu held the mic to your mouth for you to introduce yourself, and you smiled before giving your name. My name is Yin Lin, assistant teacher to Hero Course 1A. Everyone clapped politely and there were a few whistles mixed in. Your students introduced themselves and then it moved to Aizawa. I am Shotoa Aizawa, homeroom teacher of 1A, wearer of Tutu, he added, his matter-of-fact bored tone adding to the hilarity of it. The screaming and hollering from the sudden fans in the crowd was insane and you nearly had to block your ears because of it. Well, he's very popular, he thought with a smile, trying not to check him out too much. After Yayorozu had explained the voting system and a little about the theme for the fashion show, you were all ushered backstage to change for the 70s hero gear and do the walk all over again. It appeared that Yayorozu had paid particular attention to what Aizawa would look good in, either that or he looked good in any damn thing and you found yourself stealing glances at him as he changed into different outfits. It was hard to look at him without him catching you because it appeared that he was just as interested in what you were wearing as you were of him. You were now up to the 2000s gear and it was starting to look a little more like what you were used to seeing him in, except Yayorozu had him in a semi-baggy black pants with gun holster that doubled as suspenders as well. He looked more like a policeman in that uniform, but who doesn't love a man in uniform? You watched him walk out onto the runway and the crowd again went wild. He's going to win every category of this fashion show, hands down, you thought with a grin as he walked back out and down the steps lifting one arm up to run his hand through his messy fringe and ruffling it a bit to shift it out of his face. You groaned internally and looked away, chewing on your bottom lip as your brain tried to barricade the doors of the dirty thoughts that were screaming and hollering to enter the front of your mind. By now, Aizawa was getting really good at reading your body language and he smirked to himself. She must like what I'm in. Not that it looks any good. He looked down at the outfit as he dropped his hand back to his side. It's well made, as expected, but... I don't see the attraction. He lifted the material in his fingers and checked it over a little, unintentionally showing you his lower abdominal muscles and V-line. The minute you saw his body underneath, you had to walk away. It was too much. 
I am about to jam my head through this wall here. He can't just be standing there doing these things. This is illegal, just rude, downright disrespectful. Sir, you need to calm down. No, wait, I need to calm down. Miss Lin? Yagirazu asked as you scowled at the wall. Hmm? You spun quickly to face her. Is everything okay? Oh, yes, sorry, I just thought I may have left my iron on, you lied, but I'm pretty sure I turned it off. She nodded and was about to reply when a fellow classmate ran up and asked her a question, which distracted her. I'm pretty sure you are the one turned on. Aizawa uttered lowly as he passed you. Not the iron. You extended your hand out with your quirk and punched him in the side without anyone else seeing you. Shut up! You hissed with a playful smirk. That's enough out of you, or I'll give you a detention. His half-littered gaze and that low-key sneer almost drenched your panties, and he held your gaze for a second longer, then turned and walked away to change. Almost done, everyone! Yayirozu called out. You're all doing so well. Keep up the good work! You refocused on the task at hand and got ready for the next round, reaching for the dress that you had worn at Yayirozu's place that weekend when her chef tried to ask you out. The fashion show finished, and everyone was on a high, yet completely exhausted from the pure adrenaline that they were living off while the show was in progress. Now to wait till the end of the day and tally the votes, Yayi Rosie said with a smile as you all stood in a semicircle out the back. You have done a wonderful job orchestrating this program, you praised Yayi Rosie. I look forward to seeing the results of the show. We all know Mr. Aizawa stole the show. Yurarika chuckled, looking over at his oh-so-familiar dead expression. I'm surprised that no matter how little effort he put into his walk, everyone loved it, Kaminari said honestly, a little bit put out by the fact that even though he had tried to walk his best, Aizawa always had the crowd screaming louder. You looked away to hide your smirk. I mean, Kaminari was right, but did he have to be so blunt about it? Until I have taken out the winning places in all categories, you're free to go and look around the festival. Aizawa said with a straight face. They all beamed at him, missing his hidden joke, and turned and took off to go and enjoy the afternoon, leaving you two alone. He turned his head ever so slightly and looked at you from the corner of his eye, just that look alone telling you everything you needed to know, and you stepped away quickly. Now, now listen, we need to behave, the students are still around here so we can't be caught doing... His bind very quickly wrapped itself around your body and mouth, working like duct tape to seal your lips, before you were yanked into him and his lips pressed to the other side of the cloth. As quickly as it had happened, he pulled his binds off you and stepped back, shoving his hands into his pockets and turning to the door. Come and look around the festival with me, he said lowly. You grinned and stepped up beside him, the two of you heading out to the main stretch to see what the other classes had decided to do on the day. As you walked down to the other school hall, present Mike was on stage in the middle of a singing competition and you grinned. He looks like he's in his element, he said to Aizawa, who nodded and kept a half gaze on you. You looked so happy, walking around, seeing the sights, and he smiled softly to himself. She really is so beautiful, he thought, as he greeted a bunch of students walking past. As the afternoon passed, you headed back to the main arena with Aizawa to listen to the results of the fashion show. Welcome back, everyone, Yayorozu called happily into the microphone once the crowd had gathered back in the room. Thank you for supporting our class. I will now announce the winners of each category and present them with their awards, she added. A whisper of excitement went through the onlookers and she looked down at her piece of paper, then up at the audience again. First we have the winner of the fashion show. This person has wowed the crowd with their energy and presence. That description threw you and you thought that maybe it might be someone other than Aizawa who had won that title. He certainly got everyone's attention, but I don't know if he wowed the crowd with his presence. And the winner is Aizawa Shotoa, teacher of class 1A, Yayirozu announced. The roar of delight from the crowd was deafening, and you grinned as Aizawa walked out onto the stage, showing zero emotion as always. He took the ribbon from Yayirozu and bowed, then walked back out the back. You grinned as he approached. Well done, you chuckled. I didn't do anything to deserve this, he replied dryly and resumed his position beside you. Now, Yayirozu called to get the attention back to herself. The winner of the female category for the 60s hero costume, Miss Yin Lin. Oh, 
you exclaimed with surprise as you were called forward, your wind being noisily supported by everyone around you, as well as the crowd out the front. You got up onto the stage and walked towards Yaya Rosie with a big smile. She was only too happy to present you with the award, and you took it and then bowed to the crowd in front of you. That was definitely deserved. Ozawa said lowly to you when you returned to his side out the back. Thanks, he replied bashfully. The rest of the evening continued, and Aizawa took out the win for most of the year's categories, and you managed to snag a few for yourself, but it seemed that overall he was the popular guy for the day. It's nice that he came in first for a number of things today, you thought as you and the other models walked back out onto the stage and bowed for everyone. I feel like he deserved to get all the attention today. Later you helped pack up with the other students, and had almost finished when you heard the music start outside for the end of festival dance. The students around you looked up when they heard the music begin, and then the whole mood shifted. It was like the rain had just started and the ants were outside and unprepared. People started running in all directions with various props, trying desperately to finish up quickly so they could go and join in the fun, and you smiled to yourself, then had an idea. Class, you called to everyone, commanding their attention to yourself. Everybody stopped and looked at you. You're all dismissed, you called. Go and enjoy the dance. I'll finish up everything. No, Miss Lynn, we can help, Yayorozzi said emphatically. Please, you said with a soft smile. Go and enjoy, I'll be fine. If there's anything left to do after the dance, then I'll call you back. She wavered, the sound of the music outside heavily swaying her decision from staying to help. Go, you said again with a smile, seeing her indecisiveness. She smiled sympathetically and put the box down that she was carrying. I'll come back and help once I've had one dance. You grinned and nodded at her to go. The other students followed her lead and ran from the building, keen to go and enjoy the frivolities of youth. As everyone left, you grinned and continued to tidy up, lifting boxes and carrying them to the storeroom. You had just put one box down inside the storage room when a voice behind you stopped you. You should have made them finish up cleaning, the unmistakable voice of Aizawa said sternly. Let them have one night off, you said gently when you turned to face him. It's fine, I'm happy to carry the load just this once. He softened internally, but didn't show you outwardly just how much you had melted him with one sentence. Still with an emotionless look on his face, he stepped into the storage room and engulfed you in a hug. It was so sudden and gentle that it threw you for a second. It wasn't a needy sexual hug, it was pure and loving, and you returned it and rested your forehead against the crook of his neck, letting your hearts beat together against each other. After a few moments, he pulled back and extended his hand to you. I don't usually do this. Would you dance with me? He asked. The music from the festival outside could be heard, and you nodded with a smile, taking his hand and letting him lead you out into the almost clean room. He pulled your body against his and started to slowly lead you in a dance, which you let him do, looking up into his bloodshot eyes. Unbeknownst to both of you, Yao Yurozu had snuck back to see if you needed any more help and had frozen just outside the doorway when she saw you two dancing together. Her heart swelled with love and she quickly backed away then tiptoed off down the hall to join the rest of the students outside. As you moved around the room you glanced at Aizawa's lips and he saw you and then bent his head to yours and stopped moving so he could kiss you. In the darkened room you made out. Everything in that moment was perfect and you sighed happily as he pulled back after the kiss had naturally drawn to an end. I'll help you finish, he said, packing up a few things himself. Aizawa was smitten. I'll make an announcement next week to let everyone know that Yin and I are dating. I feel like this is going to be something very long term and I'd like for her to feel validated, he thought as he put the last box of items away. Back down at the dance here, Yorozu reappeared with a very happy little secret smile on her face and Mina sidled up to her. Why are you looking so happy? she asked playfully. Oh, no reason, Yorozu replied with another little pleasant smile. Let's just say that I witnessed something very beautiful that I will not tell anyone until the right time, she added, reaching back to stroke and play with her black hair as she sighed with delight. Mina gave her a suspicious look, but didn't ask any more questions. Just heading back over to where Kaminari was trying to chat up some poor girl from another class and dragging him away. Yayorozu looked up at the window of the room that she had just seen you and Aizawa slow dancing in and smiled to herself. I really wish them all the very best, she thought. I hope they make something official very soon. They're well suited. You went home on a high that night and decided to check in with Granny to see how she was doing. 
Hi, Grams. You greeted her brightly when she answered her phone. My beautiful yin, she said lovingly into the receiver. How is work treating you, sweetheart? Work is fantastic, Gran, he replied in a really happy tone. Oh, I'm so happy for you, she warbled. Whatever happened with your boss? Did you tell that man to sit down? Um, you hummed with a little chuckle. We're um, actually dating now, you replied, still chuckling. But let me explain. I am all ears, honey, she replied, curious to hear what you had to say. He acts really hot and cold, but he opened his heart to me just recently and told me about his past. He lost someone very close to him and it scarred him, which is understandable, as he was there when it happened. Mm, Grams hummed, still not quite convinced, but you were on a high. I know what I said before, he continued, but after the chat, he's been a lot better. Don't settle for less, Grams warned. I don't want you to get hurt, sweetheart. I know, Grams, I know, but I promise you he's changed a lot. Well, if you're happy, I'm happy, she said, still not quite convinced. I would like to meet him sometime, she added. Oh, yes, of course. We are, we're just keeping our relationship quiet at the moment, just until the three-month mark. And if everything is going well, then we'll make it public knowledge, he said with a smile. Mm -hmm. Grams hummed again not liking that things were being kept a secret. I'll speak with him, you said to her, still very much loved up. Okay, sweetheart, well, give me a call when you've decided on a date and then let me know. Any day and any time suits me. I'm retired after all, I have nothing to do and all day to do it in, she said. You chuckled. Will do, Grams. How's your day been? You two chatted a little more, then once the conversation ended naturally, you said your goodbyes and hung up. You sat back and smiled happily up at the ceiling, relieved that your life had finally settled down. You had a good job, you had a boyfriend who you felt loved by, and the kids in the class respected you. Everything was wonderful. As you sat there in happy land, your phone dinged. It was Aizawa. I would like to make our dating known publicly, he sent. Your heart jumped and you quickly replied to his message. I'm happy for it to be public as long as you're comfortable with it, he replied. Very much so, he sent. I see this being a very long-term relationship. You squealed and clutched the phone to your chest, then pulled it back to reply. Same, you said, with a heart on the end. He replied with the same heart, and you fell sideways onto the lounge with a big grin. When would you like to announce it? He then tapped out. At the end of this week, he replied, after the patrol week is finished. Oh, that's this week. You suddenly remembered that he had spoken about that before the festival. Okay, sounds good, he sent with a smiley face. On Monday, Aizawa cleared the class into what would be happening that week. The patrols were due to start that Monday afternoon, and the morning was spent debriefing them on what their jobs would be during patrol, which groups they would be in, and the things they could and couldn't do if they ran into a villain, thief, person of misconduct, etc. I will now assign the students to each teacher. Ozawa announced, turning to the board. In Miss Lin's group will be Bakugo Katsuki, Shoji Mezo, Koda Koji, Yayorozu Momo, and Juro Kyoka. Yayorozu's face lit up like a Christmas tree full of lights when she saw that she had been assigned to your team. She was stoked that she had been chosen to be with you and was determined that she was going to do her best to make the day go well. On my patrol team will be Midoriya Izuku, Uraraka Ochako. Mineta Minoru, Hagakure Toru, and Ojiro Mashirao, Aizawa announced, continuing on and grouping the rest of the students into the other teachers' teams as well. After getting everyone together, he then announced that patrols would begin soon and the students were to go and get changed into their hero outfits. Excitedly, they all left the classroom and Aizawa called you over to his desk so that you could point out the patrol routes. This is your section here. He pointed to the map and outlined the area. Mine is here. He pointed to the next street over. There are four connecting alleyways on this road that runs straight through to my main road. Memorize them. Should anything happen, it comes straight. You placed your hand on his arm. Please don't worry. I don't think anyone will be out to cause trouble. It's a Monday. I can never be too careful, he replied sternly. You conceded with a smile of adoration. Okay, I'll commit it to memory, you promised, patting his arm gently before pulling your hand away. 
Hatsume allowed me to use her costume again, so I'll go and pick it up from downstairs, then I'll be back. Aizawa nodded and watched you go, a knot forming in his stomach as his past started to come back to haunt him. In his mind, he could hear Oboro's happy voice excitedly talking about what they were going to do that day that the villain had killed him. He could hear the chatter from the streets that day as they had started out their patrol. He balled his fist on the desk and hung his head, squeezing his eyes closed and trying to drown out the cry from Hazashi. No, wait, that was his voice that he could hear ringing in his memories. He straightened and threw his arm out to the side, slamming his fist sideways into the chalkboard. It's not going to happen. Nothing bad's going to happen. Don't do this to yourself. Moments later, everyone was ready to go. The teachers were jovial, the students were pumped, and Aizawa was on high alert and very unusually quiet as he led his group out of the gates and down the street. You and your small group followed after him, and you could tell he was very on edge about something. But it was such a lovely day out, and the people that you had already come across were smiling and gushing at the new lot of hero students that were out in public. I don't know why Aizawa is so uptight about the patrol. It's almost as if he knows something's going to happen, you thought. As Aizawa and his team turned off down their designated street, he threw you a glance, and you smiled reassuringly at him as you headed off into the next street with your group. The patrol began, and Yagyarozu stopped to help a frail, older woman cross the road, creating a stop sign with her quirk to hold the traffic back a little so that the lady could get to the other side of the street safely. Oh, thank you, dear, the elderly lady said to Yagyarozu with a pat to the young hero's arm. You're most welcome, Yagyarozu replied with a bright smile. Have a wonderful rest of your day, she bowed to the woman. Oh my, the next generation of heroes is so very polite, the lady said with a grin. It's been a pleasure to meet you, miss. Creati, my hero name is Creati, Yayurothi said with another smile and bow. I will be looking forward to when you are a graduated hero, the lady said with a smile. Consider me a fan of yours already. Oh, why thank you, ma'am. Yayurosu said again with a big smile. I'll be going now. She bowed once more and then ran back to you and the group and you smiled. Well done, Yayurosu. You've made her day and you've made a wonderful first impression. Yayurosu was on cloud nine. You led the group on, letting your students help people where they could and answering questions from small children. In the next street over, everyone was relaxed, except for Aizawa, who was still very highly strung and anxious, although he wasn't showing it outwardly. Aizawa sensei? Suddenly the class 1A teacher became aware of Midoriya waving his hand in front of his face and he blinked and looked down at the greenette. Yes, Midoriya, he said gruffly. Sir, are we supposed to be doing something today or are we just patrolling? Because I was thinking we could maybe... His voice continued on as Aizawa zoned out, keeping an eye on his surroundings and trying to listen to any further away noises that might indicate that you could be in trouble. Do you think we could do that? Midoriya's voice finally cut back into Aizawa's thoughts. Not now, Aizawa replied without even thinking. Oh, Midoriya said, shrinking back a little. Okay, we'll just patrol then. As the small group continued on down the street, two figures watched from a shop nearby. Now would be the perfect time, the female of the two said. That is the teacher of the class, she nodded outside the window towards Aizawa. If we mess him up, then we could cause a disruption from inside. The male of the two grinned, swinging his hammer-shaped head a little with anticipation. I can't wait to screw everything up, he said with a sneer. Then go out there and do your thing, and once you've been caught, I'll go and shake Aizawa's hand, the female said with a smirk. Will you come bail me out? The male asked, a sad look overcoming his face. Oh, of course, baby. I always come to your rescue, don't I? Now go and play, and mummy will be out in a second. The male grinned happily and walked around his female partner, then out of the shop while she watched inside from in the window. Aizawa looked up as he saw a hammer-headed male walk out onto the street and slam his head into a parked car, the alarm going off immediately. Let's make some noise! The hammer-headed male called loudly swinging his head from side to side, smashing into yet another parked car on the street. Midoriya, Aizawa called to the greenette. Keep the group back. Yes, sir, Midoriya called, looking around to make sure all the students were still around him, as Aizawa ran forward to take on the villain, who was now destroying as many things as he could find. 
quickly sizing up the mutant type male. Azawa knew his quirk wouldn't work, so he readied his scarf to capture the wayward citizen instead. As he jumped and threw his scarf out, the male swung around and then used his head to swipe at Aizawa, barely missing the teacher. Sir, look out! Midoriya called, jumping in and slamming his feet into the side of the male. Mineta quickly threw some of his sticky balls and the hammer-headed male stepped back, his foot getting stuck on them as he fell over, giving Aizawa the perfect opportunity to catch him. It was all over fairly quickly and the group of onlookers who had stopped to see what was going on chatted amongst themselves and clapped when Aizawa got the guy up on his feet and the students got around him to properly detain him until the police had arrived. Thank you so much, a young lady said in an overly grateful voice as she pushed through the crowd, approaching Aizawa. I was so worried he was going to destroy the whole town. Mm. Aizawa hummed, glancing at her. In any case, I'm glad he is detained, she said, extending her hand to him. He looked at it, then her, then slowly reached out and shook her hand. At that point, Midoriya looked over, and from the angle he was on, he saw her hair grow. Anyway, thank you, hero, she said again to Aizawa before turning and walking away. Aizawa went back to keeping an eye on the detained male, and Midoriya stood there looking at him, then back to the lady as she pushed her way through the crowd and disappeared. Her hair definitely grew, he thought. Did she use her quirk on Aizawa? What is her quirk? Does her hair just naturally grow when she shakes hands with people? He pondered things quietly while the police arrived and took the man away. Then he approached Aizawa. Sir? he asked. Yes, Midoriya. Aizawa replied in his usual apathetic tone. Are you okay? Yes, fine. Aizawa replied. And it was true. He did feel fine. He felt like all the anxiety from before had lifted. He couldn't even remember who it was he'd been feeling anxious about. The rest of the patrol went well, and that afternoon everyone assembled back at the school grounds. You smiled when you saw Aizawa, and he looked at you with his usual deadpan expression, then looked away. A little twinge of hurt shot through you. That wasn't the usual look that he gives me, you thought, watching as he debriefed the students and then told them to get changed and head back to the classroom. Cautiously you approached him once the students had left to get changed. So, how did your patrol go? you asked. Routine. He stated, not looking at you. Came across one disturbance, but it resolved quickly. Oh, you said, still feeling like something was wrong. Are you okay? You reached out and touched his arm gently, and he pulled away and looked at you. Yes, I'm fine, he replied, keeping his distance from you. Shotoa? You asked, feeling even more hurt. It's as if he'd forgotten that you two were dating. Don't call me by my first name, he said sternly. I don't know why you're suddenly feeling the need to touch me and call me by my name when we're colleagues, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't do so. Pain shot through your heart and you just stared at him with a hurt look on your face, then nodded and pulled your hand back to your side and dropped your gaze to the ground. Oh, go and change, you mumbled, quickly walking past him and wiping a tear that escaped your eye. What's happened? Has he forgotten we're together? Or is this his way of breaking it off? Confused and hurt, you went to get changed and have a little cry. You couldn't afford to cry too much, though. You would clearly show on your face afterwards, but you allowed a few tears to escape before collecting yourself and heading to the bathroom to touch up your disturbed makeup. Putting on a brave face, you went back to the classroom and snuck in the back. Aizawa didn't even acknowledge that you had arrived and you sat down to listen to the rest of his lecture. Not once did he look at you, and the less eye contact you made, the more you ached in your heart. From the front of the class, Midoriya was still mulling over the things he had seen with the lady's hair when she had shaken Aizawa's hand. Was she involved somehow? He wondered. He looked up at Aizawa, but nothing seemed amiss with the usual deadpan expression of his teacher. I'll need to look into it, I think. If she did use her quirk on Aizawa, it could be anything. It may even be a latent quirk that acts on him later. After class, you walked to the front of the room and waited until the students had left to talk to Aizawa. Yaoyorozu saw that you were waiting to talk to him and left the room, but hid just outside the door in the hopes of being able to sneak a peek at her now favourite coupled pairing. Aizawa, you addressed him as courteously as you could muster, without any emotion showing in your voice. Would you like me to take the same group of students tomorrow for the patrol? He turned to the board and raised the duster, idly cleaning off the chalk marks. I'd like to rotate the students so that they all get a chance to work with different teachers and in different areas of the city, he stated. 
oh, I see, he said, feeling like he might be okay now, since he had responded normally to your question. Maybe he had felt that students were still around before and didn't want to show that we were in a relationship, he thought. Maybe he does still remember that we're dating. Will we have a chance to talk tonight? You asked softly. Or do you have work? He turned and looked at you with his usual bored expression and your heart twisted in your chest. We have nothing more to discuss, he said bluntly, and you quickly looked down. Okay, he replied, barely above a whisper, walking around him and heading out the door. You were in such a hurry to get away that you didn't see Yagi Rosu quickly hide in the next classroom down and she poked her head out to watch you go, her heart nearly shattering at the things she had heard and seen. Are they not on good terms? Did they ever fight? I don't ever remember seeing anything happen, she thought sadly, desperately wanting to run after you and hug your broken form. You left the school grounds and made your way home as quickly as possible, but unfortunately the tears had already started to fall as you got halfway home and by the time you reached your apartment, your makeup was all smeared across your cheeks and you couldn't see properly because of the tears. That night, you skipped dinner and cried yourself to sleep. What had happened? Why didn't he want anything to do with you anymore? Over at the dorms, Midoriya was lost in thought, his brows scrunched with concentration as he sat in the middle of the busy lounge room area, trying to figure out what he should do next. You look like you got something on your mind, Eurarika commented to him as she walked past. You've been sitting there with that same expression on your face for the past hour? Oh, have I? Midoriya asked with surprise as he looked up at her. I just... something happened today and I can't seem to make sense of it, he admitted, going back to his concentrated look. What happened? she asked, sitting down opposite him. Well, you know the incident with the hammerhead man? he asked. She nodded. Well, afterwards, a lady came up to Aizawa and shook his hand. From where I was standing, it looked like her hair grew. Mm, what does that mean? Eureka asked. I'm not sure, but I think it was a tell of her quirk. I think she may have done something to Aizawa, but he hasn't changed, so I'm not sure. But I feel like it needs to be investigated. Yagirozu just so happened to be walking past when she heard Midoriya mention a quirk and Aizawa, and her ears pricked up. Sorry, Midoriya, would you mind just repeating what you said? She asked politely putting a tub of laundry down and walking over. He explained what had happened that day with the guy who was smashing things during their patrol and Yagirozu listened intently. And this lady came and shook his hand after, she confirmed. Yes, after the male had been captured, she walked through the crowd and thanked Aizawa for capturing him and then shook his hand and left. Did anyone else come and shake his hand and thank him? Yagirozu asked him. Midoriya thought for a moment. No, no one else did. That alone is suspicious, Yagirozu mused out loud, and although Aizawa isn't appearing like he's affected to us, I think he might be affected in a way that we can't see, but others might. What do you mean? Midoriya asked her. She paused, picking her words carefully so as not to give away any secrets. Maybe some of the other teachers have noticed something? She asked. I will ask Miss Lin if she's noticed a change in him. She works with him every day. That's a good idea, Midoriya said with a smile. Do we know which police station the Hammerhead guy was taken to? Eurarika asked. I think it was the local station. Why? Midoriya asked her question with his own question. What if the lady who shook Aizawa's hand and the Hammerhead guy are working together? She queried. Good thinking, Eurarika, Yagirozu said. That's a good thought. Maybe we need to see if he had any visitors or if he has mentioned having an accomplice. Should we go now? Eureka asked. Let's, Yayirozi said emphatically, wanting to get to the bottom of this and finding out what the reason for Aizawa treating you so coldly was. I'll come too, Midoriya said, standing up to join them. The three students walked purposefully out of the dorms and snuck off down the road towards the police station, eager to solve this mystery if they could. You did so well, baby, the long-haired lady cooed to her hammerhead male as they walked free of the police station and off down the road together. Can I have snuggles when we get home then? The hammerhead male asked bashfully from his lofty two metre tall height. Yes, of course, baby. Mummy gives cuddles to good boys who do as she says, the much shorter female said sweetly, looking up at her accomplice and reaching out to hold his hand. He let out a little deep giggle and blushed, grinning to himself as they turned the corner. The league will be very happy with your performance as well, she added, 
it all helps their cause to disrupt the hero society. Good afternoon, officer, Midoriya greeted the policeman on the front desk at the station a few minutes later. Earlier today, a man with a hammer-looking head was detained and brought to this station. Well, we assume he was brought to this station. We are part of the student hero group that helped capture him. All three students produced their provisional licenses to prove that they were hero students, and the policeman looked them over and then nodded. Yes, he was detained here, he said, but he was bailed just a few minutes ago. Yurarika and Yayurozu looked at each other. Do you have any information of the person who bailed him? Yayurozu asked the policeman. Yes, he said, lifting some paperwork out of the tray to his right and handing it across to her. She took it and looked it over, holding it to the side so that both Yurarika and Midoriya could look at it as well. There was a picture attached, and Midoriya nodded when he recognised the lady. That's her, that's the one who shook Aizawa's hand. Oh no, so they did know each other, Yayurozu gasped. What is her quirk? We need to find out. Is something the matter? The officer asked, accepting the papers that were handed back to him. Um, we suspect that this lady here, Midoriya leaned over and pointed to the woman's picture, used her quirk on our teacher earlier today, as I saw her shake his hand just after the man she bailed out had been detained. When she shook our teacher's hand, her hair grew in length. The police officer nodded solemnly. Has your teacher shown any signs of alteration? The policeman asked. Mm, not that we've noticed, Midoriya admitted. But I am suspicious that he may have changed, but not in a way that is obvious to our students, Yayurozu reiterated, adding her bit in quickly as soon as Midoriya had finished. The officer nodded and looked down at the paper, taking the woman's name and entering it into the quirk registries. It came up blank. She's given us a fake name, the policeman said. That is a crime in itself, so I will now see to it that she herself is detained. Oh, that would be wonderful, Yayu Rosie said brightly, then quickly covered her enthusiasm. I mean, thank you. Yurarika and Midoriya both nodded as well and thanked the policeman once more, then left and headed back to the dorms. We'll keep an eye on Aizawa until we hear from the police. The quirk may wear off on its own, but if not, we should have him treated if it turns out that he has been influenced, Yayu Rosie said. I will talk to some of the teachers tomorrow. The next morning... It was very hard to get up and go to work. You just wanted to call in sick for the rest of your life and never have to see anyone ever again. But against all odds, you got up and went to school, plastering your best fake smile onto your face and pretending to be happy. Hey, hey, has Ashley called brightly as you entered the staff room. You're looking as radiant as ever. I'm going to get in early and ask you to lunch today. He gave you the double finger guns and waited for your reply. Sure. You said with a fake smile. I haven't been to lunch with you or Aizawa for a while. Exactly, he replied enthusiastically. You need to show yourself around, Yin. Just then, Aizawa entered the staff room and Hazashi immediately included him in the discussion. Isn't that right, Chota? What is it? Aizawa asked in a deadpan voice. Yin needs to come to lunch with us. It's about time she shared herself around. You looked at Aizawa. And he didn't even look at you, just kept his eyes on Hazashi. I don't see what's amusing. Azara replied to the grinning Hazashi. I don't have time for lunch today. I've worked tonight and I'll be sleeping instead. Hazashi gave you a strange look and then dropped his arms down to his side. Yo, Shota, you okay? He asked. I feel just fine, but I wish everyone would stop asking me if I'm okay. He said in an irritated voice. He then turned and picked up his papers from the desk and left the staff room promptly. Did something happen? Hazashi asked you. I have no idea, but I feel like he isn't himself and hasn't been since yesterday, he said sadly. Hmm, Hazashi hummed. I feel the same way. Something isn't right. What happened on patrol yesterday? He mentioned there was a disturbance, but that's about it, you said. I'll ask the students who were on patrol with him yesterday if they might know if anything beyond a disturbance happened. Later that day, after a short lunch, you went to find Midoriya to ask him what had happened on the patrol day the other day, and you found him sitting out in the sun with Todoroki and Bakugo. Midoriya, you asked as you approached him, could I have a word with you about yesterday's patrol? Of course, Miss Lin, he replied with a smile. What did you want to know? Aizawa mentioned there was a disturbance yesterday, but he didn't elaborate. Could you please tell me what happened? 
Oh, yes, I've been meaning to talk to you, Midoriya said, standing up. There was a man who started to break things. His head was in the shape of a hammer, you see. I'm still not quite sure what his quirk is, but it appears that he was a mutant type, as Aizawa couldn't erase his quirk, and... Oh, I see, you quickly interjected. And did anything happen between Aizawa and the man? Did Aizawa get hit in any way? Well, no, not from the man, but... Then a lady came out of the crowd and shook Aizawa's hand, and from where I was standing it looked like her hair grew. I assumed it was something to do with her quirk. And actually, Momo and I have been meaning to ask, have you noticed Aizawa acting differently? As a matter of fact, yes, you conceded. That's what I'm trying to figure out, if his change is due to being under the influence of a quirk or not. Oh, I think he might be. We might need to take him to Recovery Girl to see if she can determine if he's affected. And if he is, she might know how we can get rid of it. That sounds like a good idea to me, you replied. I'll discuss with Hazashi if he can cover the class for this afternoon, and I'll take Aizawa to Recovery Girl. Leaving Midoriya quickly, you made your way back to the building to find Hazashi and explain to him your plan, but on the way back to the staff room you bumped into Yaoyurozu. Oh, Miss Lin, I've been looking for you. I have a question regarding Aizawa. Yes, Yaoyurozu? You asked curiously. I... I hope this question doesn't come off as strange, but have you noticed Aizawa acting a little differently? We, some of the students and I, have reason to believe that he's under the influence of a quirk, but we're just not sure what type of quirk it is. As a matter of fact, I have noticed that Aizawa has been acting a little differently, you said. What's he been doing? Yaoyurozu asked. It might help us to understand what type of quirk he's been affected by. Ah, uh, yes. Well, he... You paused. Oh, damn. I can't tell her that he appears to have either forgotten about or has lost romantic feelings for me, but that's exactly what's happened. She waited patiently for your reply. Um, well, it's hard to say exactly, you fudged. Uh, he, uh, is just not quite himself. Your other teacher, present Mike, has noticed as well, so it's not just me that's seen a slight change. Oh, would he know a little more about what the change is? Yayorozu asked. Are you going to the staff room? May I come along and speak with him? Uh, actually, I was just on my way there now to ask if he would mind overseeing your class this afternoon so that I can take Aizawa to Recovery Girl. Oh, I see. That's a good idea, Yayorozu replied. I'll let you do that now then. Thank you, he said with a smile that faded the minute you'd passed her. Oh, that was close. I almost let the cat out of the bag with that one. Walking back to the staff room, you made straight for Hazashi's desk, and he looked up over his glasses at you as you placed a hand down on the paper he was writing on. Oh, hello. Usually it's me who's visiting you at your desk. How nice of you to drop by mine for a change, he said with a wink. No time for funnies, you chided him with a smile. Is there any way that you could cover Aizawa's class this afternoon so I can take him to Recovery Girl? It's been brought to my attention that there was an incident on patrol yesterday and Aizawa could have been affected by a quirk. That's why he's acting like this. Ah, Hazashi said, standing up. Well, that makes sense. Yes, I have a free period this afternoon, so I'll cover his class. What are the students up to? I'll just have them continue the project from before. Ida or Yayurozu will be able to tell you what that's about. Okay, the loud blonde nodded, then changed subjects. Do you know what type of quirk Aizawa was hit by? He walked to the staff room door with you. I'm not 100% sure, but it could be related to memory loss, you queried. I'm hoping Recovery Girl can help. Hazashi nodded. Okay, let's go get this mess of a human fixed up. You and Hazashi headed down the hall, walking to your classroom, and as expected, Aizawa was in there, in his sleeping bag, propped up against the back wall with his bloodshot eyes still open. You're a mess, Hazashi called loudly to the sad lump of yellow slumped in the corner. Not here to be neat, Aizawa replied in a dead tone, looking from Hazashi then back to you. What do you want? Would you come with me a moment? You asked him. I need your uh, help with something. That's very vague, he said, refusing to move from his comfortable spot. Hmm... Yeah, well, I don't really know how else to say it, you replied with a sheepish look on your face. Come on, I just need you to come with me. I have a class in ten minutes, Azara replied, still not getting up. 
I'm covering the class so that you can go with Miss Lynn, as Ashley said with a grand hand gesture. I have all the markings of a great man. Don't get too ahead of yourself. Aizawa grunted as he stood up and started shuffling off towards you in his sleeping bag. You, are, are you actually going to walk in that? You asked him. Reluctantly, he zipped it down and stepped out. You better be important if you're going to make me get out of the sleeping bag. Well, I, for one, think it's very important, he replied, turning and leading him from the classroom. May I ask, once again, where we're going and what you need my help with? He asked in a very bored tone. I'm taking you to Recovery Girl, he replied frankly. If this is in relation to my acting differently, you can rest assured I am not, he replied in a low-key, vexed tone. He had obviously had enough of people's comments. And I can assure you that you are acting differently, he replied in a stern tone, matching his. I think I would know myself well enough by now to know that I have not changed, he replied in a dark tone. Okay, fine, you snapped, spinning to face him in an empty hall. What do you remember about us, Aizawa? His eyes travelled your face, looking for something, something that you couldn't decipher. Are you implying a romantic relationship when you say us? He asked in a low tone, still warily watching your face. Yes, indeed I am, you replied. You didn't mean for it to sound so pissed, but your anger was masking some deep hurt and that's just how it was going to play out in that moment. We, he started, do not have a romantic relationship. A relationship is strictly professional. No, you shook your head. This is how I know that there's something wrong. We have been intimate multiple times now and you remember nothing. And I know that you are lying because not once have you addressed me by my first name. If we were truly dating, you would have called me Shotoa. But I did try and call you Shotoa yesterday and you told me not to. And plus we, we were only just newly dating. It had only been a few months, if that. Now you're trying to backtrack because I've caught you in a lie. He replied calmly, yet still low-key annoyed by this whole thing. No, I'm telling the truth. Stop wasting my time, Miss Lynn, he said sharply, his rise in tone stabbing you in the heart. The hurt look on your face must have shown, despite how much you tried to hide it, and when he turned to leave, you lashed out, extending your quirk and grabbing his arm with your hand. No, you said in a quivering voice. You're coming with me. I won't have you like this. Let go of me. No. Then I must use force. You can try, but I'm telling you now that I'm hurt. I'm pissed off and I'm a woman on a mission. Don't push me right now because I'm about to snap. You meant every word and he could see that. Holding steady for a second, it looked like he was about to fight you, but then he nodded and relaxed, allowing you to lead him by the arm to recovery girl's office. She greeted you both kindly and you dragged Aizawa in and then closed the door and stood in the way worried that he might try and escape before receiving treatment. What can I do for you? Recovery Girl asked. A number of people and myself believe that Aizawa is under the influence of a quirk and we would like you to either confirm or deny this. And if it's revealed that he is indeed under the control of a quirk, please tell us how we can reverse it. Recovery Girl nodded and looked at Aizawa. How do you feel? She asked him. Fine, he replied. She then looked at you. What makes you think that he might be under the influence of a quirk? Briefly, you told about the patrol day and what had happened, promising that you had student witnesses on hand that could write statements on what they saw, if Recovery Girl deemed it necessary. She nodded and thought for a second. Anything else? She asked. Miss Lynn claims that her and I were dating prior to the incident. Ozawa stated bluntly, and you nearly died on the spot. Recovery Girl's eyebrows shot up and she looked at you for confirmation. You were well and truly put on the spot. Uh, uh, um, yeah, yes, well, I, that, that is correct, but it wasn't public knowledge, you stammered. Conveniently, Azar replied coolly from where he was standing next to the examination table. You shot him an annoyed look as Recovery Girl stood there, still reeling from the sudden development of new information. Uh, please, if you could keep this information to yourself, he said to her. It appears that this quirk might be memory-based. Well, it certainly appears that way, Recovery Girl mused. Aizawa, do you remember the incident on patrol the other day? 
He very briefly spoke about the patrol and did indeed remember the incident but couldn't remember shaking a woman's hand like Midoriya had mentioned. The recovery girl nodded and looked back to you. Leave him with me and I'll do some ringing around. You nodded and gave her a small smile. Thank you kindly, recovery girl. I really do hope you find out what has happened. Do not worry, she said as she walked you to the door and opened it for you. I'll have him back to his normal self in no time and then I expect there will be a public announcement. You scratched your cheek shyly and looked away. Well, I, I do hope so as well, but it takes two to tango. Indeed it does, she replied with a chuckle. Come back later today and I'll fill you in on what's happened and what I've found. Thank you again, you said, stepping out the door and bowing to her. As you straightened, you saw Aizawa watching you, but it was with those same lifeless bloodshot eyes that he looked at everyone with and your heart crumbled a little. I just want him back. I want him to remember everything we had. I want him to come and hold me and tell me everything's going to be alright. As the door closed on you, you turned to leave, but heard Aizawa speak. Recovery girl, I do not know why Miss Lynn feels the need to lie, but we've never been in a relationship, nor will we be in a relationship. I would never see her as anything more than a co-worker. Something wet hit your cheek, and you reached up to your face, surprised to find that you were crying. Oh, damn, this isn't good. I can't go back to the classroom crying. But the more you tried to stop the tears, the more they came, until your body was adding in sobbing cries to the mix. Making a detour, you walked very quickly to the staff room and slid the door open then closed. Oh my god, you wailed, placing your hand over your face. Can it take Honey, what happened? The voice of Nimuri asked from behind you. Shocked and mortified that someone was there in the staff room, you removed your hands quickly to look up at her, mascara and lipstick running and smearing all over your face. Oh, whoa, she said with surprise. You look a mess. What happened? I... I can't say. You hiccuped, trying to wipe just under your eyes to remove the excess makeup as you composed yourself. Can I help? I don't think so. You replied, bottom lip quivering again. I'll be okay. I just need a moment. Take all the moments you need, but come here. I can't let you leave the staff room looking like this, she said, turning and sashaying back to her desk where she pulled out her top drawer that was perfectly set up with every type of makeup you could have only dreamt about. Oh, you gasped as you walked over. That's impressive. Here, she said, pulling out some tissues and makeup wipes. Clean your face. Wipe all that makeup off and let me start again. Okay, thank you. Just let me center myself again. You took the wipes and wiped your face down, taking off as much of the makeup as you could. Then you blew your nose on the tissue and looked up to the ceiling. Taking a big breath in, you closed your eyes and set your face, then exhaled and dropped your head to look at her. Queen, she said with a head nod. Don't let anything get you down. You are fierce, amazing, strong. Nothing can break you. You nodded, blinking back tears. Whoever has made you cry is going to cop an ass whipping from all of us. First of all, Shotoa, then myself, then probably Hazashi, and a number of others here, she said as she opened a bottle of foundation and checked the colour with your skin tone. When she said Aizawa's name, you grimaced a little and she nodded. Mm, okay, so Shotoa is the issue here. Where is he? I'm going to strangle him with his own scarf and chuckle as he chokes on his own lack of oxygen. It's okay, it's okay. I just overheard him say something about me. He isn't himself at the moment, so I'll forgive it, but it still really hurt, you admitted, pulling your lips in between your teeth as Numiri dabbed the correctly matched foundation to the skin around your mouth. Ass, she mumbled as she worked. Quirk influence or no quirk influence, I'm going to kick his ass. I did it before at our UA Sports Festival and I'll do it again. You beat him? You asked with surprise. I mean, I'm not surprised, but still... He was like a baby deer on ice with that scarf when he first learned to use it, she chuckled, applying some winged eyeliner to your eyes. I could have beat him quickly, but torturing him with a slow win was so much more fun. Well, thank you, that's made me smile, you said, giving her a genuine grin. She smiled back and got some lipstick and applied it to your lips, then directed you to close your lips and rub them together to smear it around. I love that colour on you, she commented. With that colour, you could rule the world. Are you heading back to class now? Yeah, he replied. I'll go and save Hazashi from class 1A. 
She chuckled and packed her things away. I assume Shotoa is with Recovery Girl then? Yes, I've left him there till he can behave, he replied cheekily. Good girl, she said with a smirk. Now hold your head high, you look amazing. Thank you so much, Namuri, he said gratefully, stepping in to give her a hug. It's my pleasure, she replied, returning your hug. I hope everything goes well for the rest of today. Same, he replied. I'll keep you posted. She nodded and sat back down at her desk. I'll be here making endless papers. The sigh on the end of her sentence indicated to you that she was well and truly over it already. You smiled sympathetically. Good luck. She nodded and waved you off. Go, hun. You smiled and left, walking a little more purposefully towards the classroom. The whole class could feel you arrive at the door before you even stepped through, and even Hazashi did a double take as you entered and gave him a polite smile, then sat down in the side desk chair. Oh, dang. Miss Lynn changed her makeup, Kevinari whispered to Mineta. Damn, that colour lipstick looks amazing on her. I'm about to have a nosebleed, Mineta drooled. I can imagine that colour paint around my teeth as she did my teeth. Just then the hand of Shoji came out of nowhere and smacked the decrepit grape on the back of the head, knocking him out cold in his chair. Disgusting, Sarah whispered with a grimace. Absolute scum. While Mineta stayed slumped in his chair, unconscious, Hazashi seemed to be a little distracted by your presence. Thankfully, he only had five minutes left of class before the bell rang, so he didn't have to focus for too much longer. He almost sighed audibly when the bell sounded, and everyone got up to have a break, so you walked up to him to discuss the updates regarding Aizawa. How is our lost prince? Hazashi asked in a not-so-quiet voice. Uh, still lost, you replied diplomatically. I'll be going back to check on him later. The recovery girl is looking into this uh, condition that he has as we speak. What do the students have next? Hazashi asked. I think it's quirk training in the arena, you said, looking around and spotting Yagirozu standing nearby, waiting to speak to you. You smiled at her and called her over. Yagirozu, what class do you have next? Quirk training, Miss Lin, she replied. I'll oversee it, Hazashi said quickly. You can attend to other things, Miss Lin. Are you sure? you asked. I don't want to interfere with any of your other plans. If you allow me to buy you dinner, then I'll call it even, he said with a giant grin. You looked at Yayurozu, then at him, and poor Yayurozu blushed, feeling very much stuck in the middle of an adult conversation. Friendly dinner, he said quickly. Professional. Yes, of course, Hazashi said, throwing his arms out wide. Yayurozu relaxed a little, then excused herself awkwardly, and you looked back at Hazashi. That was mildly unprofessional, Hazashi. You low-key chided him. You, in that shade of lipstick, is unprofessional. I couldn't concentrate in class, Hazashi replied to you, half joking, but also half serious. What are you, 16? You chuckled. You need to calm down. Who did your makeup? It's different from this morning, he asked. That would be Nimiri, you replied. She did a wonderful job. Well... Shoto is going to have to step up his game when he gets back or I might just try and serenade his girl. Hazashi didn't mean for his comment to rip your heart open, but it most certainly did, and you grimaced a little and looked away to collect yourself before looking back at him again. Well, I don't know how Aizawa feels about me anymore, you admitted sadly, dropping your gaze to the floor. Did he say something to you? The loud blonde asked in an unusually quiet voice. You nodded, still staring at the floor. Your voice broke a little and Hazashi placed a hand on your shoulder comfortingly. He is still under the control of a quirk, remember? But let's not talk about it now. We'll discuss over dinner. You nodded again, looking back up at him and then at the ceiling to stop your tears from spilling. It's been an emotional afternoon, you admitted with a little embarrassed chuckle. He smiled and stepped back to give you the double finger guns. Some days are just crap, he said brightly, but stay classy. You couldn't help but chuckle and then turn to leave. I'll go and do some work in the staff room and then go and check on Aizawa, he said as you left. Thank you for covering the next class. Thank you in advance for dinner, he called out after you. Half of the school grounds, hearing his reply. You shook your head with an embarrassed look on your face and disappeared back to the safety of the now empty staff room. Honestly, you did try and get a little bit of work done, but Aizawa was weighing heavily on your mind and you couldn't concentrate on anything else.
Glancing at the clock, you decided to go and check on how Aizawa was doing, and so pulled yourself up and headed back down to Recovery Girl's room. Knocking on the door, you felt your anxiety spike, and she finally opened the door and looked up at you. Oh, do come in, Miss Lin, she said. You nodded and stepped inside, your eyes meeting Aizawa's. He just gave you a bored look and looked away. Well, I have found someone who can help us, Recovery Girl said, but they can't get here until after school hours. Okay, so I will keep Aizawa here until then. You nodded and looked at Aizawa. How are you? You asked gently. Fine, he replied gruffly. Why did I even bother asking? You thought with a sad look on your face. I will ring you when we're finished here, Recovery Girl said, and you nodded and turned to leave because it was obvious that Aizawa didn't want you there at all. All the best, you said softly as you left trying to keep your chin up so that you didn't cry again. As soon as the last bell rang, Hazashi was in the staff room to take you to dinner. He was very excited at the prospect of having some outside of school time with you, but you, again, were so preoccupied with the whole Aizawa situation that you just wanted it to be over with and done with, as your sleeping bag man seemed to be getting more and more annoyed with your presence. So, what happened? Hazashi asked once the two of you were seated at the small cafe down the road from UA. Well, first of all, I don't know how much Aizawa has told you, you replied hesitantly to him. Ah, yes, I know vague details, Hazashi said loudly in a cheeky voice. Shh, you hushed him. Keep it down. You glanced at the other patrons there. Well, we actually started dating, but it was being kept quiet until we were ready to announce. He was going to make it public this Friday, but... Now I don't know what's happening. Hazashi gave you a sympathetic look. I'm sorry, Yin. I didn't know you two were dating already. It's okay. Like I said, it was being kept secret, you replied. But when I left him with Recovery Girl this afternoon, I heard him say that there was no way that he would ever consider dating me. So it appears that he's forgotten. That's rough, Hazashi said, taking a sip of water. Once they lift the quirk, he should go back to normal though, yes? Well, that's what I'm hoping for, he said sadly. But what if he doesn't? He will, Hazashi said with a smile. I have faith. Thanks, he said with a soft smile. Recovery Girl said that she would call when they had finished treating Aizawa. No sooner had you said that, your phone rang, and you grabbed it out of your bag and put it to ear. Hello? Yes? Yes, he's ready? Okay, I'm coming. And with that very short conversation, you hung up and stood up. Hazashi, I'm so sorry, I have to go. I'm coming with you, he said, standing up and signalling to the waitress to come over. He asked for the food to be placed in takeaway containers, then the two of you left and headed back to UA. It was a short walk back to the school grounds and very quiet. You were in your own little world, so Hazashi just hummed and whistled as you both walked back. You made a beeline for the infirmary and pushed the door open with a small nod of greeting to everyone in the room. Aizawa looked up at you and you gave him a small nod, which he returned. How, how are you feeling? You asked him hesitantly. Much better, he replied, and you smiled. Oh, that was a different response from before. Uh, Miss Lin, I believe you and Aizawa work closely together? The other doctor in the room asked you. Yes, we do, you replied him. May I have a word with you? There are some things I want to discuss regarding Aizawa's recovery. Yes, of course, he said with a smile, following him out into the hall, then down it a little so you could have a private conversation. Miss Lin, Aizawa appears to have been affected by a quirk that only targets his thoughts and feelings towards someone he cares deeply about, the doctor said gently. Oh, I see, he replied with a bashful smile, your hurt heart finally jumping with love again. I have managed to remove the effects of the quirk, but be aware that his memory will still have been affected. You nodded and let him continue. Aizawa remembers the patrol day and details around the person that he intercepted, as well as the lady shaking his hand, but then after that he says his memory is a little vague, so he may not remember anything about what he has said while being under the influence of the quirk. Some people do remember, others don't, and others remember more and more the longer their brain is no longer under the control of the quirk. Oh, I see, you replied. Is there anything I should do or shouldn't do? Not necessarily, but be gentle, and if he appears to be a little emotionally unstable for the next few days, that is normal as well. Sometimes there's a fluctuation in the emotional states. You nodded. 
Okay, thank you for letting me know, and thank you so much for removing the effects of the quirk too. You are most welcome, he replied with a smile. If you have any concerns, please don't hesitate to call me. Here is my card. He pulled out his business card and handed it to you before leaving, and you went back into the room to see everyone again. Aizawa looked up as you entered, and that soft look in his eye made your heart melt. It's been a long day, you commented as you approached him, Hazashi, and Recovery Girl. Would you like me to walk you home? He nodded and stood up. I'd like to talk with you, he said, and you tried not to smile too big. Recovery Girl and Hazashi shared a knowing look behind your backs and bade you farewell as you and Aizawa headed out into the hall. It was quiet as you both walked along, the halls nearly dark as you headed for the stairs to go outside. My apologies for the inconvenience, Yin, Aizawa said in a soft, loving tone. Don't apologise, you are under the effects of a quirk. You replied emphatically, I'm just happy you're okay. The doctor told me the quirk affects my thoughts and feelings towards someone I cared deeply about. Aizawa said, you nodded and looked at him. My apologies. Again, don't apologise. You didn't know what you were doing and you probably don't remember anything you said or did. So let's just leave it in the past and move on. He said with a warm, encouraging smile. I do remember everything. Aizawa said lowly, I remember everything I said. I remember how you, your face looked. I'm truly sorry. I caused you a lot of pain. No, please, he said, stopping and turning and putting a hand on his arm. I'm just happy you remember me and us and that it's all over. He turned to you, looking like he wanted to hug you, but then he stopped himself and gestured to the door. Let's keep walking, he said. He probably doesn't want to get caught hugging on campus, he thought. Out of the school grounds, you walked together. The sunset was so much prettier that evening, with all its purples, pinks, yellows, oranges and blues, and you took a deep breath in, then smiled and exhaled happily. Did you want some food? You asked him. Hazashi and I went to get some food. What did you get? He asked. Ah, uh, your favourite? You replied. I just, I thought maybe I would share it with you once you'd finished treatment with the doctor. Suddenly Aizawa grabbed you and turned you towards himself his mouth taking yours against his. In the middle of the quiet street, as the street lamps lazily flicked on, you two kissed, for the first time in two days. It felt like it had been an eternity since you'd had his lips against yours, and you nearly cried from happiness. I'm truly sorry again, Yin, he said once he'd pulled back from the kiss and hugged you close. Don't apologise, you said sadly. Please stop apologising. He pulled you even closer, and your heart ached. You felt like everything was better again, but at the same time, something wasn't right. Why did he keep apologising? The rest of the walk to your place was silent, interspersed with light chatter, and he gave you another small kiss when he dropped you off at the front gate. Here, he said, handing him the food. You need it. Thank you, he replied, taking the food and turning to go. You watched him walk away, and then headed inside to make yourself some food. You were only half hungry anyway. Your stomach was churning with a little unease. Is he really 100% okay? Aizawa walked on alone, deep in thought over what had happened. I hurt her. She's the last person I ever wanted to hurt. But it just happened so easily. All it took was a quirk to cause me to make her make those faces. I thought I was strong enough for the two of us. Strong enough to protect her and her happiness, but I was wrong. He grit his teeth angrily and wrinkled his nose as he hung his head, fringe falling low. I can't have anyone close to me. They will end up getting hurt. The further away she is from me, the less likely she is to end up unhappy, he thought. He walked on a little further, making his way through the front gates of his apartment block and heading up to his front door. I'm sorry, Ian. We can't be together. You're better off without me, he thought, as he headed inside his apartment and placed your food on the table. Back inside your apartment, you were suddenly hit with a wave of dread. What if Aizawa makes a decision about us in the next few days when he's emotionally unstable from the quirk detox, you thought. I might text him and let him know that he might be feeling a bit strange over the next few days and that it's normal and will settle and that he shouldn't make any big decisions in that time. You reached for your phone and opened it, going to messages so that you could text him quickly. Just as you were about to send him a message, you received a message from him and your eyes lit up, then immediately dulled as you read the preview line. In. I'm sorry, but I think it's for the best that we... You couldn't open that message. You already knew the direction it was heading in and it already hurt. 
time stopped and it felt like it took you 10 minutes to open the text when in actual fact you would open the message within two seconds of seeing it. Clicking on the icon, the message opened before your eyes. Yin, I'm sorry, but I think it's for the best that we not see each other in a romantic capacity. This is as difficult for me to say as it is for you to hear, and forgive me for not saying it to your face. I just need space. A lump formed in your throat and your abdomen ached, guts ceasing their duties for the sake of your bitter disappointment. What emotion would the spinning wheel land on this time? Would it be anger, sadness, denial, a mix of all three? You stood there staring at your phone, but not seeing anything as multiple replies formed in your head. Do I get a reason or a say? You found yourself sending back. The eerie calmness in your text, indicative of a massive storm that was about to follow, should Aizawa not reply adequately? No, came the response. There was the trigger. What the hell? You sent back angrily, being tipped off the deep end. You've taken me for this ride and then just pushed me off the cliff at the end. I've meant nothing to you this whole time. How could I have been so stupid? You sent back, angry hot tears drowning your vision as your thumbs smashed at the phone screen. Aizawa didn't even have the decency to reply your text and didn't even open it, which made you even angrier and sadder. Turning your phone screen off, you put it down on the kitchen bench and neglected your half-made dinner. You didn't want it anymore. Walking into the lounge, you flopped down in the seat with your head in your hands, scrunching your fingertips into your scalp. What is going on? Why is this happening? I thought we were better, you cried internally. I feel so used. As you sat there distraught, you remembered your dear granny's words and amongst all your other thoughts and your bottom lip quivered. She was right. She could see it all along, even when she hadn't met him, you thought sadly, tears falling in torrents down your cheeks. Then you remember the doctor's words. He may be emotionally unstable for a little while after the quirk wears off, but this is normal. Wait! Your head shot up. Maybe this is it. Maybe he's all mixed up and has made a rash decision when he's still coming down from the quirk. Your tears stopped and you felt a little bit lighter as you looked up and sat back, wiping your eyes. Maybe this isn't the end, you thought with relief. I'll give him a few days to come around. I won't push him. Then I'll approach him again and see if he changes his mind. Or maybe he'll come to me. Feeling much better with these thoughts, you got up and had dinner, then relaxed and went to bed, sleeping far more peacefully than you had in the last few days. The next morning you got up and ready to head to school, happy but a little apprehensive at the same time. I just have to play the part for a few more days before he recovers from the quirk letdown. You smiled at the students as you walked the halls to the staff room and entered. Aizawa was there, earlier than usual, and you had a mini heart attack when you saw the back of him. Wait, I haven't had time to mentally prepare to see you yet, you screamed internally, taking a deep breath in and walking casually past him to your own desk. It was only when you made it to your desk that you said a very bland greeting to him. Good morning, Aizawa, you said in an even tone, not looking at him, but also not sounding angry. Good morning, Miss Lin, he replied, and your heart seized a bit. Not even my first name. Is he really better? You didn't reply. Just got your things together and headed for the door to go to class. Miss Lynn! Yagirozu called brightly when she saw you. How are you this morning? I do so love your skirt. Is it from Zara? Oh, uh, I'm not sure, you replied sheepishly. You knew it wasn't from Zara. The skirt was so damn old you didn't know if the store even existed anymore. You look beautiful, she gushed. Not that you don't always look beautiful, but you just seem more radiant today. Did something good happen? She was pushing to see if things had returned to normal between you and Aizawa, but didn't want to ask directly because she wasn't supposed to have seen you two together that afternoon of the festival. Oh, I guess something good did happen, he replied with a smile. Timing your reply just as Aizawa passed you both and headed into the classroom. You glanced at him as he passed. Hear that, Aizawa? I don't need you. I'm better on my own. I've already gotten over you. How does it feel, huh? While you were internally trying to buoy yourself up with false thoughts, Yagyarozu had read the whole situation wrong. Oh, she looked at Aizawa when he passed, and she also said something good had happened. They must be okay again. Oh, I do hope they make a public announcement soon. She smiled to herself, happy that you were getting the life you deserved. Well, you said with a smile, time to start class, we don't want to keep Aizawa waiting. Oh yes, of course, she said with a grin. Please, Miss Lynn, do join us for lunch today. We would love your company. We've missed it these last few days. Yes, it has been a bit busy the last few days, he replied. 
and I believe you have patrol this afternoon. Unfortunately, I won't be your leader. Oh, I wish you were, she said as you both entered the classroom. You have such a presence about you, and I feel so uplifted around you. You beamed, half from her praise, but half from the fact that she had said it as you both passed Aizawa at the classroom board. <laughs> Suck on that, Aizawa, you thought smugly. You may have tried to cut me down, but your students still love me. That class could have been awkward for you and Aizawa, but it wasn't because in a weird way you felt like you had the upper hand. Aizawa's students loved you and you thought that he just needed a little bit more time to come around and then you'd both be okay again. Aizawa's heart, on the other hand, was being pulled in two different directions. He really wanted to be with you still, but he couldn't allow himself to indulge in his own feelings like that. How selfish. A few times he couldn't help but glance at you and you seemed to be doing really well despite your reply text last night, which he had finally gathered the courage to read. He was a strong man, used to taking down hardened criminals and seeing death right in front of his eyes, but when it came to those who he held close, well, that was a completely different story. At lunchtime, you walked down to the cafeteria to eat with the girls, and they all welcomed you happily. Hey, Miss L, Mina asked with a smile. I heard that something happened with Aizawa on the patrol on Monday. Yes, he was affected by a quirk but he's all better now, you replied diplomatically. Oh, what was the effects of the quirk? Hagakure asked, her uniform arms waving around. Ah, uh, um, Yayorozu and Yurarika waited to see what your reply would be. It appeared to be a memory erasing type quirk that was quite singular in its attack range, you replied quite poignantly. Did it just erase you from his memory? Jiro asked you. Um, myself and a few other of the faculty staff, you lied. Ah, oh, so it must have been targeting those who worked closest with him, Eureka commented thoughtfully. Mmm, you hummed in agreement, eating some food. So you and Aizawa are okay again now? Mina asked. Well, we never had any issues, you lied. Y yes, everything's fine. It's just, he wasn't looking at you like he usually did this morning, she commented, picking up something else off her plate. You coughed into your mouth and then cleared your throat. <clears> throat> uh, everything is fine. It's been a busy week this week because of patrols, so he's a little stressed. You lied again. Oh, patrols this afternoon, Eureka said. I forgot about them. More people to talk to and old men to fend off. It's like that, unfortunately, Mina sighed. But then there are some super cute boys from the school on the corner. You know the one just past the paint shop? Oh yes, they make my heart go all fluttery and my face go bright pink. Hagakure squealed. Hagakure, we can't see your face, remember? Yurika replied with a sweat dropped look. The girls continued to talk and you thought about Aizawa, hoping that things would truly go back to being normal in just a few more days. I keep telling myself that I'm okay and I act like I'm okay, but I'm not. Your face fell for a moment, and Yayorozu saw, her heart hurting for you. Why did Miss Lin make that face? Is everything truly okay with her and Aizawa? She thought sadly. For the rest of the week, things were very steely between you and Aizawa. You both kept your distance and only spoke if it was about class-related activities, and by the weekend, you were starting to worry a bit. He hasn't asked to talk about us. He hasn't even approached me on the subject. He's just moving on with his life. Was was it real? Did he really mean for us to break up? That weekend, you tortured yourself with the same questions until you felt sick to your stomach and decided to go for a walk to get outside and exercise. Deep in thought, your feet carried you into Aizawa's neighbourhood and you found yourself walking past his apartment building. Oh God, now I look like a stalker, you screamed internally. Turning around quickly, you walked back the other way praying now that he hadn't seen you in the area, but unfortunately, as you rounded the corner, you saw him coming towards you. In a panic, you spun back around and ran, but he'd seen you already. Yin, he called loudly, and you sped up for a second. Do I stop or do I keep going? This could be a chance for us to talk. You quickly stopped and turned and looked back. He was still coming along slowly with a small bag of food in hand, so you turned to face him and waited till he had walked right up to you. I... I was walking, exercising, you said, averting your eyes from his. In my place. I know what it looks like, but I just, I wasn't even thinking. I just ended up around here, but I'm going now, you said, turning to leave for a second time. Wait, he said in his commanding low voice. 
I never meant to hurt you. You looked back at him, waiting for more. I hope we can keep it professional. He added, You, wait, professional? You asked, turning back around again. Are you completely settled from your quirk now? I'm not sure I follow. He replied blandly. The doctor told me that you might be a little emotionally volatile over the next few days after the quirk had been removed from you, he said. I assumed that the text you sent was particularly affected by the letdown of the quirk. Aizawa blinked at you. I'm of sound mind, he replied, slightly irked. The decision I made is final, but I still wish for us to remain on pleasant terms. You couldn't believe what you just heard. So, I still don't get a say. You said in a numb tone, that's it, that's really it, after everything, just a, I hope we stay on pleasant terms. Your fingers flicked over in quotation marks around this comment. He exhaled through his nostrils. I don't think that this is easy for me. It sure looks easy, you snapped. Mr. I'll screw you as many times as I please and then be done with you and dump you. It is not the case, he said angrily through gritted teeth. Isn't it? You snapped sarcastically. Then what is it, Aizawa? Huh? What is it? He pushed his lips together and looked sharply at you from behind his heavy, messy fringe. You're not in the right frame of mind to listen. He replied sternly. Leave him. We'll talk at a later date. No, you snapped, standing in his way as he stepped forward. Tell me now. Step out of my way, he said coolly, his hair starting to levitate threateningly. You swallowed your fear and scowled at him. No, he replied sharply. His face darkened and his eyes glowed red as his hair stood on end, towering over you. You had never seen Aizawa in this state before, and truth be told, it did scare you, so you stepped back giving him just enough room to get by and quickly make his way to his apartment. By the time you had collected yourself, he had gone, so you just hung your head and tucked your metaphorical tail between your legs and headed back home, completely defeated. So he had meant for us to break up then? Is that it? Is that all? The rest of that weekend was lost on you. Your mind had fallen into a void and you don't remember anything else that happened. Monday morning at school was just you acting calm on the outside but hurting like a paper cut to the heart on the inside. Aizawa kept it professional and so did you, but it was hard keeping it together when he had gone back to calling you Miss Lin, even in the staff room. You felt like it was his constant reminder to you that you two were now at arm's length away and it slapped you in the face every time he called you by your last name. For the next class, get the students into groups and discuss the order of rescue priority, Aizawa said to you in the staff room. Some still don't quite understand who to rescue first. I see, he replied briskly. Yes, I can do that. He nodded and turned away, walking out of the staff room and off down the hall. Your eyes fell to the floor and you let out a soft exhale of defeat through your nostrils. It's a bit chilly in the sound room today, Hazashi commented as he sidled up beside you. Hmm? You hummed, quickly looking up at him. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Is everything okay with you two? He probed, bending sideways to try and look into your eyes as you averted them to the floor again. No, you admitted. I don't know what's happened. He's been like this ever since the quirk that he was affected by has been lifted. Hmm, has actually hummed loudly. I'll talk to him. Please don't say anything about you and I talking. I don't want him to think that I'm trying sneaky ways to get back with him, he said in a troubled voice. Wait, so you've broken up? Hazashi gasped dramatically, slapping his hands to his cheeks. Shh! You hushed him. Not so loud. Oh my god, why are you so loud? No nostrils! He replied. Eh? Yeah, see? He tilted his head up and pointed to his nose that had no nostrils. Oh. Oh! Oh my god, I never noticed. Well, that's something. How do you breathe? Secret! He replied. So you can be loud about everything else. But the answer to your breathing is a secret. Okay, he replied sassily. I'm going to assume it's from your ass then. Make all the jokes you like. If it makes you smile, then I'm happy, baby, he replied with a grin and dramatic arm movements. You smiled and shook your head. I'll talk to Shotoa, he said again. Just leave it with me. Thanks, he said with a sad smile. You left the staff room and headed back to the classroom to set up hoping that Hazashi would be able to find out what had caused Aizawa to suddenly change his mind about the two of you. Later that afternoon, you left the school grounds as usual, and Hazashi and Aizawa stayed back. 
Hazashi had asked Aizawa to help him with something class-related so that it wouldn't look too suspicious. What do you need my help with? Aizawa asked his longtime friend as they walked to the classroom. Well, see, I'm teaching the students basic conversations in English and I wanted to set up some tables so that it looked like a coffee house. They are then to order a coffee in English and pay correctly and I'll be marking their performance accordingly. You've been to move tables. Well, yes. You can move them on your own. Why did you really ask me to stay back? Ozawa asked in a dead tone, seeing right through Hazashi's plan in a second. Ah ha! Ha! Hazashi laughed loudly. Nothing gets by you, Shotoa! Ozawa just gave him an annoyed bloodshot stare. Okay, okay, Hazashi said with wild arm movements and another chuckle. I noticed that things have tapered off with you and Yin. Tapered. You've gone back to calling her by her last name, Hazashi said. We're at school. So, yes, I'll be calling her by her professional name, Aizawa answered diplomatically. And outside of school? Hazashi pressed. I don't see Miss Lin outside of school, Aizawa answered sternly. So there are no romantic feelings involved? Hazashi asked with wiggly eyebrows as he leaned into Aizawa, who had his arms crossed defensively. No. So you don't mind if I shoot my shot? Hazashi asked with a smirk. Ozawa stiffened ever so slightly, but Hazashi saw. He didn't make any mention of it, though. This discussion doesn't involve me. It's between you and Miss Lin. Ozawa replied briskly. Wonderful! I'll ask her to dinner, Hazashi said with a grin, still baiting Ozawa. This doesn't concern me. If you are here to talk about my assistant in anything other than a professional capacity, then I'm leaving. Ozawa said in a dark tone, his hair levitating slightly with anger, as the strong emotion inside him charged his quirk. Ah, Hazashi hummed. It's rare to see you so worked up, he teased as Aizawa turned and walked from the classroom, with the loud blonde chasing him out into the hall. Is it because you don't want me to ask Miss Lin out? Why don't you say something then? Aizawa spun around, anger etched into every line of his face. This conversation is finished, he growled in a menacing tone, and Hazashi backed right off. There was one thing he didn't want to do, and that was piss off Aizawa. The angered mop hair teacher turned away and kept walking down the hall, with Hazashi walking a little way behind, not knowing what to say, so just keeping his loud mouth shut. Once back in the staff room, Aizawa grabbed his things and left without saying goodbye, with Hazashi watching on a little sadly. Hazashi watched as Aizawa left, knowing that the messy haired teacher was very much put out by the thought of his friend dating the woman he was still deeply in love with, but he was determined to stick to his guns. He knew the kind of life that you would have if you and he ended up together, and it hurt him just remembering the look of pain on your face when he had said those mean things under the control of the quirk. I've done what's best for her, he thought, as he walked home with his head down. She'll find happiness elsewhere in time. His heart stung as he thought the last line, but he was a strong man, used to pain. The next morning, you and Hazashi ended up in the staff room together at the same time ahead of the other teachers, and you pulled him aside to talk to him. Well, you asked, did you have any luck? He was very tight-lipped, Hazashi replied. He wouldn't say anything, but I did ask if it was okay for me to ask you out, and he didn't say anything, but his body language screamed, no. He threw his hands up in an X shape across his body. Mm, something, I guess, you replied, a little lifted by the fact that Aizawa still had feelings for you. I would like to test it further and flirt with you this morning when he comes in to see if he stops me, Hazashi replied. Is that okay? Since when do you not flirt with me, Hazashi? He chuckled. Yeah, that's fine. I'll play along. Well, can you blame me for flirting with you? Have you looked in the mirror lately? He flirted with a wink. Ugh, you groaned playfully. That's a terrible line. He laughed. It's worked for me before. With who? You chuckled. My high school girlfriend? When you were, what, 15? You're using a 15-year-old's pickup line on an adult hoping it will work, you chuckled. Touché! You got me there, he laughed, and you smiled. Just then Aizawa entered, and Hazashi saw him from the corner of his eye, so he kept the conversation going. Are you doing anything tonight? He continued on. You glanced at Aizawa, then back to Hazashi, who raised an eyebrow at you. Uh, n no, no, I don't have anything on. I... Miss Lin. Aizawa said sharply, we need to go to class now. Oh, he said quickly. Um, 
Oh, I'll be right there, Aizawa. Now, he said again, stopping to look at you and Hazashi, giving Hazashi a cold stare. Your heart was beating so fast you thought Aizawa could see the shape of it leaping out of your chest through your ribcage, and you quickly grabbed your things and gave Hazashi one last look before walking to the staff room door after Aizawa. See you later! Yin, Hazashi called to you, and you smiled in return. Ozawa's body twitched when he heard the way Hazashi had said your name, and he scowled under his fringe, unseen by anybody else. Silently, you followed him down to the classroom and entered. Was he bothering you? Ozawa asked bluntly as he put his things down on the desk and stared at them. No, you replied. He's nice. Ozawa didn't reply, but you felt like your reply had hurt him a bit, and you didn't know whether you felt happy that you had caused a bit of pain or sad that you had caused a bit of pain. I'm so confused right now. I want him to hurt like I'm hurting, but at the same time, I don't. It was another awkward day. Aizawa always managed to somehow stop you and Hazashi talking, and you were at least a little bit happy that he was being a tad protective. Maybe if we keep this up, Aizawa will eventually talk to me about it, and we can get back together. Is that wrong? I don't want to seem desperate, but I just... I love him. You sighed and hung your head as you walked down the hall, passing the science lab where Yagyorozu was restocking chemicals for the lab teacher. She saw the look on your face and her heart fell. Miss Lin looks so sad. She's been keeping a brave face on in front of us all, but when no one is looking, she lets it all show. The next few weeks were much the same, as Ashi was still trying his best to get Aizawa to admit his feelings for you, but nothing was making him take that next step, and you hoped that moving on would get easier as the weeks passed, but... It was just getting harder to see him each day. You know what, Hazashi announced one afternoon in the staff room. We need to have a staff night. We all need to go out and have a drink. When was the last time we all got together like that? I'm in, Namuri called happily, raising her hand. Caller on line one is on their way to Disney, Hazashi called loudly. I thought it was drinks, Namuri asked in confusion. He slipped into his radio persona, he chuckled to Namuri. I'm in on the staff night. I haven't had a chance to hang out with all of you since starting here. Let's do it then, Hazashi said loudly. Shota, you come as well? No, Aizawa replied from his desk. I have to sleep. Ah, uh, come on, Hazashi cajoled. You need to live a little. No. Aizawa promptly got up and left the room, sending an awkward silence around. He'll come, Hazashi said brightly. I know he will. You hoped he would come, but at the same time if he didn't, that would be okay too. It was hard seeing him. That following Friday night, the staff members of UA met at the local bar. There were so many teachers that you hadn't met there yet and it was taking you a while to get around to introduce yourself to everyone. Naturally, you were dressed up to the nines, going all out on your look for the evening. You hadn't seen Aizawa yet and had started to breathe a sigh of relief that maybe it would be better if you didn't come after all so that you could enjoy the evening. But as you got your drinks from the bar and turned to go back to the table that had Hazashi and Namiri sitting at it, you bumped into a well-dressed man with his hair tied back in a bun. Sorry, you said quickly, stepping to the side and looking up at the person as you made to go past them. You nearly dropped your drinks when you saw it was Aizawa, who was dressed up as well. Oh, hi, you said. You turned up. Yes, he replied, looking down at your drinks. I'm assuming these are... For Hazashi and Namuri as well. Uh, yes, we're sitting over there. Uh, come and join us, he said with a little forced smile. He nodded. I'll get drinks and be with you all shortly. You nodded and stepped past him, walking to the table and sitting down beside Namuri, who had watched you walk towards the table. Someone was enjoying the view, she commented as she took her drink from your hand. Sorry? You asked as you adjusted how you were sitting. She looked past you slyly, towards the bar and quickly raised an eyebrow in a gesture to whoever was there and you tucked a strand of hair behind your ear and peeked back to see who she was referring to. Aizawa? You asked her when you saw that he was the only one at the bar now. No, surely not. It's not like that. Uh, isn't it? She replied with a smirk. Okay, if you say so, but the way he was watching you walk away was saying more than it's not like that at all. She did air quotation marks with one hand as she took a sip from the drink in her other hand. You pressed your lips together and rubbed them around to cover your smile, then straightened a little and pushed your bust out. She smirked again and looked the other way towards Hazashi, who was leaning back on his chair and talking very loudly with one of the other teachers on the other table. 
movement in the corner of your eye caught your attention and you looked as Aizawa sat down next to Hazashi, placing him pretty well opposite you. He watched you with his lidded eyes and you gave him a polite smile and then looked away. How is your drink? Bin, Aizawa asked. Hearing him use your first name made your heart jump. He hadn't used it for a number of weeks now and you tried not to get too excited about it. But let's be honest here, you were overjoyed. It's good, you replied, looking back at him. His eyes widened a little and his gaze shifted across your face, making you feel a little self-conscious. Um, how's your drink? You asked him in return. Fine, he replied, looking down at it. You talk well today. Oh, thanks, you replied, giving him a smile, but having to force it a little. It's a subject I'm familiar with. Understandable, given your quirk, he replied, still idly toying with his drink. Oh, Yin, Numeri cut in. How far can you stretch? You have an elastic type quirk, yes? Um, I've never really stretched to my limits before. I've never needed to, he replied thoughtfully. I would estimate about nine meters, Aizawa presented. How would you even know that, Shotoa? Numeri asked with a bit of cheekiness in her voice. According to the quirk records, elastic type quirks are usually based on the wielder's height, Aizawa stated. All of this is freely available on the internet. <laughs> there you go, Numeri said to you. If you need to know anything about yourself, just ask Shotoa. You looked away bashfully, trying desperately to rein in that excitement that was bubbling up in your core. The conversation died a little, and you got worried that maybe it would have been for the pointed questions, but then the loud blonde suddenly re-entered the conversation. Oh, Yin is back, Hazashi announced as he turned back to the table. Shotoa, swap seats with Yin. I want to sit next to her. You're drunk, Hazashi. Aizawa grunted. You should be going home. No, but it's time to party! Yeah! He shouted. Aizawa's face deadpanned and he looked at you, which made you giggle at their antics. You're going to get hearing loss if you keep sitting there, Aizawa. Move over here, he said with a cheeky grin at Hazashi. No, don't go! Hazashi cried as Aizawa got up and moved around the table to beside you, sitting down with his foot next to yours under the table. I've been abandoned! Hazashi wailed dramatically, his cry of despair making Numuri put her drink down so she could talk some sense into him. Is he always like this when he drinks? You asked Aizawa, leaning into him a little so you could have a little quieter conversation. He smelled so good, that soft masculine scent filling your lungs as you inhaled. Unfortunately, yes. Aizawa replied, tilting his head towards yours as well, but looking just off your shoulder, the proximity making it easier for him to catch a whiff of your softly perfumed neck. His eyes shifted to your bare skin, showing your collarbone, and immediately his excitement grew. I really want to place kisses all along her neck. It's been so long since the last time we were intimate. I... He sat back a bit, pulling away to compose himself, and you sat back a little too, as Nimuri addressed you. As you and her chatted and giggled, your le legs shifted outwards and pressed against his. Oh, sorry, you said, moving it away. We're in a round table. It can't be helped, Azara replied, giving you an excuse to be touching him. True, he replied him, sliding it back a little towards him as you picked your drink up and took another sip while he did the same. Is anyone ordering the food? Someone on another table of the UA teachers called, and Hazashi replied their question. I ordered the banquet, he shouted. Zashi, you're too loud, Aizawa chided. Should we check to see if they're making it? Nimiri asked. I don't know if they know we're here. I'll go, you offered, pushing your chair back. As will I. Aizawa offered as well as he stood up beside you. You smiled away from him and pushed your chair back in so you could get past and then waited for some others to pass before stepping around Aizawa and taking the lead to the restaurant kitchen. As you stepped around him, he placed a hand on your back, gently to let you know that he was there protecting you, and just that warmth from his hand was enough to shoot heat through your thighs. While walking ahead of him, your mind went back to the time that you two had been between the sheets, how his hands had felt gripping your hips or pulling your head to the side so he could bite into your neck, and how you bit your bottom lip firmly to break yourself out of a trance. Aizawa, behind you, was having the same thoughts, his mind conjuring up the feeling of your thighs against his face as his lips and tongue traced between them. I need to stop thinking like this, otherwise it's going to look obvious, he thought, discreetly adjusting himself so he could hide something growing up under his belt. Just then, someone stepped back and bumped into you, but before you had a chance to fall, Aizawa had caught you. 
I'm okay, you said quickly, riding yourself as fast as you could. He nodded and glared at the person who had bumped you, who then apologised profusely for knocking into you. With that little mishap out of the way, you both continued on to the kitchen to check how the food was coming along, and the head chef told you it would be another five minutes and the food would start to roll out. You thanked him, and you and Aizawa turned to head back to the group. Yin, Aizawa said in a low voice as you were both heading back. Yes? You asked, looking back at him. He paused. I would like to. Is the food coming soon? Hazashi's loud voice pierced the eardrums of everyone in the restaurant. Hazashi, you cried, covering your ears. Please, inside voice. He doesn't have an inside voice, Namiri replied with a grimace. He doesn't even have an outside voice, someone from another table added. This is just concert volume, always. Well, I am a rock star, baby, Hazashi announced loudly again, sparking more comments to fly around between the teachers. You and Aizawa sat back down and you turned to him. Sorry, you were going to say something before Hazashi screamed across the room? Never mind, we can discuss it later, Aizawa said. Oh, okay. You didn't want to push him to talk about it now if you didn't want to, but man, were you curious. And man, did you hope and pray it was about the two of you, in a good way. Soon the food came out and the dishes were laid out in the middle of the table for people to take their pick and you picked up a bowl to start dishing out food for yourself. Using your quirk you extended your arms so you didn't have to half stand to reach and started picking things off for yourself. Oh I wish I had your quirk, Numiri said as she watched. So handy. Oh it really is, he replied. Did you want me to get you something? I can reach anything. Yes please, the seasoned tofu at the back would be wonderful, she replied. You nodded and picked some up for her, then put it on her plate and finished up with your selection and started eating. Aizawa had waited so that you would get your fill first, then he picked whatever was left and you noticed that all of the middle dishes had disappeared by the time it came for him to get some. Did you want to try some of the noodles? You asked him. You can have some of mine. Usually he would have told you not to worry about it, but this time he nodded. Have you tried it yet? He asked. Not yet, you said taking some of your chopstick and lifting it across onto his plate. Tell me if it's any good. He picked some up and placed it in his mouth and chewed thoughtfully. How is it? You asked. It's good, he replied. So you picked up some as well to try it. As you placed it in your mouth, a little bit of sauce splashed onto your chin and you quickly covered your face as you chewed. Yeah, as I was said, passing you a napkin. <clears throat> Thank you, he replied, still with a little mouthful, dabbing the sauce off your face. Dinner was delicious, and Aizawa seemed to be most attentive to you, making sure you had the food that you wanted and offering napkins if you needed them. It was now around three hours into the night, and you had only had one drink, so you weren't drunk at all, but maybe just a little looser than usual. Aizawa too had matched your drinking levels, and was allowing a little more hand contact or leg contact every now and again. I hate to leave, you said when the clock struck 11pm, but I'm going to head home now. Oh, Hazashi groaned loudly in protest. Come on, we were going to go to the dance club down the road. No thanks, he chuckled. I'll pass. As will I, Ozawa added, standing up beside you. I'll see to it that Yin gets home safely. It's okay, Ozawa, I can order a cab, he said with a smile. I'll make sure that you get home safely, he added again, saying his goodbyes to the table along with you. Pleasantries done, you and Aizawa headed for the door and out into the night. You're welcome to use the taxi and continue it onto your place if you need it, he said to Aizawa as you both stood on the curb waiting for the taxi to arrive. Appreciated, he replied. In the distance you could see the taxi approaching and it pulled up and let you both in. You both sat in the back seat and it pulled away from the curb and headed off down the road to your place. That was a nice night, he said to Aizawa. It was nice to be able to talk outside of the classroom, too. Yes, it's been a while since we spoke outside the classroom, he replied, looking out the window. You smiled and rested your head back against the headrest. Are you tired, Yin? Rest your head on my shoulder. Aizawa offered, and you shifted your head to the side so you could rest on him. Thanks, he replied. That's much more comfy. The longer the ride took, the more contact you two made until he had his arm around your shoulders, supporting you as you snuggled in. Okay, miss, the cab driver said, pulling up outside your apartment. This is you. Oh, thank you, he said, sitting up to pay. 
I'll pay. Azawa said, quickly pulling out his wallet and paying the driver before he could draw your card. Once paid, you hopped out, and so did Aizawa. As he got out, he said something to the taxi driver, and the car slowly pulled away, leaving you both standing there on the side of the road. You didn't need to pay for the taxi, he said to him. I could have paid, and you didn't even keep him to get home. I can walk, Aizawa said. Oh, you replied, turning to your gate, then turning back. I... I don't want you to take this in any way, but do you want to come up for a cup of coffee? He paused and then nodded. That would be nice. You beamed from ear to ear and pushed the gate open to head inside. Once in the apartment, you took your shoes off and walked to the kitchen while Izawa took his jacket off and hung it on the coat rack. Decaf, you called out. You're not working tonight, are you? Decaf is fine. And no, not working tonight. He replied as he walked into the kitchen, rolling his sleeves up. You looked at him, then looked away to compose yourself. He was just so hot. Would you like me to help with anything? He asked, his voice sounding rather appealing as you reached for the coffee jar. No, it's fine. I have it all under control, you replied as you turned back to the mugs. Aizawa had one hand on the bench next to the mugs, and you stepped over to fill them up, your shoulder pressing into his chest. Focusing on filling the mugs as best you could, you topped them up and then glanced at him. You always look beautiful but tonight was an exception. He stated calmly, his bloodshot eyes and chiseled jawline giving your badusi heart palpitations. There was an immediate war inside you, your simp side screaming and dropping its panties and your boss bitch side looking him up and down and crossing its arms. I, Azawa, I thank you, but I'm so conflicted right now. You told me, I know, I know what I said. It's been hard for me too. Yin, I... At that moment, Simp side took over you and you put the hot jug down and leaned up and kissed his lips quickly. You were hoping that that little kiss would get it all out of your system, but no, all it did was fuel the tension that was radiating from the two of you and he reached out and wrapped his arms around you, pulling your body against his before leaning in to initiate another kiss. Coffee now forgotten, you pushed him back out of the kitchen and into the hall, reaching for his buttoned shirt and fumbling madly with the small discs as one by one they popped through the holes and revealed his perfect torso. Yeah, he whispered as he pushed his shirt off his thick shoulders and let it fall to the floor. Please, he whispered in an airy voice. I've missed your body on mine. How could he resist your sweet voice, your soft lips, the warm tongue toying with his? He couldn't. Do you need a shower? You asked him. I'll shower at home, he said as he got off the bed. Your heart sank a little. Are you staying here for the night? You asked him. I think I should go, he replied. Uh, are we okay? You asked him. It's not a good time to answer that question, he replied softly. I think I've done the wrong thing. I don't see anything wrong with it, he replied with a lump in your throat as you sat up. I've already hurt you once, Yin. I can't keep doing this. I'm sorry. I let my guard down and I slipped. What do you mean hurt me? When? What? Don't you think this is hurting me? You asked in a very hurt tone. Aizawa couldn't look at you. He knew he had very much screwed up. I'm sorry, he said again, picking up his boxes and putting them on. Then why can't we just talk about this? You asked, following him out into the hall with zero clothes on as he went to retrieve the rest of his outfit that had been discarded down the hallway. This, is, this isn't about you. This doesn't concern you. This is about me. He replied darkly, still not looking at you. It does concern me. You keep toying with me like this, and it hurts. I'm in love with you, but you just keep playing with my feelings like... Do you not think this is hard for me as well? He said, showing the first signs of real emotion about the situation. Then why are we doing this? Why is it so hot and cold? Why do you keep holding me on the line? Because I... Because I'm a... I have strong feelings for you. But my desire to make you happy is stronger than my personal desires. He replied in a defeated tone. I don't understand, he said, emotions finally boiling over in the form of tears. What are you talking about? Like I said, this is about me. He replied... I'm going now. You tried to get him to explain himself, but he was tight-lipped and didn't speak another word to you as he gathered his things and left, leaving you to cry naked and ashamed on the hallway floor. That was the second weekend that you don't remember anything about, 
There was a good thing that no one else could see how hard you had hit rock bottom as you lay wasting away in the bed those next two days. You didn't want to go back to UA anymore. Everything had been ruined. Your dream job had now become a painful experience and you wondered if you should just leave. You know what? I can't do this anymore. I need to leave UA, you thought, staring miserably at your bedroom wall. Sunday night, you rang your dear granny. Hello, my love, she greeted brightly. How did the announcement go? Are you and your teacher boss an official couple now? When are you bringing him over to meet your gran? She had meant all of her questions so innocently, so you couldn't be mad, but that stung. In a perfect world, that's how it was supposed to be, and for a split second, you allowed yourself to live your parallel life, imagining giving her the reply of how you were now dating and would be bringing him over next weekend to see her. That moment passed in the blink of an eye, and you had to swallow hard before speaking. Um, Granny, I don't think I'm in the right headspace to go into much detail, but the teacher boss and I are no longer seeing each other and I want to leave you, eh? You had started your sentence so strong, but the more you spoke, the more your voice broke and left you sobbing on the end. Poor Grams was just too far away to be of any comfort and she fretted on the other end of the line with a bunch of ohs and honey and a lot of Sweetheart, could you come over tomorrow? Oh, love, don't cry. I'm so sorry to hear that. I really want to give you a hug. Curse this distance, she rambled on. I'm going to write my letter of resignation tonight. I'll hand it in, then come to your place. You sobbed to her. I miss you, Granny. You wailed. Oh, sugar, there, there. You've made the right decision, she cooed softly. You'll be much better off away from that school. You sniffed and nodded, wiping heavily bagged eyes. I'm only a call away if you need me, she replied, but please come and see me. I will, you replied with post cry breathing. I'm going to go and write that letter now, Grams. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay, love, okay, she replied in a worried voice. Please do call me if you need me. I will. I love you. You said, wiping more tears. She made the kissing sound and then you both hung up. With more tears falling down your cheeks, you wrote the resignation letter, thanking Nezu for the opportunity to have worked there at UA, but for personal reasons, you would be moving on. Happy with your notice, you put it on a USB to take to school the next day and print it out. Aizawa felt terrible. He had wanted to patch things up with you and talk about his fears, but being the man he was, it was easier for him to just run and zip himself up in a sleeping bag than face his past and the emotions attached to it. With a heavy heart, he had gone to sleep and slept the weekend away, wondering how you would be on Monday morning. The sound of the printer printing off a resignation letter could be heard at 6.50am Monday morning at school, well before anyone else had turned up. You didn't need an audience. Freshly printed, you read it over again, then folded it in half and half again, then took your USB and headed for the Chimera principal's office. Nezu was there, as expected, and he called politely for you to enter. You're here very early, he greeted with a smile. I... I have something for you, you said to him with a sad look in your eye as you handed the paper across to him. He looked at your face curiously, then took the paper and opened it, reading it slowly as you stood there waiting for his reply. Oh my... I am very sorry, Nezu said once he had read it. Is there anything I can do to help? You shook your head. No, sir, I'm afraid not. This is most unfortunate, he replied sadly. You've been a wonderful addition to our faculty staff. You bit the inside of your cheek to stop yourself crying again and nodded. It's been a wonderful teaching experience, you said in a strained voice. Thank you again for having me. He nodded sadly. And... Principal Nezu, if you could keep it quiet that I'm leaving, that would be appreciated, you added. Oh yes, of course, he said back to you. If you do reconsider, please let me know. You nodded and left, heading back to the staff room to prepare for first class. Hazashi and Namuri were filled with stories of the weekend when they arrived later that morning, and they filled you in what had happened, the three of you chatting animatedly together. Aizawa heard you all in the staff room as he walked up the hallway, then stopped outside the door and turned away. She sounds so happy. I won't ruin her mood. He instead headed for the classroom to set up. Just before the first bell rang, you headed down the hall, a smile on your face from the funny things Numeri had told you, and Yao Yorosu met you at the crossroads in the hall. 
Good morning, Miss Lynn, she greeted brightly, happy to see you smiling to yourself. Good morning, how you're Ozu, he greeted her. Did you complete the task assigned for homework on Friday? Oh yes, of course. What a fascinating subject, she bubbled, talking about the aspects that she had enjoyed about it. You smiled along with her and talked all the way down to the classroom. Then she went and sat at her desk and you walked to the back and sat at yours, looking around at everybody, except Aizawa, who kept stealing glances at you. While he taught the class, you kept your head down, writing notes or marking student papers, and he was conflicted. On one hand, he was relieved to see that you were focusing on something, and on the other hand, he was a little upset that you hadn't even so much as looked at him at all that morning. That day, you kept away from him as much as possible, and only gave single word replies to any questions he had, making it obvious that you wanted nothing to do with him. As the final bell rang, you got up and walked to the staff room. I only have two more weeks to go, and then I'm free of this. I just need to hold up till then. You packed your bags to leave, and Nymiri called out to you to ask you to come to drinks that night, but you shook your head. Sorry, Nymiri, I'm off to see Gran. Haven't seen her for a long time, you replied. The visit to Granny's was a welcomed relief from all the BS that had been going on as of late, and you allowed yourself to relax and enjoy her company to the fullest. There was just something about her hugs and home-cooked foods that just replenished your weary soul, not to mention her limitless support which she readily doled out, commending you on being strong and deciding to leave you away. There's no point of working in an environment that makes you sick to your stomach, she said, and boy was it true. Had you and Aizawa not gone back to your place together after the staff drinks night, things might have been different, but the fact that he still showed that he was interested in your body, at least, hurt more than anything, and he just felt used. Is that all I am to him? A sex toy? A convenient release? Well, he won't be able to treat me like that anymore if I'm gone, you thought as you left Granny's house and walked to the bus stop. It was very late, 1am, and this was the second to last bus run for the night. You cupped your hands together as you sat down at the stop and pressed them between your knees. Oh, it's cold tonight. You hung your head and scraped the toe of your boot back and forth along the ground, the soft scraping sound sounding far louder than it usually would have if there were other people or other noises around. It was so quiet. As you looked back up again, you saw the bus approaching and stood up, stepping out from the shelter so the driver could see you. It slowed and stopped and you hopped on board, paying your fare, then walking down to the seat near the back of the bus. There was only you and one other person on the bus and you sat down and looked out the window as the bus moved along. Am I really going to be okay these next few weeks working with Ozawa? You wondered to yourself as the bus turned a corner. Just then the driver braked hard and you had to grab onto the chair in front to stop yourself from flying out of your seat. You looked up. Out the front of the bus window, someone was standing in the middle of the road with their arms up in the shape of machine guns pointing directly at the bus. Oh my god, what is going on? You could hear the person with the machine guns screaming something, but you knew it would be best to get down and out of sight immediately. Hey! You called to the other person on the bus, who was now looking out the front window as well with a terrified expression on their face. They turned to look at you as you crouched down in the aisle. Get down, you called to them. Come over here, I can shield us with my quirk. They nodded and quickly ducked and came over to you. Get down, you called to the bus driver, who was in the front seat still with hands up. Get down or you'll get hit if they fire, you shouted, pulling the other person into you as you stretched one arm out down the bus aisle to grab the driver and pull them out of the seat. The minute you pulled them down, the person out the front of the bus let loose and pelted the bus with bullets. You gasped and inflated your body, quickly rolling over the person who was on the floor next to you so you could shield them while you tried to drag the driver down the back of the bus to save them too. You could hear screaming and you couldn't tell if it was you, the person under you, or the driver, maybe it was all three of you. Almost as quickly as the bullets had started, they stopped and you checked to make sure everyone was okay. Are you hurt? Are you hurt? You called to the driver who was still crying and yelling. My legs, they wailed. My legs! Did you get hit? Yes! Are you okay? You asked the person under you, who nodded in reply. Y yeah, I think I'm okay. Thank you for protecting me. You nodded at them, and then deactivated and crawled to the driver who had blood gushing from multiple wounds on the lower half of their legs. Oh no, you said numbly, a little traumatised by the sight. Okay, uh, hang on, let, let me get... Police! A voice shouted as the bus door crashed open. We're here! The driver's been shot! You shouted, the relief at hearing the authoritative call of police sounding clearly in your voice. Next minute, another voice called out. 
Yin. Uh, Aizawa? Yu called back, recognising his voice immediately. In a flash, he was past the officer in the doorway and down the back of the bus, jumping over the seats to get to you. What, what, are, you, what are you doing here? You asked in a mortified and surprised voice. I'm working, he replied bluntly. Are you hurt? No, the driver is, you replied, pointing to the person in anguish on the floor. Me and this other passenger here are fine. You pointed to the person next to you on the floor. Aizawa looked at the driver writhing on the floor, then nodded. Come, he said, holding his hand out to you. I'll take you to the ambulance outside. N no, I'm fine. It's the driver who... Come, he said sharply, and you quickly got up and let him carry you out of the bus. Aizawa, please, you need to help the other person who... Stay here, he commanded, leaving you with the paramedics outside the bus. I'm really honestly fine, you said to the nurse who started attending to you. I'm okay, it's the driver who got shot. I have no wounds. Even so, she said to you, making you sit down. If Hero or Razorhead has carried you out first, then he must have some concerns for your health. But I promise, I'm fine, you stated again. Nevertheless, you let the nurse check you over, and everything came back fine, as you suspected. While you were being attended to, Aizawa went back in to deal with the other two people in the bus. The driver was taken away immediately for treatment, and the other person was treated for shock and then let go. Hiro, the other passenger, whom you had protected, said to Aizawa before leaving, I hope you don't mind, but my quirk activated as you picked up the woman who saved me. Yes, Aizawa said. And, well, m my, my quirk can detect soulmates, they said. Aizawa looked at them and then looked away. Do, do you know that woman? The person asked gently. I do. Yes, Azara replied after a long pause. I thought so, as I heard you say her name, the person confirmed. Please forgive me if I say anything inappropriate, but without saying too much, don't live with regrets. Azawa looked at them, then looked away and nodded. I understand. The person smiled and then turned to leave. I wish you all happiness. She has a beautiful soul, they said before they left. Azawa's heart clenched. He knew it was true. You were let go by the attending nurse and they called a cab for you to get you home and once it had arrived, Aizawa walked you over to it and opened the back door for you. Thank you, he said softly as he got in. Get home safe, he said, averting his eyes from yours. You nodded and looked down as he closed the door. The driver slowly pulled away from the curb and took you home while Aizawa stood and watched the cab go. The next morning, Yao Yorozu ran to the staff room to find you. Oh, Miss Lin, she gasped when she saw you there. Oh, thank goodness you're right. I saw the news this morning. The news? You asked her. Yes, there was a mentally unstable person who had escaped from an institution nearby and used his quirk on a bus. You were on that bus. Oh, how did you know that? You asked with surprise. I saw you being treated in the background of the newscaster that was on the site, she said. I was so worried when I saw them checking you over. I'm okay, I promise, you said kindly. The driver of the bus was the only one injured. Yes, and it says they were taken to the hospital for an emergency double amputation, she said. Oh dear, they lost their legs, did they? I'm afraid so, she replied. I also saw the attending hero was a razor head. You chuckled sheepishly. Yes, funny that how that happened. I am most grateful that he was the one to save you, she gushed, a light blush on her cheeks as her favourite teacher ship had sailed a little. Mizelle! Mina called as she ran in behind Yayorozu. You're on the news! We were just discussing it, Yayorozu replied to her classmate. No, like, now, you're on the news now! The bubbly pinkette grabbed for the remote to the TV in the staff room and flicked the TV on so you could see, and immediately the news came right on in the middle of them going over last night's story. On screen, there were a few eyewitnesses explaining how the unstable person had guns on his arms and had jumped into the path of the bus with his quirk outstretched, then he had let loose on the bus, peppering it with bullets. You watched as the reporter then explained that they were on scene, and in the background you could be seen talking to the nurse. It's you! It's you! Yagirosu screeched excitedly, grabbing your arm and bouncing up and down. You smiled. Yes, that's when I was telling the nurse I was fine. The reporter continued on, talking about different things while various activities continued in the background. Just as they were finishing up the story, you could be seen getting into the cab and heading off. Then the ending images showed Aizawa standing there, sadly watching the taxi, with you in it, head off down the road.
Your heart fluttered when you saw how he was watching the taxi disappear, but then looked away to avoid getting too emotionally wrapped up in it. I am so truly glad you're okay, Yagyarozu said again as the news reports moved on. Thank you, I'm perfectly fine, I promise, he replied with a smile. You turned with the girls to head back to the class, but as you got to the staff room door you ran into Aizawa. Are you well? He asked in a low voice as he stopped you momentarily. Yes, I'm fine, he replied in a forced, pleasant tone. Glad to hear it, he replied, letting you pass him to go to the class. You continued on with the girls, smiling and talking, but as they took over the conversation you glanced back over your shoulder to the staff room door, then let your face fall. I wish I could leave sooner than two weeks. Yagyarozu caught the sad look on your face and a worried expression crossed hers. I wish there was something I could do for Miss Lynn. She still doesn't seem her usual happy self. I wonder what's happened. The next day came and went, as did the day after, and you did your best to be the best teacher you could be and focus on the class and not how awkward it was between you and Aizawa. On the surface everything seemed okay, and to everyone else it just looked professional. Little did they know it was all forced. It was the end of the week, and you had one week to go. You were looking forward to it, but at the same time you were starting to feel sad. You'd come to love this school and the students here, and you felt kind of bad that you would just up and disappear at the end of next week without even so much as saying goodbye. It's for the best, you thought, as you sat down at home, opening your laptop to mark some papers from an exam earlier that week. As you opened a document, an email popped up and you clicked on it curiously. A message from a hero school in America? You wondered, opening the message to read it. To Miss Lynn, I do hope this email finds you well. My name is Kinji and I am a good friend of Principal Nezu, as well as the principal of My Hero Academy in Washington. Nezu spoke very highly of your skills as a teacher and mentioned that you would regretfully be leaving UA in another week's time. It just so happens that one of our teachers here is going on maternity leave and we have been looking for someone to fill her place. You would be guaranteed a year of work here if you decide to come across and so I would like to extend the invitation to you to come for an entrance interview and teach here at our prestigious academy. Please do consider it. Kind regards, Kinji, Principal of My Hero Academy, Washington. You couldn't believe your eyes. And with utter disbelief, you read the email five times over, blinking rapidly in between each time. What luck is this? You thought as you clicked on reply email. This is my out. You started to tap out your reply, expressing your interests and thanks and asking what day he would like you to attend for your interview. You are now into your final week at UA and no one except Nezu knew about your imminent departure. The principal of My Hero Academy had replied your email and everything was set for you to have the interview in Washington on the Friday immediately following your completion at UA on Thursday. Aizawa had still been thinking about what the passenger had said to him that night that he had saved you and the others from the gun attack and he was trying to find the right time as well as the right words, to adequately apologise to you and ask if you two could start over again. It was Wednesday, one more day to go till you left UA. Ah, Miss Lin, Principal Nezu greeted you in the hallway on Wednesday morning outside Hazashi's classroom. Did my friend from America get in contact with you? Yes, he did, you said with a smile. Thank you so much for recommending me. It's my pleasure, Nezu replied looking up at you. Although it was a difficult email for me to write, I do appreciate your expertise and I wanted to help my friend out in his particular situation. That's very kind of you, he said to him. I have the interview on Friday. Well, I do wish you all luck, Nezu replied as he passed you and headed down the hall. Do be sure to say hello to him for me. I will, he said brightly, continuing on your way. As you and Nezu walked in opposite directions, Hazashi poked his head out of the classroom and looked at your back as you walked away. What was that all about? He wondered. You kept walking and entered the staff room, stiffening a bit when you saw Aizawa in there. Silently you passed him and walked to your desk and then sat down and pulled out some papers. It was just the two of you alone and you tried not to be bothered by it, but you were. As you worked, you heard Aizawa clear his throat. It's been an easy morning, Aizawa commented from his desk. Mm, you hummed in acknowledgement. Silence again. Then Aizawa got up and walked over to you. May I have a word? He asked in a low voice. You looked up at him and clenched your jaw, then relaxed it. About us, he said. Your heart did a forward roll and bounced into your lungs, making it hard for you to breathe as it chucked a tantrum in there. 
I'm sorry, he replied darkly. I no longer want to discuss anything like that with you. If you don't want to talk professionally, then you can leave. I understand how you're feeling. No, you do not, he replied with low-key anger as you pushed a hand onto the desk and stood up to glare at him. I have moved on. Please leave. Your heart was hurting. His heart was hurting. But he respectfully stepped back and turned away, heading back to his desk. He knew he had hurt you, and it seemed like it was beyond redemption now. I do deserve this for everything I've done to her. I've been very unfair. It looks like I've left my run too late. He thought, regretfully sitting back down at his desk and continuing his work while you sat down at your desk and scrunched your nose up with disdain. Angry at him and angry at yourself. One more day and I'm done. Just one more day. Thursday morning you left your apartment, your bag for your trip all packed and ready to go for the flight on Friday morning. With a heavy heart you walked to the bus stop then headed to the school for the final time. It was almost like you were hyper aware of everything that cool morning. Had the gates always been that big? Had the front steps always sounded like that when you walked up them to head inside? Had the birds always sung so loudly? The soft tick, tick, tick of your heels on the corridor flooring made the lump in your throat grow as you walked the halls for the final time. You really just wanted to grab your things and leave already. It was painful enough knowing that this was your last day and on top of that, you were having to pretend to be happy, just like this was any other ordinary Thursday morning. You entered the staff room and grabbed a pile of papers to start grading, but then stopped. I don't need to be doing this anymore. After today, I'm not going to be a teacher here, so there's no point in starting. This is going to be Aizawa's problem, or the next assistant teacher's problem. While sitting there, you wondered what the reaction would be of the staff and students when they found out about you leaving. What would Aizawa say? Would he care? Would he get a new assistant? Your mind conjured up a beautiful woman who would take your place as Aizawa's assistant and you immediately paired her with Aizawa, inserting her into all the intimate situations you had been in with Aizawa yourself and your blood boiled. Yin! Yin! A voice snapped you out of your daydream. Sorry, y yes? You squeaked. Yes? Oh, oh, hi Hazashi. That was a terrifying face you were pulling, he said with a loud laugh. I'd hate to be on the receiving end of whatever you were thinking about. Oh, sorry, I didn't know I was pulling a face. He apologised, trying to relax. Big day ahead? He asked as he sat his bag down on the desk. Uh, nothing unusual, just same old, same old. He replied vaguely. I think we have history of the hero today. Oh, yes, I remember that one, Hazashi said. It's usually followed up with hero today, isn't it? Isn't that tomorrow's lesson? Uh, I, I don't know, he replied. You hadn't bothered to check the schedule for Friday because you weren't going to be there. Are you slacking on your work, Miss Lin? He asked cheekily. Aizawa isn't going to be happy when you don't know what the lesson plans are for the next day. At that moment, Aizawa arrived and you looked at him. Yes, that one's tomorrow, he said blandly. Ah, I knew it, Hazashi said. See, I make an amazing assistant. Miss Lin and I are doing quite well by ourselves. Thank you, Aizawa replied to him. Little does he know that he's going to be on his own from tomorrow, you thought, keeping your face neutral. Hazashi saw that you didn't respond to Aizawa's comment and turned away. Well, good luck to you two today, he said with his back turned. And you, Aizawa said to him, then left. Hazashi turned back to you and noticed that you hadn't started grading papers on your desk like you usually would have. Is everything okay with you and Shota? he asked you. You shook your head. No, but... It's okay, everything's going to be just fine. You picked up the things that you would need for first class and left, leaving Hazashi in the staff room alone. Usually, she would be working hard marking papers or making lesson plans, but she seems to have slacked off. What was that that Nezu was talking with her about in the hall? Does it have something to do with that? The girls asked you to have lunch with them that day, and you accepted eagerly. You weren't going to pass up on spending one last lunch time with them. As they chatted and giggled together, you took a moment to look at each of them and wonder where they would be in ten years' time. I can see all these girls becoming great pro heroes. I hope they remember me fondly. You had to look away to hide a sudden tear and quickly wiped it before looking back at them all and adding something to the conversation. Yao Yorozu, like always, was watching you and saw you hide a tear. I'll talk to her after school, she thought, 
sliding a piece of homemade cake across to you. Miss Lim, do please try some of my homemade cake. I'm sure you will find it delicious. You took some gratefully and ate it, commenting on how light it was. This is beautiful, Yayorozu. Thank you, he said with a smile. The final bell rang that day, and you said goodbye to the students and wished them a safe trip home, giving them all a warm smile that Yayorozu couldn't help but feel was tinged with a little sadness. Aside from that, she was waiting for you to say your usual, see you all tomorrow, but it never came, and that worried her. You left the classroom as soon as you had said your goodbyes and walked back to the staff room with Yayorozu trailing behind. Miss Lin, she called out to you. Yes, Yayorozu? You asked, turning around to face her. I do apologise if this comes off as inappropriate, but I've noticed you've been a little down lately, she said. You forbade yourself to cry and bit into the inside of your bottom lip so hard you drew a bit of blood, but it was worth it to keep the waterworks at bay. I assure you I'm fine, you lied. I've just been a little tired lately, that's all. It's hard work being a teacher. Oh, I'm sure it is, she said. If there's anything I can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. You nodded and smiled sweetly at her, swallowing your blood mixed with saliva. I will. Thank you, I promise. She nodded again and stepped back and then turned away. I'll see you tomorrow, she said as she left. Bye, Miss Lynn. Bye. Yeah, you also, you said, your voice shaking a little as you said it. She didn't notice, and you watched her bounce off down the hallway and mingle with the other students, still fighting to keep those tears at bay. Will they forget about me? Will they hate me for leaving without notice? You wondered as you turned and walked the rest of the way down the hall, then entered the staff room. All the teachers were there, and you cursed the full room silently. How were you supposed to clean out your desk with everybody there? You made polite talk with them first, then sat down and pretended to work. Slowly, one by one, they left, until it was just you alone, and once the room had emptied, you grabbed a box from beside the bin and brought it over to your desk, placing all of your desk items in it. In no time, you had everything cleaned out, and you were heading for the door for the final time. Now out into the darkened hallway, you walked quickly to the front door and let yourself out, then locked the door behind you. It had felt like someone had been watching you, but no one called out and you didn't see anyone, so maybe it was just your imagination. Off you headed home. Done. Finished. Final day at UA. Completed. Aizawa had just gotten home when his phone rang and he picked it up. Hazashi. He asked as he answered the call. She's leaving! She's gone! Hazashi yelled into the receiver. Too loud, Hazashi. Aizawa grunted, scrunching his nose at the volume of his longtime friend. He was leaving. Yin! came the reply. What do you mean? Aizawa asked in his calm, monotone voice. I saw her clean out her desk and then leave! Everything is gone! Hazashi yelled. Always so dramatic. Aizawa grumbled. She probably wanted to take her things home because the desk was cluttered. No! Everything is gone! She didn't know what the schedule was for tomorrow and she didn't grade papers! She has left! Hazashi said. You're reading into this too much. She has a contract with UA. He replied. Well, it must have been annulled because I also heard her talking about something to do with placement with Nezu. I'm telling you, she has gone! You need to go and talk to her! I'm not going to do that. Azara replied sternly. This is one of your ploys. I'm being serious! You need to go to her house and talk to her! We'll see her tomorrow. Good night, Hazashi. Aizawa stated before hanging up. Hazashi tried to call Aizawa again. He tried to call you as well, but neither you nor Aizawa picked up again, leaving him to fret on his own. That night, you cried. You cried a lot. All of the pain from that day came pouring out and you just let it all out in the open. You were hoping that by finishing up there you would feel overwhelming relief but you didn't feel any better, and in a way you felt robbed. I'm supposed to be feeling relieved, but I just feel more guilty than anything else. I feel like a parent who has just divorced and the kids, the students, have been caught up in the mess that they shouldn't have been involved in in the first place. Yagirazu is going to be devastated when I'm not there tomorrow. I just know it. You slumped down on the bed. Maybe I can send an email to Hazashi or something and he can pass a message on to her for me. No, I'm thinking into this too much. I just need to move on. 
early Friday morning you were awake and getting ready for your journey. You hadn't slept well at all last night and looked like absolute crap, to be honest. Black bags hanging from under your bloodshot eyes. Oh, I look like the female version of Aizawa. You chuckled to yourself as you tried to cover it up with makeup. I'll sleep on the plane. 6 a.m. you left to head to the airport. It wasn't a very long trip, only a half hour, and then your plane was due to leave at 9.30 a.m., shortly after first class would have started. You picked up your coat and grabbed the bag, walking out the door and off down to the waiting taxi. Around 7.30 a.m. the teachers started to make their way into UA, greeting each other as they prepared for the final day of the working week, looking forward to a nice weekend. Hazashi entered the staff room and walked over to your empty desk, his heart sinking when you hadn't arrived. Aizawa entered shortly after and saw Hazashi standing there. I told you! She's gone! Hazashi said sadly. Aizawa's heart started thumping when his eyes fell on the empty desk and he looked at Hazashi, then back to the empty desk again. She will be here, he said, more to encourage himself more than anything else. She wouldn't be so irresponsible as to leave without warning, handing over her papers. I'm telling you, she has left! I'm going to find out where she lives and go there, Hazashi said sternly. No, Aizawa said, grabbing Hazashi's arm. She'll come. Let her be. The pair shared a look, then Aizawa went to his own desk to do some work before heading to homeroom. He didn't want to entertain the idea of you not coming to school, but his mind kept poking the thought with the curiosity stick. Has she really left? He wondered, looking over at your eerily empty desk. He shook his head and went back to work. She's testing us. She'll come. Homeroom commenced, and he started taking attendance, but still you didn't show. Yagirozu kept glancing at the classroom door and in the back of the classroom, but still you didn't show. Both Aizawa and her were starting to worry a bit now. After homeroom had finished, Aizawa excused himself and went straight to Principal Nezu's office. Sir, Aizawa greeted abruptly as he entered. Ah, uh, Aizawa, what can I do for you? Nezu asked with a big smile. Sir, I need to ask the whereabouts of Miss Lin. She hasn't shown this morning and her desk is bare. Oh, Nezu said sadly. I am sorry, Aizawa. She asked me not to say anything, but seeing as she no longer works here, I am at liberty to discuss her departure. The words, no longer works here, struck Aizawa in the heart and he froze for a second, eyes widening slightly. She has left for personal reasons, but rest assured that she will be in a good place. I recommended her to a friend of mine who, incidentally, runs a hero school in America. She has an interview later today, and I'm assuming she's on the plane right now, heading there. Aizawa felt sick to his stomach. That's not what he wanted to hear. America? He asked feebly. Yes. There was a long pause, then he turned and left the office, walking slowly back to the classroom. As he walked in, the bell to first class rang, and students filed in, taking their seats and sitting down as he stood staring down at his desk. Um, Aizawa, sir? Midoriya asked from the front row with his hand raised. Where is Miss Lin? Is she sick today? Aizawa looked up at him, then around at all the students and shook his head. I'm sorry to be the bearer of the sad news, but Miss Lin has left UA. There was a shocked silence for far too long that was broken only by quiet sobs from Yagirozu. Aizawa's bloodshot eyes found hers and he, she tried to cover her tears by wiping them away quickly, but the more she wiped, the faster they fell. The poor teacher's heart was wrenched in two. He looked from Yagirozu to Yuraruka, who was also tearing up, then to Mina, who looked heartbroken, then Suyu, who was fighting back tears. Sir? Yuraruka asked softly. Why did she leave? Aizawa swallowed thickly, then looked away. Personal reasons. The soft crying from in front of him made him close his eyes and scrunch his nose. His students were precious to him and it hurt him to see them like this. You must focus, he said loudly, spinning to face the blackboard as he picked up a piece of chalk and put a determined look on his face. He started to teach the class, but he couldn't. Every time he turned to face them, the faces looking back at him looked so forlorn. The whole room was filled with a despondency that could only be caused by the departure of a beloved assistant. Suddenly the classroom door flew open, and in fell Hazashi. You need to go get her, he shouted. Go, I'll cover class. Suddenly Aizawa was running. He had shot out the door and down the hall within two seconds of hearing Hazashi's desperate cry. He needed you back. 
The whole class needed you. The entire school needed you. Don't live with regrets. Hailing the first taxi to pass the school, he jumped into the back seat and yelled for the driver to take him to the airport. If she hasn't already left, I'll stop her, he thought. Coffee cup in hand, you dragged your items messily down the airport hall, half throwing your coat up higher over your shoulder as you made your way to your departure lounge. This feels so nostalgic. You chuckled to yourself as you found a seat and sat down. The last time I was at the airport was when I was headed to America for the teachers' conference and met. You paused and shook your head. No, no, we're not going to think about him today. He is not even going to enter our mind. You took a sip of coffee and settled back to wait for the boarding call. You checked your watch. 9.05am. It wouldn't be long now and you'd be on your way to America and possibly a new life. You took another sip of coffee and looked out the large window as the planes coming and going refueled and got cleaned. Yeah, a fresh start. That's what I need. Yen. You heard the call of an unmistakable male voice and your heart jumped so hard it almost threw you through the roof. Your head whipped in the direction of the voice and your eyes searched for the man who owned it. You saw him running. You'd hardly ever seen him run to be honest and he jumped a row of chairs to make a shortcut through the departure lounge to get to you. Aizawa? You called, standing up. What are you doing here? Don't go, he said as he got to you. Please, don't go. I need to, you said, sudden emotion springing up in your voice. I can't do this anymore, Aizawa. It hurts too much. I can't be around you. I can't fake it anymore. Please, give me a chance to explain, he said, a little out of breath from his run. You waited. That patrol day where I was affected by the quirk. I remember everything I said to you. I remember the sadness in your eyes. I remember the painful look on your face when I said those things. Yes, you said. You told me. I never wanted to see you make those faces again. I told you before that if you're with me, it's going to be hard because I'm a hero and heroes get targeted a lot. Things like this are not uncommon. I know, and that's why I'm leaving. I'm still in love with you, Aizawa. You croaked out. But you treat me like crap and I can't handle it. Sue me for being soft. I don't care. I need to get away from you. I can't let you leave. Please, don't go. I'm the coward here. I'm the one who wasn't strong enough to protect you. What do you mean not strong enough to protect me? Nothing bad has ever happened to me. You've always been there to save me, you said, your bottom lip quivering. Give me another chance, he said, his bloodshot eyes begging you. I've given you so many chances, you replied, now a little angered that he would come out with that. Let's start over. I can't let you go. If I let you go, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. You bit into the inside of your cheek. Your mouth was starting to get littered with a lot of teeth marks. Please, Yen. I thought it was hard having you near me, but it's even harder to have you away from me. I need you. You hung your head. I don't know, he said sadly. I've given you so many chances and you just throw them all back in my face. I know. I don't deserve another chance. I'm still in love with you and I'll follow you to America if I have to. He said, the earnestness in his voice making you cave. Aizawa. Shotoa, please. He said, it's no secret. I want everyone to know that we're on a first name basis. You hesitated. Yin. This whole time I've been in love with you. He admitted. As have I. You admitted in return. Please say you'll be mine. Please don't go. A tear slipped from your eye and then another one as you warred with yourself on what to do. Please. He said again, his face contorting a little. You've been making all of these decisions about what's best for me, but have you ever considered my feelings? You blurted out. Hot tears suddenly flooding your cheeks. When is it my turn to make my own decision? Now, he said. Forgive my forwardness just now. The decision is yours. And your words will be final. What do you wish to do for your future, Yin? Slowly you stepped towards him, which he very gratefully accepted and opened his arms to catch you as you fell into his chest. You could feel his sigh of relief when you'd let him hug you, and he savoured the feeling of you in his arms as you stood there, sobbing into him in the busy departure lounge with random people watching on. He bent his head and kissed you on the top of your head, and when you felt it, you looked up at him. 
your lips touching, then deepening into a heavy kiss as sudden applause rose from around you, your fellow travellers cheering for you and this random dishevelled man that some recognised that had come racing in and made up with you. As you broke from the kiss, you heard yet another unmistakable voice call out and you looked around Aizawa to see who had yelled. Yeah, you Rozu? You crawled with surprise. Oh God, and the whole class, Hazashi, you're here too? Aizawa turned around with his arms still half around you and you stayed in them as you both stared at the entire class of 1A led by Hazashi and Yagirozu. What are you all doing here? You asked as they approached you. We've come to get our favourite teacher back, Mina said brightly. Not you, Aizawa. We mean Miss Lin, Jiro quipped teasingly, making some of the students chuckle. You smiled, then grinned, then laughed, and the others chuckled along with you. Well, thank you. I guess I'll be coming back then, you said, wiping a few stray tears from your eyes. Just then your flight number was called and you looked over at the boarding gate as the hostesses unhooked the barrier rope. All eyes followed to where you were looking, then you looked back at them all. Well, let's go, we have class now, you said, earning yourself a lot of smiles from them. Class, before we go, as I was said in his stern teacher voice, I'd like to make an announcement. You looked at him as he slid an arm up to your shoulders and squeezed you into his side. Miss Lynn and I are, are dating, you added on the end. The girls of the class squealed and clapped, much to your delight, and many congratulations were given right there on the spot. As you all headed back towards the front of the airport, you heard about how they had all gotten there. When I told the class that Aizawa had gone to get Miss Lynn from the airport, they all insisted on coming, so Yagirozu called for two limousines. Hazashi explained. You smiled, now hand in hand with Aizawa, and he squeezed it and gave you a soft look. Yeah. He said in a soft voice as the others moved on ahead a little, leaving you two to walk at the back. You just have this pull about you. I can never let you go. You smiled and accepted his lips as he bent his head and kissed you. Then don't let go, you replied. No matter what happens, don't let go. This is a time skip, two year time skip, so you'll get to see how you and Aizawa are doing two years down the track. I can't believe we're back here again, you said to Aizawa as you cuffed a hand under your decently sized pregnancy bump, waddling into the same hotel that you and Aizawa had stayed in during that teacher's conference roughly three years ago. Full circle, he commented as he carried both your bags in and placed them down at the reception desk. Good evening and welcome, the receptionist greeted pleasantly. Do you have a reservation? Mr. and Mrs. Aizawa. Aizawa stated in his full voice. She nodded and looked down her list, then reached back for the room key. I have room 69 free for you, she said with a smile as she passed him the key. You're joking, you chuckled softly. No way. You took the key from him and read the number. Well, I'll be damned, you said again. This is the exact same room as the last time. The receptionist didn't really know what was going on, but smiled anyway, and then gave you directions to the lift and wished you a good evening. This is so weird, you chuckled again, staying in the same room as you had stayed in the last time. Azawa nodded, focusing on the bags as he dragged and carried them to the lift. You both stopped at the metal doors, watching the numbers click down to your level as you waited for the lift to arrive. While you stood there, you rubbed your lower back a bit. The plane seat hadn't been that comfortable and you were starting to feel a little strained. Are you okay? Does your back hurt? I can carry you to the room. Aizawa said quickly, seeing you in a bit of discomfort. No, oh gosh, I can walk, I'm fine. How would you carry me and the bags anyway? You've seen me do it before. I have no issues carrying multiple items at once. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, I know, you said looking away to hide the look on your face as you remembered one particular incident when you weren't pregnant, where he had picked you up and hung you backwards with his head buried between your thighs. Ooh, he's almost unnaturally strong, you thought to yourself. The lift doors chimed open and Aizawa gestured for you to enter first, then stepped in behind you and pressed the floor number. The doors closed and then you were on your way again. Wearily you leaned back against the walls of the elevator and sighed, holding under your belly still. As you closed your eyes, you felt a shadow fall across you, and you quickly opened your eyes to see what had happened. Aizawa had his hand pressed against the wall beside your head and was peering at you, 
one lock of his messy hair hanging over his face while the rest was haphazardly tied back. Even after a long day of travel, you still look beautiful, he commented casually, and your heart played the bongo drums on your unborn baby's little bottom. You gave him a wobbly smile, caught off guard by his compliment, and he smirked and then stepped back and picked up the bags again just as the lift arrived at the destined floor. Oh, that reminds me, you said to him as you walked the hallway to room 69. I need to call Granny and, first of all, let her know that we got here safely, and second of all, check on our baby. Aizawa nodded and pulled the key from his pocket as you both neared room 69. You connect to the hotel Wi-Fi and call her. I'm going to put the bags down and unpack some things. Roger that, you said as you let yourself into the room and turned the lights on. You inhaled the scent of the freshly cleaned room and grinned around when you saw it was arranged exactly the same way as the first time that you had had the back and forth conversation with him there in the dark. Smiling to yourself, you walked over to the bedside and picked up the card there, punching in the free Wi-Fi code, then sitting down on the bed and FaceTiming Granny. Oh, I hope he's behaving for her, you commented to Aizawa as he put the bags down on the other side of the bed. Grams picked up within three rings and you called a cheery greeting as a close-up of her face appeared on the screen of your phone. Hi Grams, we made it, he said brightly. Ah, she replied, a close-up of one nostril and one eye showing clearly to you. How's Kuji? you asked. Is he behaving for you? Ah, yes, he's behaving. Well, he stole some of my breakfast today and pooped on the back step, but he's only a little tyke, so I'll forgive him, she said with a chuckle. Oh, Grams, I'm so sorry, you chuckled. Did you make sure to clean out his litter box? He doesn't like it if there's already a poop in there. Maybe there's one in his box and that's why he went to the toilet on the back step. Oh, she said with concern. I'll have to check. Now, just give me one second. Hold on a moment. These legs aren't as young as they used to be. You could see flashes of her forehead and heavy breathing as she wandered off down the hall to the laundry to check in the litter box. And to her surprise, there was a poop in there. Well, I'll be, she exclaimed. Fancy that. I'll clean that right away so we don't have any more accidents. You chuckled. Sorry about him pooping on your step, Gran. I'll buy you an extra bingo ticket when we get back. Oh, never you mind about that. He's a sweet little thing, she chuckled, turning and walking back to the lounge. Speak of the devil. Could ye come here, you little bundle? Come and see mummy and daddy. The camera was suddenly thrust into the face of your little black and white kitten and the purring nearly stole your heart through the phone. Oh, hi, baby, you cooed. Are you bingle for grams? No pooping on the step, okay? Mummy loves you. Immediately, Aizawa was behind you, looking over your shoulder to see his little kitten on screen. Say hi to daddy, Kuji. The little kitten meowed softly and you had to stop yourself from squealing with love. I'd bring Shinko out here to say hello, Granny suddenly interjected, the camera switching around and focusing on the mole on her neck. But he's having his afternoon nap. You certainly didn't want to wait between babies, that's for sure, she chuckled. Your dear little boy is only 11 months old. I know, you chuckled, giving Aizawa a glance over your shoulder. Someone wanted two kids, close in age. Aizawa slipped his hand around your side and placed it on your belly, gently stroking it while he planted a kiss on the back of your neck. It's good though, they all grow up together, Graham said. Well, Yin dear, I hate to cut it short, but Kuji wants lunch, and so do I, so I'll call you when um, it gets to your tomorrow. Okay, Gran, we're going to head to bed soon. Thank you so much again for babysitting and pet sitting. It's a pleasure, love. Have a wonderful conference and say hello to Shotoa for me. Thank you, Mrs. Grams. As I said from behind you, I appreciate your help. Oh, Shotoa, you're there. Heavens, I can't see you on this blessed thing, she said, the camera catching glimpses of her feet, the house plant, and the wiggling tail of Kuji. We'll call again, you chuckled. Have a nice lunch, Granny. Thank you. Love, kisses and hugs. Bye, Gran. You smiled as you hung up and then looked back at Aizawa, who was still behind you. Oh, people are shocking with FaceTime. They never get their face in the picture. Aizawa huffed with amusement, then flopped sideways onto the bed, and you lay down too, backing back into him. Look how far we've come, 
he whispered, interlacing your fingers with his as he wrapped his hand under your belly gently. I told you I'd never let you go, he said in his deep voice. You are my everything. And with our little boy and another baby on the way, my world is complete. He gently nuzzled into your neck and you smiled softly. I love you, he whispered. I've always loved you, came his raspy, sleepy reply, his breathing deepening as he drifted off to sleep with you in his arms. And that is the end end of pool, the literal end, finito, curtains have drawn, finished, I hope you enjoyed it, see you in the next book.